from the book jacket. The time of reckoning is close at hand. Events in the New York Times best-selling Star Wars The New Jedi Order series take a decisive turn as the heroes of the New Republic prepare for their most volatile clash yet with the enemy, from without and from within. In the war against the ruthless Yuzhan Vong, the fall of Coruscant leaves the New Republic divided by internal strife and on the verge of bowing to conquest. But those who steadfastly refuse to consider surrender, Luke Skywalker, Han Solo, Leo Organa Solo, and their children and comrades-in-arms, are determined to seize victory against overwhelming odds. And now, finally, there are signs that the tide may be turning in the New Republic's favor. After capturing crucial Yuzhong Vong intelligence, Jedi fighter pilot Jaina Solo prepares to lead a daring surprise strike against an enemy flagship. Meanwhile, Jaina's brother Jason, liberated from the hands of the enemy and newly schooled in an even greater mastery of the Force by the Jedi Knight Verger, is eagerly poised to bring his unique skills to bear against the invaders. And on Moon Calamari, the New Republic's provisional capital, the retired ailing hero Admiral Akbar has conceived a major tactical plan that could spell the beginning of a swift end for the Yuzhan Vong. Yet even as opposing squadrons face off in the depths of space, intrigue runs rampant. In the heated political race for chief of state, in the shadows where Yuzhan Vong spies plot assassinations, and in the inscrutable creature Verger, a Jedi knight whose allegiance is impossible to predict. And as Luke Skywalker sets about re-establishing the Jedi Council, the growing faction opposed to the ways of the Force unveils a terrifying weapon designed to annihilate the Yuzhan Vong species. But in doing so, they may be dooming the New Republic to becoming the very thing it has sworn to fight against, and unleashing the power of the Dark Side. Chapter 1 As she sat in the chair that was hers by right of death, she raised her eyes to the cold faraway stars. Checklists buzzed distantly in her mind, and her hands moved over the controls, but her thoughts flew elsewhere amid the chill infinitude. Searching. Nothing. Her gaze fell, and there she saw, on the controls at the adjacent pilot seat, her husband's hands. She drew comfort from the sight, from the sureness and power she knew was there, in those strong hands. Her heart leapt. Something... Somewhere in all those stars it touched her. She thought, Jason. Her husband's hands touched controls and the stars streamed away, turned to bleeding smears of light as if seen through beaten rain, and the distant touch vanished. Jason, she said, and then at her husband's startled look, at the surprise and pain in his brown eyes, Jason. And you're sure? Han Solo said. You're sure it was Jason? Yes. Reaching out to me, I felt him. It could have been no one else. And he's alive. Yes. Leia Organisolo could read him so well. She knew that Han believed their son dead, but that he tried for her sake to pretend otherwise. She knew that, fierce with grief and with guilt for having withdrawn from his family, he would support her in anything now, even if he believed it was delusional and she knew the strength it took for him to suppress his own pain and doubt. She could read all that in him, in the flicker of his eye, the twitch of his cheek. She could read him, read the bravery and the uncertainty, and she loved him for both. It was Jason, she said. She put as much confidence in her tone as she could, all her assurance. He was reaching out to me through the Force. I felt him. He wanted to tell me he was alive and with friends. She reached over and took his hand. There's no doubt now. Not at all. Han's fingers tightened on hers, and she sensed the struggle in him, desire for hope warring with his own bitter experience. His brown eyes softened. Yes, he said. Of course. I believe you. There was a hint of reserve there, of caution, but that was reflex, the result of a long and uncertain life that had taught him to believe nothing until he'd seen it with his own eyes. Leia reached for him, 
embraced him awkwardly from the co-pilot's seat. His arms went around her. She felt the bristle of his cheek against hers, inhaled the scent of his body, his hair. A bubble of happiness grew in her, burst into speech. Yes, Han, she said. Our son is alive, and so are we. Be joyful. Be at peace. Everything changes from now on. The idol lasted until Han and Leia walked hand in hand into the Millennium Falcon's main hold. Through the touch, Leia felt the slight tension of Han's muscles as he came in sight of their guest, an Imperial commander in immaculate dress grays. Han, Leia knew, had hoped that this mission would provide a chance for the two of them to be alone. Through the many months since the war with the Yuzhan Vong had begun, they had either been apart or dealing with a bewildering succession of crises. Even though their current mission was no less urgent than the others, they would have treasured this time alone in hyperspace. They had even left Leia's Nogri bodyguards behind. Neither of them had wanted any passengers at all, let alone an Imperial officer. Thus far Han had managed to be civil about it, but only just. The commander rose politely to her feet. An exceptionally smooth transition into hyperspace, Captain Solo, she said. For a ship with such... such heterogeneous components... Such a transition speaks well of the ship's captain and his skills. Thanks, Han said. The Myamar shields are superb, are they not? She said. One of our finer designs. The problem with Commander Vanna Dorja, Leia thought, was that she was simply too observant. She was a woman of about thirty, the daughter of the captain of a star destroyer, with bobbed dark hair tucked neatly into her uniform cap and the bland, pleasant face of a professional diplomat. She had been on Coruscant during its fall, allegedly negotiating some kind of commercial treaty, purchasing Ulban droid brains for use in Imperial hydroponics farms. The negotiations were complicated by the fact that the droid brains in question could equally well be used for military purposes. The negotiations regarding the brains' end-use certificates had gone nowhere in particular, but perhaps they had been intended to go nowhere. What Commander Dorja's extended stay on Coruscant had done was to make her a close observer in the Yuzhan Vong assault that had resulted in the planet's fall. Vanna Dorja had gotten off Coruscant somehow. Leia had no doubt that her escape had been planned long in advance. And she had then turned up at Mon Calamari, the new provisional capital, blandly asking for help in returning to Imperial space just at the moment at which Leia had been assigned a diplomatic mission to that selfsame empire. Of course, it wasn't a coincidence. Dorja was clearly a spy operating under commercial cover. But what could Leia do? The New Republic might need the help of the Empire, and the Empire might be offended if its commercial representative were needlessly delayed in her return. What Leia could do was establish some ground rules concerning where on the Falcon Commander Dorja could go, and where was strictly off-limits. Dorja had agreed immediately to the restrictions, and agreed as well to be scanned for any technological or other secrets she might be smuggling out. Nothing had turned up on the scan. Of course. If Vanna Dorja was carrying any vital secrets to her masters in the Empire, she was carrying them locked in her all-too-inquisitive brain. "'Please, sit down,' Leia said. "'Your Highness is kind,' Dorja said." and lowered her stocky body into a chair. Leia sat across the table from her and observed the half-empty glass of jury juice set before the commander. Three PO is providing sufficient refreshment? Leia asked. Yes, he is very efficient, though a trifle talkative. Talkative? Leia thought. What's Three PO been telling the woman? Blast it anyway. Dorja was all too skilled at creating these unsettling moments. "'Shall we dine?' Leia asked. Dorja nodded, bland as always. "'As your highness wishes.' But then she proved useful in the galley, assisting Han and Leia, as they transferred to plates the meal that had been cooking in the Falcon's automatic ovens. As Han sat down with his plates, C-3PO contemplated the table. "'Sir,' he said, "'a princess and former chief of state takes precedence, of course, over both a captain and an imperial commander.' 
but a commander, forgive me, does not take precedence over a new republic general, even one on the inactive list. General Solo, if you would be so kind as to sit above Commander Dorja. Han gave C-3PO a baleful look. I like it fine where I am, he said, which was, of course, as far away from the Imperial commander as the small table permitted. C-3PO looked as distressed as it was possible for a droid with an immobile face to look. But, sir, the rules of precedence— I like it where I am, Han said more firmly. But, sir— Leia slid into her accustomed role as Han's interpreter to the world. We'll dine informally, 3PO, she told the droid. C-3PO's tone allowed his disappointment to show. Very well, your highness, he said. Poor 3PO, Leia thought. Here he was designed for working out rules of protocol for state banquets involving dozens of species and hundreds of governments, interpreting and smoothing disputes, and instead she persisted in getting him into situations where he kept getting shot at. And now the galaxy was being invaded by beings who had marked for extermination every droid in existence, and they were winning. Whatever C-3PO had for nerves must be shot. Lots of formal dinner parties when this is over, Leia decided. Nice, soothing dinner parties, without assassins, quarrels, or lightsaber fights. I thank you again for your offer of transit to the Empire, Georgia said later after the soup course. It was fortunate that you have business there. Very fortunate, Leia agreed. Your mission to the Empire must be critical, Georgia probed, to take you from the government at such a crucial time. I'm doing what I do best. But you were chief of state. Surely you must be considering a return to power. Leia shook her head. I served my term. To voluntarily relinquish power? I confess I don't understand it. Dorja shook her head. In the Empire we are taught not to decline responsibility once it is given to us. Leia sensed Han's head lifting as he prepared to speak. She knew him well enough to anticipate the sense of any remarks. No, he would say. Imperial leaders generally stay in their seats of power until they're blasted out by laser cannons. Before Han could speak, she phrased a more diplomatic answer. Wisdom is knowing when you've given all you can, she said, and turned her attention to her dinner, a fragrant breast of hibis with a sauce of bofa fruit. Dorja picked up her fork held it over her plate. But surely, with the government in chaos and driven into exile, a strong hand is needed. We have constitutional means for choosing a new leader, Leia reassured, and thought, not that they're working so far, with Puo proclaiming himself chief of state, with the Senate deadlocked on Mon Calamari. I wish you a smooth transition, Commander Dorja said. Let's hope the hesitation and chaos with which the New Republic has met its current crisis was the fault of Borsk Felia's government, and not symptomatic of the New Republic as a whole. I'll drink to that, Han proclaimed, and drained his glass. I can't help but wonder how the old empire would have handled the crisis, Georgia continued. I hope you will forgive my partisan attitude, but it seems to me that the emperor would have mobilized his entire armament at the first threat— and dealt with the Yuzhan Vong in an efficient and expeditious manner through the use of overwhelming force. Certainly better than Borsk Felia's policy, if I understood it correctly as a policy, of negotiating with the invaders at the same time he was fighting them, sending signals of weakness to a ruthless enemy who used negotiation only as a cover for further conquests. It was growing very hard, Leia thought, to maintain the diplomatic smile on her face. The Emperor, she said, was always alert to any threat to his power. Leia sensed Han about to speak, and this time was too late to stop his words. That's not what the Empire would have done, Commander, Han said. What the Empire would have done was build a super-colossal Yuzhan Vong-killing battle machine. They would have called it the Nova Colossus, or the Galaxy Destructor, or the Nostril of Palpatine, or something equally grandiose. They would have spent billions of credits— employed thousands of contractors and subcontractors, and equipped it with the latest in death-dealing technology. And you know what would have happened? It wouldn't have worked. 
they'd forget to bolt down a metal plate over an access hatch leading to the main reactors or some other mistake, and a hotshot enemy pilot would drop a bomb down there and blow the whole thing up. Now that's what the Empire would have done. Leia, striving to contain her laughter, detected what might have been amusement in Vanna Dorja's brown eyes. Perhaps you're right, Dorja conceded. You're right I'm right, Commander, Han said and poured himself a glass of water. His brief triumph was interrupted by a sudden shriek from the Falcon's hyperdrive units. The ship shuddered. Proximity alarms wailed. Leia, her heart beating in synchrony to the blaring alarms, stared into Han's startled brown eyes. Han turned to Commander Dorja. Sorry to interrupt dinner just as it was getting interesting, he said, but I'm afraid we've got to blow some bad guys into small pieces. The first thing Han Solo did when he scrambled into the pilot's seat was to shut off the blaring alarms that were rattling his brain around inside his skull. Then he looked out the cockpit windows. The stars, he saw, had returned to their normal configuration. The Millennium Falcon had been yanked out of hyperspace. And Han had a good idea why. An idea that a glance at the sensor displays served only to confirm. He turned to Leia as she scrambled into the co-pilot's chair. Either a black hole has materialized in this sector, or we've hit a Yuzhan Vong mine. A Dovin basil, to be precise, an organic, gravitic anomaly generator that the Yuzhan Vong used for both propelling their vessels and warping space around them. The Yuzhan Vong had been seeding Dovin basil mines along New Republic trade routes in order to drag unsuspecting transports out of hyperspace and into an ambush. But their mining efforts hadn't extended this far along the Hidian Way. At least, not until now. And there, on saw in the displays, were the ambushers. Two flights of six coral skippers each, one positioned on either side of the Dovin Basil in order to intercept any unsuspecting transport. He reached for the controls, then hesitated, wondering if Leia should pilot while he ran for the turbolaser turret. No, he thought. He knew the Millennium Falcon, her capabilities, and her crotchets better than anyone and good piloting was going to get them out of this trouble more than good shooting. "'I'd better fly this one,' he said. "'You take one of the quad lasers,' regretting as he spoke that he wouldn't get to blow things up, something always good for taking his mind off his troubles. Leia bent to give him a quick kiss on the cheek. "'Good luck, Slick,' she whispered, then squeezed his shoulder and slid silently out of the cockpit." Good luck yourself, Han said, and find out if our guest is qualified to take the other turret. His eyes were already scanning the displays as he automatically donned the Comlink headset that would allow him to communicate with Leia at the laser cannon. Coral skippers weren't hyperspace capable, so some larger craft had to have dropped them here. Was that ship still around, or had it moved on to lay another mine somewhere else? It had gone, apparently. There was no sign of it on the displays. The Yuzhan Vong craft were just now beginning to react to his arrival. So much for the hope that the Millennium Falcon's stealth capabilities would have kept her from being detected. But what, he considered, had the enemy seen? A Corellian engineering YT-1300 freighter, similar to hundreds of other small freighters they must have encountered, the Yuzhan Vong wouldn't have seen the Falcon's armament, her advanced shields, or the modifications to her sublight drives that could give even the swift coral skippers a run for their money. So the Millennium Falcon should continue, as far as the Yuzhan Vong were concerned, to look like an innocent freighter. While he watched the Yuzhan Vong maneuver, Han broadcast to the enemy a series of queries and demands for information of the sort that might come from a nervous civilian pilot. He conducted a series of basic maneuvers designed to keep the coral skippers at a distance, maneuvers as sluggish and hesitant as if he were a fat, nervous freighter loaded with cargo. The nearest flight of coral skippers set on a basic intercept course, not even bothering to deploy into military formation. 
The farthest flight, on the other side of the Dovin Basil mine, began a slow loop toward the Falcon to support the others. Now that was interesting. In a short while, they would have the Dovin Basil singularity between themselves and the Falcon, with the mine's gravity warping capabilities making it very difficult for them to see the Falcon or to detect any changes in her course. Captain Solo? A voice on the comlink intruded on his thoughts. This is Commander Dorja. I'm readying the weapons in the dorsal turret. Try not to blow off the sensor dish, Han told her. He looked at the displays, saw the far side squadron nearing eclipse behind the distorting gravity mine. His hands closed on the controls, and he altered course directly for the Dovin Basil, just as he gave full power to the sublight drives. The gravity mine was now between the Millennium Falcon and the far side flight of coral skippers. The gravity warp surrounding the Dovin Basil would make it nearly impossible to detect the Falcon's change of course. We have about three standard minutes to contact with the enemy, he said into the comlink headset. Fire dead ahead on my mark. Dead ahead? came Dorja's bland voice. How unorthodox. Have you considered maneuver? Don't second-guess the pilot. Leia's voice snapped like a whip. Keep this channel clear unless you have something of value to say. Apologies? Dorja murmured. Han bit back his own annoyance. He glanced at the empty co-pilot's chair, Chewbacca's place, now Leia's, and found himself wishing that he was in the second laser cockpit, with Chewbacca in the pilot's seat. But Chewie was gone, the first of the deaths that had struck him to the heart. Chewbacca dead, his younger son Anakin killed, his older son Jason missing, presumed dead by everyone except Leia. Death had been haunting his footsteps, on the verge of claiming everyone around him. That was why he hadn't accepted Waru's offer to assume Chewbacca's life debt. He simply hadn't wanted to be responsible for the death of another friend. But now Leia believed that Jason was alive. That wasn't a vague hope based on a mother's desire to see her son again, as Han had earlier suspected, but ascending through the Force a message aimed at Leia herself. Han had no direct experience of the Force himself, but he knew he could trust Leia not to misread it. His son was alive. So maybe death wasn't following him so closely after all. Or maybe Han had just outrun him. Stay alert, he told himself. Stay strong. You may not have to die today. Cold determination filled him. Make the Yuzhan Vong pay instead, he thought. He made a last scan of the displays. The nearside flight had turned to pursue, dividing into two V-formations of three coral skippers each. They hadn't reacted very quickly to his abrupt change of course, so Han figured he wasn't dealing with a genius commander here, which was good. It was impossible to see the far side flight on the other side of the gravity-distorting mine, but he had a good read on their trajectory, and there hadn't been any reason for them to change it. The Dovin Basil swept closer. The Falcon's spars moaned as they felt the tug of its gravity. Ten seconds, Han told Leia and Dorja, and reached for the triggers to the concussion missile launchers. Anticipation drew a metallic streak down his tongue. He felt a prickle of sweat on his scalp. Five. He triggered the first pair of concussion missiles, knowing that, unlike the laser cannon, they did not strike at the speed of light. Two. Han triggered another pair of missiles. The Millennium Falcon's engines howled as they fought the pull of the Dovin Basil's gravity. Fire. The Dovin Basil swept past, and suddenly the display lit with the six approaching coral skippers. The combined power of the eight lasers fired straight at them. The six coral skippers had also split into two Vs of three craft each. The formations on slightly diverging courses, but both formations, were running into the Falcon and her armament at a combined velocity of better than ninety percent of the speed of light. None of them had shifted their Dovin Basils to warp space defensively ahead of them, and the pilots had only an instant to perceive the doom staring them in the face and no time to react. 
The first formation ran right into the first pair of missiles and the turbo laser fire, and all three erupted in fire as their coral hulls shattered into fragments. The second formation, diverging, was not so suitably placed. One coral skipper was hit by a missile and pinwheeled off into the darkness, trailing flame. Another ran into a burst of laser fire and exploded. The third raced on, looping around the gravity mine where Han's detectors could no longer see it. Exultation sang through Han's heart. Four kills, one probable. Not a bad start at evening the odds. The Millennium Falcon shuddered to the gravitic pull of the Dovan Basil. Han frowned as he checked the sublight engine readouts. He had hoped to whip around the space mine and exit with enough velocity to escape the Dovan Basil's gravity and get into hyperspace before the other flight of coral skippers could overtake him. But the Dovan Basil was more powerful than he'd expected, or possibly the Yuzhan Vaughn commander was actually ordering it to increase its gravitational attraction. There was a lot the Republic didn't know about how the Yuzhan Vong equipment worked, so that was at least possible. In any case, the Falcon hadn't picked up enough speed to be sure of a getaway, which meant he had to think of something else brilliant to do. The other flight of six coral skippers was following him into the gravity well of the Dovan Basil, intent on staying with him. The one intact survivor of the second flight was in the act of whipping around the Dovan Basil and wouldn't enter into his calculations for the present. Well, he thought, if it worked once... Hang on, ladies, he called on the comlink. We're going around again. Savage pleasure filled him as he swung Millennium Falcon around for another dive toward the Dovan Basil. Attack my galaxy, will you? he thought. They had doubtless seen the beginnings of this maneuver, so he altered his trajectory slightly to put the space mine directly between himself and the oncoming fighters. Then he altered his trajectory a second time, just to be safe. If the enemy commander had any sense, he'd be doing the same. Both sides were now blind. The problem was that the Yuzhan Vong were alert to his tactics. They wouldn't just run blindly toward him. They would have their own Dovan Basil propulsor units shifted to repel any attack, and they'd come in shooting. Be alert, people, Han said. We're not going to be so lucky this time, and I can't tell precisely where your targets are going to be, so be ready for them to be anywhere, right? Right, Leia said. Understood, Dorja said. Commander Dorja, Leia said. You'll see that your four lasers are aimed so as to fire on slightly diverging paths. Yes? Don't readjust. There's a reason for it. I presumed so. I won't change the settings. A pang of sorrow touched Han's heart. It was his son Anakin who had discovered that if he fired three shots into a Yuzhan Vong vessel at slightly diverging courses, at least one shot would curve around the gravity-warping Dovan basal shields and hit the target. The quad lasers had been set to accomplish this automatically without Anakin's eye and fast reflexes. Anakin, who died at Mirker. Twenty seconds, Han said, to cover both his own rising tension and the grief that flooded him. He triggered another pair of missiles at ten seconds, just in case he was lucky again, and the enemy flight appeared right in front of him. And then, because he had no choice but to trust his luck, he fired another pair five seconds later. "'You are not keeping me from seeing Jason again,' he told the enemy. The next thing he knew, plasma cannon projectiles of molten rock were cracking against the falcon shields and there was a blinding flash dead ahead as the first pair of concussion missiles found a target. Han's heart throbbed as coral debris pounded on the deflectors, bounded off like multicolored sparks. There was a flicker on the displays as another coral skipper flashed past at a converging speed somewhere close to that of light, too fast for Han's eye to track it. If he hadn't blown up the first coral skipper, he might have actually collided with it and been vaporized along with the enemy. Han tried to calm his startled nerves as he kept his eyes on the displays, searching for more enemy craft around and behind the Dovan Basil. In a moment he understood the enemy's tactic. The two Vs of three had split into three pairs and curved around the Dovan Basil on separate paths, in the apparent hope that at least one pair would be in a position 
to splash the falcon as they flew past each other. It hadn't worked, but by sheer chance one of them had almost taken out the Millennium Falcon through ramming. What, Hun wondered, were the odds on that? The comm board began a rhythmic bleeding, and Han shut it off. From the display he gathered that the Falcon had just lost her hyperspace comm antenna. Oh well, they hadn't been planning to talk to anyone long distance anyway. Feeling cheered by the thought that he'd win the battle in jig time if he could go on killing at least one coral skipper with each pass, he prepared to swing the ship around and dive toward the Dovin Basil yet again. And then his displays lit up at the appearance of an enemy fighter, the one intact survivor from the flight of six he'd splashed with his opening salvo. It was curving toward him, its plasma cannons spitting out a stream of molten projectiles. It was placed just so as to keep him from swinging around on the ideal trajectory for passing the Dovin Basil again. He suppressed the curses that were ringing around the inside of his skull, and instead warned his two gunners. Enemy skip on the port side, ladies. He maneuvered so as to put the target in the money lane, where the fields of fire of both sets of lasers overlapped, and he heard the quads begin to chunder. Coherent light flashed around the enemy craft, curving weirdly as the Dovin Basil's singularity curved space to safeguard the target. Enemy fire spattered off the falcon's shields. Then flames sprayed from the coral skipper as one of the laser lances struck home. The craft seemed to stagger in its course, and then a second laser blast turned the coral skipper into a spray of flaming shards that shone briefly like a falling firework and was gone. Nice shooting, Commander. Leia's voice complimenting Dorja on the kill. Han realized to his pleasure that Vanna Dorja apparently was qualified on the quad lasers. Six down, one damaged, five to go. Han hauled the Millennium Falcon around for another pass at the Dovin Basil, but he knew that the last coral skipper had delayed his maneuver to the point where it might be the enemy pouncing on the Falcon this time, not the other way around. A glance at the displays showed the five intact coral skippers had swept around again, with each two-skip unit, plus the singleton survivor of the third pair, on widely diverging courses. They would be sweeping past the Dovin Basil at different times, approaching from different angles. This meant that no matter what Han did, he wouldn't be able to place the gravity-distorting singularity between himself and all the enemy at once. Those who could see him could communicate his position to those who couldn't. The advantage he'd made for himself was gone. Someone on the other side must have had a brainstorm. But, Han realized, the fact that the enemy flights had separated meant he wouldn't have to fight more than two at a time. That was something he could use. He looked around toward the Dovin Basil, letting its gravity draw him in. How are we doing, Han? Leia called. Plenty left in the old bag of tricks, Han called back. But which trick? That was a puzzler, all right. His mind sawed at the problem as he dived for the singularity. It was clear that the first pair of enemy skips would arrive at the singularity before he did, and the single fighter at about the same time as the Falcon, with the other pair arriving afterward. The only way he'd be able to repeat the head-on attack that had worked the first time, was if he did it on the third group of Yuzhan Vong, and that meant running the gauntlet of the other three coral skippers. If he attacked the first pair, the others would arc around the Dovin Basil and be on his tail fast. The Yuzhan Vong were prepared for any eventuality, unless, of course, he simply didn't do what they expected. If he didn't dive into the Dovin Basil, as their tactics clearly assumed, Han cut power to the sublight engines and hit the braking thrusters. The Millennium Falcon slowed, as if she'd hit a patch of mud. Skips crossing the bow port to starboard, he called. A volley of plasma cannon projectiles preceded the lead pair of fighters that arced from behind the blind spot of the Dovin Basil, bright glowing projectiles that curved strangely in the mine's weird gravity well. The projectiles crossed the Falcon's bows at a comfortable distance, followed an instant later by the fighters themselves, both moving too fast to alter their trajectory once they saw the Falcon's position. Laser fire pulsed around them, but Han didn't see any hits. 
he was already pouring power to the sublight engines, letting the space mine's gravity well take the Falcon into its embrace. He nearly missed his timing— the plasma cannon volley that preceded the single fighter's appearance from around the singularity almost clipped his tail. The fighter itself crossed his stern at a blistering pace. Han wrenched the controls and altered course, heading not toward the Dovin Basil, but away from it. He was now counting on the fact that the enemy were communicating. But there was also an inevitable lag between their perception of the Falcon's position. Their transmission describing the position to comrades rendered blind on the far side of the Dovin Basil, and their comrades' ability to act on that knowledge. He had dived for the Dovin Basil until the first pair of fighters were committed to their attack, then braked. The fighters had crossed ahead of him. Then, once the single fighter had been told the Falcon had slowed and altered its own course to intercept, Han had accelerated, and the fighter passed astern. That left the last two who had been told that the Millennium Falcon had first slowed, then accelerated. If they appeared where Han thought they would, they were dead meat. Fighters crossing starboard to port lay down interdicting fire dead ahead, Han ordered, sawing the Falcon around again, toward the singularity. It was easier to aim his ship at the enemy than to describe to his gunners where he thought the bad guys would appear. His heart gave a leap as the two coral skippers arced into sight right where he thought they'd be, between the Falcon and the Dovin Basil, the two fighters flying wingtip to wingtip and preceded by a volley of molten projectiles that curved in the mine's hypergravity. The lasers laid down a blistering fire right in their path and caught both ships broadside. One flamed and broke up, and the other soared off into the night, trailing fire. Seven down, two damaged. A nice total— and the day had hardly begun. Adrenaline drew a grin across Han's face. He dived for the singularity again, not because he knew what he was going to do next, but because he wanted to hide. The three remaining fighters were curving around and about to drop onto his tail. But this time he didn't use the Dovin Basil to slingshot himself around onto a new trajectory. Instead he worked the controls to go into orbit around the singularity the falcon's spars moaning from gravitational stress as she crabbed sideways through the Dovin Basil's gravity well. Ahead, through space warped by gravity, he saw what might be an enemy fighter. Open fire dead ahead, he called again, and he saw laser fire streak outward, the bolts curving in the singularity's gravity like a fiery rainbow. Keep firing, he urged, and brought the falcon's nose up just a touch. The curving laser blasts climbed up the fighter's tail and blew it to shreds. There was wild cheering from the gun turrets. Even the restrained Commander Dorja was yelling her head off. Fire dead aft! Han shouted over the noise as he fed power to the sublight engines. With the gravity well's distortion affecting his perceptions, he had no idea where the remaining enemy were, and he was afraid they were behind him ready to wax his tail, just as he'd waxed the single enemy fighter. Relief poured through him as scans showed his precautions were unnecessary. They'd pulled away from the Dovin Basil on a completely different trajectory, and were well out of range. Han held his course to see if the enemy had had enough. But no, they were coming around again, ready for more punishment. And two more fighters were heading for him, the two he'd wounded, each coming in on its own trajectory. Han rolled the Millennium Falcon around, heading for one of the two single fighters, figuring he could knock out one of the damaged craft before taking on the pair of uninjured craft. And then proximity alarms blared, and Han's display lit up with twenty-four fighters coming out of hyperspace right on his tail. Thwarted rage boiled through him. "'We've got company,' he shouted." and pounded the instrument panel with a fist. I've got to say, this is really unfair. Then he recognized the new ship's configuration, and he punched on the intership comm unit. Unknown freighter, came a voice on one of the New Republic channels. Alter course forty degrees to port. Han obeyed, and a section of four craft came roaring in right past his cockpit. His nerves gave a leap as he recognized the jagged silhouettes of Chiss Clawcraft, 
Sinar tie ball cockpits and engines matched to forward jutting Chiss weapons pylons. The design, the result of their fruitful collaboration with the Empire under the Chiss Grand Admiral Thrawn. Once upon a time, Han thought, tie fighters on his tail would have been a bad thing. Commander Dorja, Han said, we've got some of your friends here. Another two sections of clawcraft came roaring past, followed by three sections of New Republic E-wings. Directly in front of the Millennium Falcon, the formation came apart in a starburst, one section of four heading for each of the remaining coral skippers, while two others remained in reserve. Han hit the transmit button. Thanks, you guys, he said. But I was doing fine on my own. Unknown freighter, stand clear. The voice had a slightly pompous ring, and Han thought he recognized it. We'll handle it from here. Whatever you say, sport, Han replied. And then watched as four fighters ganged up on each of the coral skippers. The enemy craft couldn't jump to hyperspace, and they couldn't flee the fighters, because they had been chasing the Millennium Falcon at near light speed, and couldn't alter course in time. The newly arrived fighters took no chances— just professionally hunted down each of the coral skippers and blew it to smithereens, taking no casualties in return. Then the Allied squadron turned on the Dovan Basil mine and very carefully destroyed it with a calculated barrage of torpedoes and laser bursts. Nice work, people, Han congratulated them. Please stay off this channel, sir, the fighter commander said, unless you have an urgent message. Han grinned. Not so urgent, Colonel Fell, he said. I'd just like to invite you to a meeting here aboard the Millennium Falcon with Captain Solo, Princess Leia Organa Solo of the New Republic, and Commander Vanna Dorja of the Imperial Navy. There was a long, lonely silence on the calm. Yes, Captain Solo, Jagged Fell said. We would be honored, I'm sure. Come right aboard, Han said. We'll extend the docking arm. And then, over the comlink, he called C-3PO, and told the droid there would be guests for dinner. Chapter 2 Leia knew Jagged Fell fairly well. He was a decorated fighter pilot, the son of an Imperial Baron who lived with the Chiss, and who had on occasion aided the New Republic. Jag was a little stuffy— but not a bad sort once you got to know him. He had served with Jaina Solo in the defense of the Hapes Cluster, and later, as part of Jaina's twin son's squadron, fought at Borleos. And the two had the same sort of complicated, antagonistic relationship that Leia had once shared with Han. Though Leia appreciated Jaina's having a friend who could take her out of her troubles, she rather hoped that Jaina would not resolve this skirmishing in the same way that Leia had resolved her feelings about Han. Having an imperial baron in the family would create far too many complications. Having Darth Vader for a father was bad enough. Jagfell came aboard in his vac suit. With his helmet under one arm, he gave Leia and Han a smart salute. "'I'm sorry, sir,' he told Han. "'I didn't recognize Falcon's profile.' I wouldn't have made much of a smuggler if you knew my freighter from any other, Han said. But I was offended that you didn't recognize my voice on the comm. I was calculating enemy trajectories. Stiffly, such things take one's full attention. Will you join us for dinner? Leia asked. Perhaps I will take a bite or two, but I don't want to have a meal when my pilots are hungry. C-3PO helped Jag remove his vac suit, revealing the red, piped, black uniform of a Chiss fighter pilot. After Jag had been introduced to Vanadorja, he joined the others at the table. "'Aren't you part of Twin Sons' squadron?' Han asked. "'Isn't Jaina here?' Jag explained that after Borleos— Many new pilots had arrived fresh from the training schools, and a decision had been made to break up the old squadrons in order to build new squadrons around the experienced pilots. He and the Chiss had been pulled out of the Twin Suns squadron in order to form a new squadron, and Kip Duran had been pulled out as well, to 
Reform Kipps Dozen. Experienced pilots were at a premium. The military had apparently decided that for each unit to have some experienced pilots was preferable to throwing whole formations of rookie pilots at the enemy. Jaina had been compensated for losing so many experienced pilots by a promotion. She was now major solo. Her majority up until now had been a temporary or brevet rank, but now it was real. Leia didn't like that either. She knew that Jaina would now feel the necessity of proving she deserved her promotion, doing so no doubt at the risk of her life. "'What's your squadron doing here?' Han asked. "'The Yuzhan Vong have been mining this section of the Hidian Way, pulling ambushes on freighters and refugee ships. We've been sent in to clear the enemy out of the area.' Earlier today, we destroyed the mine-laying transport that had been dropping mines and coral skippers along this part of the way, so any more skips that we find will have been stranded here for a while. I was hoping you'd get some rest and refit after Borias. So was I. For a moment, both men looked weary. The fight had gone on for so many months, and so badly despite everything they had done. Both deserved a rest, but neither would get one, not unless it was the rest from which they would not return. A twinge of anxiety prompted Leia's next question. Have you seen Jaina? No. My squadron was pulled away for this duty just after Borleas. Jaina, Leia thought, deserved a rest no less than Jag and Han. Leia had wanted to force her daughter to take leave, and that was before the meat grinder that was Borleas the rearguard action where the Yuzhan Vong had been forced to pay for their victory in rivers of blood. But Jaina was, perhaps, too much like her mother, too committed to the cause of the New Republic, and the Jedi, ever to rest until some kind of victory was assured. Wisdom is knowing when you've given all you can. Neither she nor her daughter had truly learned that lesson. Jag turned inquiring eyes toward Leia. And you, Highness? Jag asked. What are you doing here? So far away from the centers of power. A diplomatic mission to the Empire, Leia said. You're alone? No escort? There was no one with the authority to give us one, so we just went. No use explaining about her vain hopes of spending some time alone with Han, a combination vacation and second honeymoon, while they transited to Bastion and back. I assume you'll attempt to convince the Empire to make greater efforts against the Yuzhan Vong, Jag said. His tone was insufferably superior. A pity that the logic of the situation is so against you. It would really make more sense in the short term for the Empire to join the Vong. Leia saw Vanna Dorge's sudden intense interest and dreaded it. Could you explain your reasoning, Colonel Fell? Dorja asked. Han, clearly furious, opened his mouth to interject a comment, but at a look from Leia said nothing. "'It's a question of what each side could offer the Empire,' Jag said. "'The Empire is a beaten shadow of its former self, strapped for resources. The New Republic is in no position to help the Empire, not when its own resources are being appropriated by the invaders. But think what the Yuzhan Vong could offer the Empire.' Whole worlds. All the Empire would have to do is take them from the New Republic, while the New Republic's forces are committed against the Vong. The Empire could double its size, taking its choice of worlds, and it would cost the Yuzhan Vong nothing. Vanna George's eyes narrowed with calculation. That's a very interesting analysis, Colonel, she said. Han finally couldn't contain himself any longer and lodged his protest. "'You forget what happens next,' he said. "'The Vong can't be trusted. "'They haven't kept their word yet. "'If the Vong let the Empire grow, "'it's because they're only fattening it for slaughter.' "'Jag rubbed the long scar on his forehead. "'That's why I said in the short term, Captain Solo,' he said. "'In the long term, I don't believe the Empire "'would survive long enough in a galaxy "'dominated by the Yuzhan Vong.' Vanna Dorge's eyes glittered. 
Could you explain, Colonel Fell? The superior tone was back in Jag's voice. Leaving aside any issues of perfidy, and it's perfectly true that Eugene Vaughn guarantees can't be trusted, there exist long-term issues of compatibility. The Vaughn and the Empire simply want different things. The Empire wants a return to the power and respect it once enjoyed. The Yuzhan Vong want not only the complete domination of the galaxy, but an ideological and religious domination as well. They want their way of life to triumph. And while some aspects of Yuzhan Vong life are compatible with the Empire, the discipline, the unquestioning obedience to authority, other areas are not. The Yuzhan Vong are opposed to all forms of technology. He held up a hand. And where is the Empire without its technology? The Empire has always relied on a technological solution to its problems. If it adopted Yuzhan Vong biotechnology instead, it would concede whatever advantages it has and make itself dependent on the Vong. He shook his head. And even an Empire doubled in size would be unable to resist the Yuzhan Vong if, I should say, when, the Vong move against them. The New Republic, if it somehow survived, would not come to the aid of an empire that had aided its enemies. If the empire allies with the Yuzhan Vong, it will be isolated, ripe fruit for the Vong whenever they choose to pluck it. And even if the Yuzhan Vong keep their promises and do not invade, the empire will be overwhelmed quite peacefully in time. In a galaxy dominated by the Yuzhan Vong, the Empire will have to become Vong-like in order to survive. The Yuzhan Vong triumph either way. Bravo, Leia thought in admiration. Jagged Fell's analysis had stated her own position succinctly. Lana Dorja, listening, nodded but offered no opinion. Leia could only hope she would include Jag's analysis in her report. Jag turned to Leia. We're isolated here, he said. I've heard very little information concerning what's happening elsewhere in the New Republic. Do you have any news I can give to my pilots? Leia took a deep breath. Only the sunny news, she thought. The Imperial spy was listening. The Senate has established itself on Moon Calamari, she said. They're in the process of reestablishing the regular processes of government and electing a chief of state. Amusement quirked a corner of Jag's mouth. I thought Po was chief of state. Po seems to be a minority of one at the moment. In the aftermath of the fall of Coruscant, Councillor Po had declared himself in charge and had begun issuing orders to the government and the military. He might have gotten away with it had the Borlias campaign gone differently. Po had expected the defenders to buy time with their own annihilation, but instead, Wedge Antilles and his scratch force had held out for much longer than expected, their example an inspiration to the remnants of the New Republic. The hollow documentary Battle of Borlias, by the historian Wolum Tser, was doing sellout business throughout the New Republic, and had shown the defenders of the planet as heroes battling against great odds. Wolum Tser's work had done a lot to change minds about the New Republic Defense Force and its capabilities. When the Senate had finally reconvened on Moon Calamari, they'd remembered that it was they who had the right to elect the Chief of State, and they'd summoned Po and his cohorts to join them. Even then Po might have managed his election as the New Republic's leader, but instead he overplayed his hand. He insisted that the Senate leave Moon Calamari to join him at Kuat. The Senate refused, declared the office of Chief of State vacant, and sent out instructions that no organ of government should obey Poe's orders. Poe's been made unwelcome at Kuat, Leia said. Even Niuk Niuv won't follow him any longer. He's left, for Sullust, I hear. I doubt he'll be welcome there either. Vanna Dorja gave a slight shake of her head. This is the sort of thing that can only happen when the chain of command is not clear, she said. It's clear enough, Han pointed out. Poe chose to disregard it, is all, and now he's paying the penalty. 
In the Empire, he would be shot, Dorja said. Han gave a satisfied smile. We're crueler than you are, he said to Dorja's surprise. Instead of killing him, we're going to let him linger for years as an object of contempt and ridicule. Jag, smiling also, rose from the table. Duty calls, I'm afraid, he said. We've got to destroy any remaining mines and coral skippers before the Yuzhan Vong get a transport out to rescue them. The others rose and said farewell to their visitor. Jag snapped out a salute. Good luck, Captain. Your Highness. He hesitated. Would you like an escort as long as your route takes you along the Hidian Way? Thanks, but no, Han said. We're not moving along the way, we're crossing it. It's a coincidence that we're here at all. Very well, then. Jag picked up his helmet. The best of luck on your journey. Good to meet you, Commander, he added with a flick of his eyes toward Dorja. And you, Colonel. Good hunting, Leia said. Jag smiled. I think it will be good hunting, he said, and moved toward the airlock. A few minutes later, the twenty-four fighter craft flashed into hyperspace, and the crew of the Millennium Falcon continued alone to a meeting with their old enemies in the Empire. Chapter 3 I have a few minutes only, Senator Fuhrer Rodan said. He sat, sank rather, in an oversoft armchair while his aides bustled in and out of his hotel suite. All of them seemed to have comlinks permanently fixed to their mouths and to be engaged in more than one conversation at the same time. I appreciate your taking the time to see me, Counselor, Luke Skywalker said. There was no place to sit. Every chair and table was covered with holopads, data pads, storage units, and even piles of clothing. Luke stood before the senator and made the best of the awkward situation. At least I have managed to get the Calamarian government to give the senate a place to meet, Rodan said. I was afraid we'd have to go on using hotel facilities. As he spoke, he punched numbers into a data pad, scowled at the result, and then punched the numbers again. The Senate hadn't quite shrunk to the size where it could comfortably meet in a hotel suite, but it was certainly a much slimmer body than it had been just a few months previously. Many senators had managed to find reasons not to be on the Capitol when the Yuzhan Vong attacked. Others had been sent away to establish a reserve of political leaders so that they wouldn't be caught all in one place. Yet others had commandeered military units in the middle of the action and fled. Still more had died in the fighting at Coruscant, been captured, or had gone missing. And then, of course, there was Vicky Shash, who had gone over to the enemy. Fjorodan had done none of these things. He had remained at his post until the fall of Coruscant, then been evacuated by the military at the last moment. He joined the luckless Po in his attempt to form a government. But then, come to Moon Calamari, when the Senate reconvened and summoned all senators to their places. His behavior had been both courageous and principled. He had won the admiration of many, and was now spoken of as a candidate to replace Borsk Felia as chief of state. Unfortunately, Fior Rodan was also a political opponent of Luke and the rest of the Jedi. Luke had asked for a meeting in the hope of swaying Rodan's position, or at least of understanding the man better. Perhaps Rodan's animosity toward Luke and his friends dated from the time that an impatient Chewbacca hung him from a coat hook just to get him out of the way. There were also rumors that Rodan was connected in some way to smugglers that he spoke against the Jedi because Kip Duron had once taken action against his smuggler associates. But those were rumors, not facts. Besides, if anyone was to be condemned for having friends who were smugglers, then Luke was damned a dozen times over. "'How may I help you, Skywalker?' Rodan asked. His eyes flicked briefly to Luke, then returned to the data pad. "'This morning,' Luke said, you were quoted on broadcast media as saying that the Jedi were an impediment to the resolution of the war. 
I should say that is self-evidently true, Rodan said. He kept his attention on the datapad screen as his fingers touched one button after another. At times, this war has been about the Jedi. The Yuzhan Vong insist that you must all be handed over to them. That is an impediment to the war's resolution, unless, of course, we do hand you over. Would you do that? If I thought that by doing so I could save the lives of billions of the New Republic's citizens, I would certainly consider such an action. He frowned slightly. But there are more serious impediments to peace now than the Jedi, such as the fact that the enemy are sitting in the ruins of our capital. His face hardened. That and the fact that the Yuzhan Vong will not stop until they have enslaved or converted every being in our galaxy. I personally will not support even an attempt at peace with the Yuzhan Vong until such time as they evacuate Coruscant and the other worlds they have seized. His eyes flicked to Luke again. Does that satisfy you that I'm not planning to sacrifice you and your cohorts, Skywalker? Though the man's words seemed reassuring, for some reason Luke didn't find them comforting. I'm pleased to know that you're not in favor of peace at any price, Luke said. Rodan's eyes returned to his data pad. Of course, I'm only a senator and a member of the late Chief of State's Advisory Council, he said. Once we have a new Chief of State, I will inevitably be forced to support policies with which I personally disagree. That's how our government works. So you should seek reassurances from our next Chief of State, not from myself. There is talk that you may be our next Chief of State. For the first time, Rodan's fingers hesitated on the keyboard of the data pad. I would say that such talk is premature, he said. Luke wondered why the man was being so consistently rude. Normally, a politician canvassing for support wouldn't close the door on someone who could potentially help him to power. But Rodan had always followed an anti-Jedi line, even when there was no advantage to be gained, and that meant something else was going on. Perhaps the rumors about smuggling made more sense now. Luke queried again. Whom do you support for the post? Rodan's fingers grew busy once more. One question after another, he said. You sound like a political journalist. If you want to continue along this line, Skywalker, perhaps you could trouble yourself to acquire press credentials. I'm not planning to write any articles. I'm merely trying to understand the situation. Consult the Force, Rodan said. That's what you people do, isn't it? Luke took a breath. This conversation was like a fencing bout. Attack followed by Perry as the two circled each other around a common center. And that center was... what? Fior Rodan's intentions toward the Jedi. Senator Rodan, Luke said, may I ask what role you envision for the Jedi in this war? Two words, Skywalker, Rodan said, his eyes never leaving the data pad. None whatsoever. Luke calmed the anger that rose at Rodan's deliberate rudeness at his provocative answers. The Jedi, he said, are the guardians of the New Republic. Oh? Rodan pursed his lips, glanced again at Luke. I thought we had the New Republic Defense Force for that purpose. There was no military in the Old Republic, Luke said. There were only the Jedi. A half-smile twitched on Rodan's face. That proved unfortunate when Darth Vader turned up, didn't it? he said. And in any case, the handful of Jedi you command can scarcely do the work of the thousands of Jedi Knights of the Old Republic. Rudan's glance grew sharper. Or do you command the Jedi? And if not, you? Who? And to whom is that commander responsible? Each Jedi Knight is responsible to the Jedi Code never to act for personal power, but to seek justice and enlightenment. Luke wondered whether to remind Rodan that the Counselor had opposed Luke's notion of refounding the Jedi Council in order to provide the Jedi with more direct guidance and authority in their actions. If the Jedi were disorganized, it was partly Rodan's doing, 
and it hardly seemed just for Rodan to complain about it. Noble words, Rodan said, but what does it mean in practice? For justice, we have police in the courts. But the Jedi take it upon themselves to deliver justice, and are constantly interfering in police matters, often employing violence. For diplomacy, we have the highly skilled ambassadors and consuls of the Ministry of State. But Jedi, some of them mere children, I might add, take it upon themselves to conduct high-level negotiations that frequently seem to end in conflict and war. And though we have a highly skilled military, the Jedi take it upon themselves to commandeer military resources, to supplant our own officers in command of military units, to make strategic military decisions. Such as to hunt smugglers? Luke wondered. He considered bringing up the issue of smuggling, but decided against it. With Rodan in his present mood, Luke didn't want to remind him why he hated the Jedi in the first place. It's an amateurish performance, Rodan continued. At worst, the Jedi are a half-trained group of vigilantes. At best, they simply make it all up as they go along, and the result is all too often disaster. I hardly think that the ability to do magic tricks is qualification for supplanting professional diplomats, judges, and military officers. The situation is critical, Luke said. We are being invaded. The Jedi on the spot should leave it to the professionals, Rodan said. That's what we pay the professionals for. Rodan turned to his data pad, called up information. I have your record here, Skywalker. You joined Rebel Alliance forces as a starfighter pilot. Though you fought with distinction at Yavin 4 and at Hoth, you shortly afterward left your unit taking with you the starfighter that didn't belong to you, in order, he paused to insert virtual quotation marks around his words, to conduct spiritual exercises on some jungle planet. And you did all this without even asking permission of your commander. You afterward returned to the military, served bravely and with distinction, and rose to the rank of general. But you resigned your commission during wartime again to devote yourself to spiritual matters. Rodin shrugged. Perhaps during the rebellion such irregular practices were necessary, or at any rate tolerated. But now that we have a government, I fail to see why we should continue turning over state resources to a group of amateurs who are all too likely to follow their master's example and abandon their posts whenever the mood or the force takes them. Luke stood very still. I think you will find, he said, that our spiritual exercises, as you call them, strengthen us in our role as protectors of the New Republic. Possibly so, Rodin said. It would be interesting to conduct a cost-benefit analysis to discover whether the Jedi are in fact worth the resources the government has devoted to you. But my point is this. He looked up at Luke again from the depths of his oversoft chair, and his eyes were not soft at all. You call yourselves protectors of the Republic. Very well. But I have looked very carefully at the constitution of our government, and there is no office of the protectors of the Republic. Rodin's expression turned quizzical. What exactly are you, Skywalker? You aren't military. We have a military. You aren't a diplomat. We have diplomats. You aren't a peace officer or a judge. We have those. So why exactly do we need you? Jedi Knights, Luke said, have been fighting the Yuzhan Vong from the first day of this invasion. From the first hour, many Jedi have been killed. Some sacrificed to the enemy by their fellow citizens— but we continue our struggle on the New Republic's behalf. We are effective enough that the Yuzhan Vong have singled us out for persecution. They are afraid of us. I don't question your bravery or your dedication, Rodan said, but I do question your effectiveness. If your people want to fight the Yuzhan Vong, why not join the defense force? Train with the other soldiers, 
accept promotion on the same basis as other soldiers, and accept the same penalties for derogation of duty as other soldiers. As it is, the Jedi expect special privileges, and the regular officers have every right to resent them. If you feel the Jedi are an undisciplined, uncontrolled force, Luke asked, why do you oppose the reformation of the Jedi Council? Because the Jedi Council would form an elite group within the government. You say you do not seek power or personal gain, and I will take you at your word. But other Jedi have shown less admirable traits. His eyes flicked to Luke again, a chill flinty gaze. Your father, for one. If you want to fight the Yuzhan Vong, Rodan continued, advise your Jedi to join the military or any other branch of the government that appeals to their interests and skills. They can, of course, continue to practice their religion in private, as any other citizen, and not as a state-supported cult. No, Skywalker. Rodan settled deeply into his chair and returned his attention to his data pad. Until you actually join this government you say that you defend, and join it on the same basis as any other citizen, then I have every intention of regarding you as I would any other lobbyist for any other interest group demanding special privileges for its members. Now, his voice became abstracted, I have many other appointments, Skywalker. I believe our interview is at an end. Why is he behaving this way? Luke wondered. And then he left. He kept calling me Skywalker, Luke said, because I don't have a title. I'm not a senator. I'm not a general any longer. I'm not an ambassador. He used the word like an insult. He could have called you Master, like I do sometimes. Mara Jade's voice was a smoky purr in his ear. His arms slipped around Luke's waist from behind. Luke smiled. I don't think it would be the same as when you do it. It better not be, Skywalker. Luke jumped as one of her hands gave his stomach a slap. Luke had found Mara waiting for him as he returned to their rooms in the large hotel suite they shared with Han and Leia. He had been calm even analytical, when he was speaking with Rodan, but when he related the substance of his interview to Mara, he found himself with less reason to maintain calm and objectivity, and the resentment that he hadn't actually felt in Rodan's presence now began to boil. Mara, without comment, had begun to massage the growing tension out of his shoulders. The playful slap on his stomach had banished the rest of it. Luke smiled. Luke turned and let his arms coil about his wife. We've lost Coruscant, he said. We're fighting the enemy every day, and the squabbling and fights for precedence never end. Rodan's not going to make it easy for us. He thinks the Jedi are claiming unjustified privileges, and can evolve into a menace to the state. He hesitated. And the problem is, he admitted, I'm beginning to think that much of what he says might be true. Sounds like a depressing interview. She drew him closer, let her cheek rest on his shoulder, as she directed a mischievous whisper to his ear. Maybe I should cheer you up. Would you like me to call you Master again? Luke couldn't help but laugh. With the successful delivery of their child, Mara had at last come out of the shadow of the terrible disease that had afflicted her for so long. For years, she'd had to control herself precisely and ruthlessly in order to either fight the illness or keep it in remission. The birth of Ben had been a kind of internal signal that it was possible to feel joy again, to feel the least bit irresponsible, to be spontaneous and impulsive, to laugh, to play, to take delight in life, despite the seemingly endless war that raged around them. And since Ben had been sent for his own safety to the Maw, Mara's principal plaything had become Luke. "'Say what you like,' Luke said, "'if the mood strikes. "'Oh, it strikes. "'It definitely strikes. "'Well,' Luke said, "'let it strike, then.' Sometime later, Luke turned to Mara and said, 
So, how was your day? Thirsty. I need a glass of water. Luke reluctantly allowed her to slip out of his embrace and into the kitchen. Moon Calamari had been swarmed by refugees from worlds conquered or threatened by the Yuzhan Vong, and housing in the great floating cities was expensive, particularly for those who insisted on breathing only air. Mara brushed her red-gold hair back from her freckled shoulders and took a long drink. She put the glass down, turned to Luke, and sighed. It was work, but I think Trebach and I finally convinced Cal Omis that he needs to be our next chief of state. Congratulations to both of you, Luke said. In the past few weeks he'd grown accustomed to the way their lives and their conversation veered sharply from the political to the personal and back again. Cal Omis had fought with the Rebel Alliance and had shown himself sympathetic to the Jedi. Certainly, from the Jedi point of view, he was a better candidate for chief of state than Fjord Rodan. Fjord Rodan wants the job, too, he said. The possibility was the only thing that got a reaction out of him. There are two more candidates. Senator Kola Quis announced his intention to run this morning, after you left. Luke searched his memory. I never heard of him. A Twi'lek from Ryloth. "'Serves on the Commerce Council. "'I don't think he stands much of a chance, "'but maybe he thinks he can forge an unbeatable lead if he starts now. "'And the fourth? "'Talam Ranth of the Justice Council. "'He's known to be canvassing for support. "'Can he win? "'Tribach thinks he isn't trying to win. "'Ranth is trying to build a block of supporters "'in order to play a decisive role in the outcome.' At the last second, he can swing his block to another candidate in return for favors. Luke shook his head. At least there are four senators left who think the job is worth having. That means they think they've a future in the New Republic yet. Or a future in looting the New Republic before it goes down. The dark thought intruded before Luke could quite prevent it. Carefully, he pushed the thought away and chose a different tack. The question is, he said, how much do we involve ourselves in this election? As Jedi, or as private citizens? Luke smiled. That's a separate question. Mara considered this. Would it benefit Cal to be known as the Jedi's choice? Luke sighed. Well, that question's answered. Mara was surprised. You think it's that bad? I think somebody's got to be blamed for the fall of Coruscant. Borsk Felia seems a fair choice. He was chief of state, and he made a lot of mistakes. Felia was martyred during the battle. He died a hero. It's going to be politically impossible to assign him blame. Mara nodded slowly. So you think it's the Jedi who are going to be assigned responsibility? I think we should take care that it's not... The question is how. He reached for Mara's water glass and took a sip. If we're seen as interfering in the selection of the chief of state, then we'll start hearing complaints of Jedi interference and Jedi power grab and secret Jedi cabal. From Fjord Rodan, if no one else. So we act as private citizens. And we don't do anything Cal Omis doesn't want us to do. He's the professional. He knows just how far to push, and where. He's the professional. Luke smiled at the irony. Rodan had wanted him to follow the professional's advice, and here he was doing it. Mara smiled. So, let's assume we win, and we get a government that will work with the Jedi. That's a lot of assumptions. What becomes of the insiders? Luke paused. During the Battle of Borlias, he and Mara, together with Han and Leia and Wedge Antilles and some others, had formed the conspiracy that was the Insiders, a group intended to form a rebel alliance within the New Republic, dedicated to fighting the war with the Yuzhan Vong. We don't go public with the Insiders under any conditions, Luke said. We don't tell Cal, even if he wins. The Insiders are our reserve, the people we know we can trust. It remains our secret. And then suddenly he thought, Jason. 
The water glass fell from his fingers and shattered on the floor. Mara stared at him. Luke didn't notice. A strange bliss had fallen on him. Now everything changes, he thought. It's the turning point. The words fell from his lips without volition. And even as he spoke, he came to the realization that he didn't know the place, amid all the great stars of the universe, from whence the words had come. Chapter 4 Jaina Solo sat alone at the controls of her ship, the tendrils of the alien hood fixed to her face. Her attention was focused on the ship's displays, where she expected her quarry to appear. Her quarry was Shimra, supreme overlord of the Yuzhan Vong. Kill this one, she hoped, and the Yuzhan Vong invaders might fall like a house of cards. Word had flashed from New Republic intelligence only three standard days earlier, that the supreme overlord was expected at the library world of Obroa Sky. Obroa Sky had been conquered, and the contents of the library were now being translated into the Yuzhan Vong language. Yuzhan Vong priests had been placed in charge of the library. There were Yuzhan Vong soldiers on the ground to protect their interests. Yuzhan Vong ships were common in the system, and the planet was home to a Yamask that would coordinate any alien pilots in the area. If anyone consulted the library any longer, it was the enemy. Possibly Shimra himself was coming to view a critical piece of information that had just been translated. Obroa Sky had become an enemy asset. And if Jaina had her way, it would become an enemy graveyard. So Jaina hovered here, with the bulk of the gas giant Obroa held, masking her from any detectors on the library planet, and waited to spring her trap. Just this one last effort, she thought, and maybe it's all over. If Shimra were killed, the Yuzhan Vong might collapse, and even if the enemy didn't fall apart, Shimra's death would serve as revenge for the fall of Coruscant and give the New Republic a much-needed breathing space. Jaina badly wanted an end to the war. She had been on the front lines literally since the first day. Then she had been joyful, confident, certain of her abilities of the power of the Force and the order of the universe. Since then, the war had taught her much. It had taught her doubt, terror, anxiety, fear, and anger. She had learned the limits to the Force and to Force mastery. The war had shown her the darkness that lay within her and how easy it had been for the darkness to overcome her, to drive her to fury, vengeance, and slaughter. Most of all, the war had taught her sorrow— Sorrow for her lost brothers Jason and Anakin, for Chewbacca, for her wingmate Annie Capstan, for the Hapen Queen Mother Tenennial Joe, for all the warriors who had died fighting alongside her, for the Jedi lost to the Yuzhan Vong's relentless program of extermination, for the billions of nameless refugees who had been caught in the conflict and destroyed, or dispossessed of all they had owned or known. She had learned her own fragility. She had been blinded in battle and learned the frustration of the invalid. She had been captured by the enemy. She had learned how easy it was for her to die, and how easily the universe would permit such a thing. Jaina had learned too much, and in too short a time. She needed a rest in order to try to understand it all, to reconcile herself to her new knowledge and her new reality but there was no time to rest. Her work was too critical, her expertise too necessary. She would have to win the war first, and then work out what it all meant. If, of course, the war didn't kill her first. There was a howl from Lobaka on her comlink. The Vong have been late before streak, though not often enough, she thought. You don't suppose that New Republic intelligence has once again drop-kicked their brains and sent us out here for nothing? That wouldn't surprise me, in which case we can return to base, take a nice long rest, no? That would surprise me. Huh. But if New Republic intelligence is right, Jaina said, more to herself than to her lieutenant, then this is it. This is like the destruction of the second Death Star, with the Emperor on it. Her. Then let the Supreme Overlord come. 
Even as Lobaka growled his impatience, Jaina sensed a distant trembling through her connection with the alien frigate, a shudder like a ground quake in the ether, her ship's dove and basils responding to the gravity surge that marked the arrival of a great many ships from hyperspace. Louis, she said, I think you just got your wish. She had not learned to love the captured Yuzhan Vong frigate as she had her other ships. Jaina had learned her ships through her hands, by tearing them apart and putting them back together. She had learned to love every component, every servo, every power cable, every rivet. The captured ship, on the other hand, couldn't be taken apart, not without killing it. It was a single organic whole and had to be approached as such. The interface through the cognition hood was difficult. The organic ship systems were complex and frustrating. The Dovin basils used for propulsion and defense were as baffling as they were effective. Her other craft had been fighter craft, agile, fast, and responsive. The Yuzhan Vong frigate Trickster was huge, and though it was fast, maneuvering it was like maneuvering a city block. Changing course seemed to take forever and there was no way to dodge or evade enemy fire. She just had to hope that the ship's defenses were strong enough to take the hits and survive. But if she couldn't love the frigate, she had learned to respect it. She respected its toughness, the wholeness of its design, its ability to repair itself, its stubborn refusal to die even when it had been shot to pieces in combat against its own kind. In fighting around hapes, the ship had been wounded almost to the death, but somehow, with the care of the Hapen scientists who were studying Yuzhan Vong life forms, it had survived and repaired much of the damage, though not all. Yet, despite the fact that some of the ship's damage was beyond repair, despite the torn Yorick coral and the Dovin basils that had died, it was still as willing as ever to risk itself at Jaina's behest. Jaina named it Trickster. The name proclaimed her a manifestation of Yun Harla, the cloaked one, the Yuzhan Vong trickster goddess. As such, the name was a slap in the face to Yuzhan Vong religious orthodoxy, though the guys had proved useful at both Hapes and Borlias, it had given her a clear tactical advantage. It also only added to the considerable number of enemy who wanted very badly to kill her, a thought at which she could only shrug. So what else was new? Let's go, Loie. Lobaka, through his alien cognition hood, ordered Trickster to accelerate, sweeping out from behind the Obroa-held gas giant and into view of any enemy detectors. Directed gravitational energy began to throb from the Dovin basils built into the frigate, and even though some of the Dovin basils had been killed at hapes, the huge, living craft began a ferocious, smooth acceleration that any New Republic vessel would be hard put to equal. Jaina followed this call with a coded message sent through the New Republic subspace communicator that Lobaka had implanted in the frigate. Target arrived. Let's start the party. It was only then that Trickster's sensors got a full reading on the fleet that had just arrived in the Obroiskai system. Jaina felt the hairs on the back of her neck prickle as she looked at the display. Eight frigates the size of her own. Two huge transport craft. More coral skippers and picket ships than she could count. And one enormous ovoid vessel, glowing in the displays like a burning, unwinking eye. Not as big as a world ship, but larger than anything else in the Abroiskai system other than planets and moons. The personal command ship of Supreme Overlord Shimra, Jaina thought. Oh, yes. New Republic intelligence was right. Another wave of gravity pulsed over the ship. These were the commands of the Yamask, the Yuzhan Vong war coordinator that executed the will of the enemy commander. Lobaka allowed Trickster to obey the Yamask's commands to alter course for the enemy, but slowly, as if the frigate were damaged or unable clearly to understand its instructions. The Amisk no doubt verified that the frigate was damaged, a fact that would make its lack of communication with the fleet more convincing. And then the party started. Dropping out of hyperspace, as if they'd been following Trickster, came the forces of the New Republic. Nine flights of fighters, 
four Karelian gunships, three Kuat Systems Republic-class cruisers, a refurbished Lancer-class frigate captured from the Empire during the Rebellion, and two MC-80B Moon Calamari cruisers, both wildly different in appearance but possessing a world-shattering complement of turbolasers, ion cannons, and their own ten squadrons of fighters, all of which now came boiling like swarms of stinging insects from their scalloped hulls. All under the command of General Kean Farlander, the Agamarian hero of the rebellion, and all appearing just behind Jaina, with the Abroa held gas giant only partially masking their appearance. This, Jaina thought exultantly, is a real battle. And they were following her plan, hers. For a moment her own fierce joy overcame all doubt, and she basked in the glorious sensation of power. Shimra, you better watch out. The New Republic forces had been hovering just four light hours, waiting for Jaina's signal to make the smallest possible hyperspace jump into the Yobroa sky system. They appeared slightly out of range of Trickster, as if they'd misjudged their return to normal space. It should look to Supreme Overlord Shimra like a perfect chance to ambush the ambushers. More commands came from the Amisk. Too many and too complex for Jaina to even attempt to decode. Through the weird perceptions gained through her hood, she saw the enemy fleet deploying, the heavy ships rolling ponderously into position behind darting swarms of coral skippers that flashed like schools of fish against the blackness of space, all moving with the simultaneity and impossible precision gained from coordination with the Yamisk's controlling intelligence. But they were doing what Jaina had hoped they would do. Perhaps encouraged by their modest advantage in firepower, they were maneuvering to engage the New Republic forces. Jaina had feared that if the New Republic fleet had simply leapt into the system and attacked, the Yuzhan Vong would have clumped around Shimra's command ship, and the New Republic forces would never have been able to get to the enemy leader. But instead, the damaged tricksters leaping first into the system made it seem as if the New Republic, not the Yuzhan Vong, had been surprised that they had jumped into the system in pursuit of a wounded frigate and found instead a task force. The Yuzhan Vong war psychology was based on attack, on the calculated ferocity of an all-out offensive. Jaina had hoped to trigger that psychology, and she had succeeded. For the moment, there was nothing for her to do but follow the Amisk's orders. She leaned back in the huge command chair that had been configured for an armored Yuzhan Vong warrior, and tried to relax her muscles, control her breathing. She let force awareness, always on the edge of her perceptions, flood her mind with its focused clarity. She felt Lobaka's nearby presence, under the hood that gave him command of the frigate's navigation. Her other lieutenant, Tsar Sebatine, had his efficient predator's mind focused on controlling the frigate's weapons systems. Farther afield, Jaina sensed the grim, reliable Corn Horn leading rogue squadron, and Kip Duron, flying at the head of his reformed dozen. Kip's reflex, on sensing her through the force, was to project concern, and she made a point of sending him warm reassurance. Since Jaina's involvement with Jag fell, Kip had been a nurturing presence, almost parental, and neither he nor Jaina quite knew how to reconcile his new persona with his earlier smoldering identity as the angry young man of the Jedi. Then, lastly, Jaina sensed a less familiar presence, the angst Jedi Madurin, who served on the bridge of the Moon Cal cruiser, Moon Adapine, ready to use her force link with the other Jedi to aid the New Republic. Other friends, she knew, would soon be engaging the enemy, friends who weren't Jedi and whom she couldn't feel through the Force. Friends in Black Moon Squadron and Saber Squadron, not to mention the hyper-secret wraiths, flying snoop ships that could outrun anything in the enemy inventory. Jaina basked for a moment in the pleasure of those she had trained with, served with, those who had shared her triumphs as well as her despair. At Mirker, she had learned the power of the force meld that could come when a number of Jedi united their minds and thoughts, becoming stronger than if each stood alone, and for a long moment she rejoiced in their unity. Jason, she thought, his presence a song in her mind, and then she fought her way clear of force awareness and of the sudden surges of contradictory emotion that streamed through her. A Wookiee howl 
came into her comlink. I don't know what that was about. She hesitated. I must have lost it for a second. Sorry. Obaka grunted his reassurance. I opened to the Force, and I must have opened to... to something else as well. Tentatively, Jaina reached out again to the Force and felt nothing but the warm concern of her friends. Everything's fine, she tried to send to them. But she couldn't help but echo Lobaka's question. What was that about? What had she opened to that caused the flood of memories and emotions connected with her dead twin? Distantly, she perceived the orders of the enemy Yamask, saw the Yuzhan Vong fleet instantly carry them out. There was no hesitation in the enemy, no sense of indecision or fear. Wish we could say that about ourselves, Jaina thought. Her own mind was gnawing at her situation, trying to deduce enemy intentions from their deployments. The plan for the upcoming battle had been largely hers, and it was based on several assumptions, none of which Jaina could be sure still applied. She could no longer have complete confidence in the assumption that the Yuzhan Vong hadn't realized that Trickster was no longer one of their own ships. She'd already used the frigate for deception, and it was perfectly possible that they would be wise to her by now. Part of her plan was also based on the use of decoy Dovin basils that could attach to enemy ships and identify them as enemies to their own side. This had been a spectacular success in the Hapes Cluster and in the Battle of Borlias, but sooner or later the Yuzhan Vong would learn to ignore or counter the false signals. The most crucial element of the plan were the Yamask jammers developed by Danny Kui. These would override the signals of the Yuzhan Vong war coordinator, preventing the eerie, single-minded, instantaneous maneuvering that had been the hallmark of enemy victories. If the Yuzhan Vong had worked out a way to counter the jammers, then Jaina was leading a new Republic fleet to certain destruction. With Supreme Overlord Shimra as a highly interested spectator in yet another glorious triumph for the Vong. Let it all work just one more time. Both fleets were maneuvering now. They were no longer hurtling directly toward one another on opposing tracks. Both had altered course in order to avoid the Obroa-held gas giant and to approach at a far more acute angle that would allow wide fields of fire to the capital ship's broadside guns. Among the enemy was a swarm of coral skippers that seemed dedicated to guarding the presumed flagship of Overlord Shimra, which itself hovered somewhat behind the action, screened by other fleet elements. And the flagship itself guarded the large transports— which took station on its far side. And between the fleets, Jaina's frigate, apparently ignored by both sides, fled across the gap, heading toward the presumed safety of the Yuzhan Vong squadrons. More orders came to Trickster, courtesy of the enemy Yamask. We're being ordered to take station astern of the enemy flag, Lobaka said. Well, Jaina judged, that's about perfect. Shall I comply? Yes, but act naturally. You know, slow and clumsy. Lobaka answered with a snarl, but Jaina could hear the laughter in it. Jaina relaxed again into the Force, integrating the picture she received through the alien cognition hood. Both sides were nearing the point of no return, the point at which missiles and fighters would start swarming across the gap between the squadrons. Jaina watched the ships move across space, tried to gauge the movement. Now— she sent through the force. She felt Maduran receive the order, relay it verbally to others on the flagship. On receipt of the signal, a device on one of Wraith Squadron's snoop ships began pulsing out gravity waves that interfered directly with the signals of the enemy Yamask. And then, when the enemy war coordinator was no longer able to communicate with the elements of its fleet, the New Republic fleet undertook one more maneuver— each fleet element altered course to drive directly for the largest enemy ship, Shimra's personal vessel. Shimra was now the sole target of more than one hundred New Republic craft. If the Yuzhan Vong Yamask was jammed, the enemy would not be able to coordinate a response in time. And because of the proximity of Abroa Held's gravity field, the enemy couldn't escape into hyperspace. Jaina sat trapped in what seemed an eternal moment of suspense, while she waited to see if the jammers worked, 
if the enemy responded. She could dimly perceive the jammer through her connection to the Dovin basils of Trickster, the rhythm of its transmissions overriding the sendings of the enemy Yamask. And then she felt another rhythm intrude on the first, and saw the enemy ships respond, swinging in a unified response to the New Republic's maneuver. Every single ship in the enemy armada altering course at the same instant. No, Jaina thought, horrified, it can't be. The jammer had failed. Or rather, it had worked for only a few moments, producing a hesitation in the enemy counter-maneuver. At least the enemy maneuver had been delayed. Their position was no longer ideal. Despair flooded over Jaina. Get out of here, she thought through the force meld. Get away from Obroa Held and into hyperspace now. It wasn't actual words she sent, but a frantic tumble of images and impulses and emotions that reflected her own anxiety. No. Cornhorn's strong presence flooded Jaina's force awareness. His answer was a powerful cocktail of feelings, impulses, words, and fierce reason. Think. Jaina was frantic beyond thought. Her frigate was sweeping directly toward the enemy, and one enemy squadron, led by two frigates her own size, had altered course so as to pass right by her, headed not for Trickster, she hoped, but for an element of the New Republic fleet. Missile tracks began to fly through her displays. Again, none aimed at her. Maduran's presence floated into the force meld, alerting the others that Farlander was going to try another maneuver at the last second. Jaina ordered her frigate to scatter weapons as the enemy squadron approached. As if they were shadow bombs, she used the force to shove them toward the Yuzhan Vong warships. But these weren't shadow bombs, nor would they cause damage to the enemy, at least not directly. Each contained a Dovin basil that, when attached to an enemy vessel and triggered, would identify the ship carrying it as an enemy of the Yuzhan Vong. In the past, she had used these devices to cause the enemy to fire on one another. But now, she had no confidence in the tactic. If the Yuzhan Vong had worked out how to counter the Yamask jammer, it wasn't very many steps from there to being able to counter every weapon in Jaina's arsenal. The enemy squadron flashed past, several of the decoy Dovin basils attaching to each ship. Jaina felt a surge in the force as the order was given for the New Republic fleet's last second maneuver. She held her breath as Farlander's squadrons turned and accelerated, an attempt to cross the bows of the oncoming Yuzhan Vong squadrons, shifting their target back from Shimmer's flagship to the enemy fleet elements. And then Jaina's despair deepened as she felt, through her connection with Trickster's Dovin Basils, another series of commands raining out from the distant Yamask. The enemy ships all turned, once again, to counter Key and Farlander's maneuver. The Yuzhan Vong hadn't even been delayed this time. They had responded to the maneuver the instant they detected it. Jaina's blood ran cold. The Yamask jammers had been countered. The single greatest contribution to the war, the keystone of Jaina's plan for winning the battle, and it was useless. Out of pure despair, she triggered the Dovin basil decoys she had fired at the enemy craft. Despite her impulsiveness, the timing was perfect. The decoys switched on just as the enemy craft opened their main attack on the New Republic squadron. All the missiles and bolts that would otherwise have poured into the New Republic ships were fired instead at the two frigates and a few other smaller craft which in their turn furiously fired at each other. Jaina watched as the elements of the Yuzhan Vong squadron began maneuvering against each other with the same uncanny precision they had always shown under the guidance of a Yamask. Yuzhan Vong pilots and gunners were shrouded by the living hood that fed them information, and they knew only what the hood told them. When it told them a ship was enemy, they fired at it. It worked, Jaina said. Of course, Lobaka answered. But why? The question floated to Jaina from Corin Horn. Think. Something's going on. Fire spattered the flanks of the two enemy frigates as projectiles and missiles struck home. Their Dovin basil shields had been aimed to repel the attacks of the New Republic squadron, not their own fire, and they were taking heavy damage. And then, once the enemy were fully engaged with one another, New Republic concussion missiles and bolts from New Republic laser cannons arrived, 
followed by Kipp's dozen and two other flights of starfighters. Smaller enemy ships were vaporized. The two frigates staggered to repeated hits. Muffled by her hood, Jaina gave a cheer. Through the force she could feel Corin, Kip, and Maduran as they fought together, bringing separate elements of the fleet into a synchronization similar to that granted to the Yuzhan Vong by their Yamask. But they flew only three ships, and led only three elements of the fleet, two of them fighter squadrons. The rest of the New Republic fleet was forced to communicate through more conventional means, and only one of the five enemy squadrons was in trouble, the squadron that Jaina had seeded with decoy basils. The rest were engaged with New Republic forces in a far more standard give-and-take, with the Yuzhan Vong still maneuvering with the eerie simultaneity given them by their war coordinator. The New Republic forces were presumably firing more decoy Dovin basils at the enemy, but the missiles would have to get through in order to have any effect, and so far none had. Contrary to what intuition might suggest, fighter combat generally grew less deadly, not more, as greater numbers of fighters were involved. When fights were large and confusing, pilots spent more time watching their tails than hunting the enemy. The brains of the pilots simply couldn't keep track of all the craft maneuvering against them. But that wasn't the case with the Yuzhan Vong War coordinator. The Yamask kept track of every craft in the sky and ordered those in jeopardy to maneuver while others were guided to rescue their comrades. The New Republic starfighter pilots, brave and well-trained though they might be, were simply outclassed by a dedicated intelligence that could process all the data from a large battle at once. Jaina's heart lifted when first one, then another enemy frigate blew to bits, both betrayed by the decoy Dovin basils she'd fired at them. But otherwise the Yuzhan Vong were doing well. Flames poured from one of the Karelian gunships, and the vessel was staggering out of formation, out of control, its sublight drives slagged. One of the Republic-class cruisers was taking a lot of hits, and around every formation winked swarms of little fireflies, starfighters and coral skippers dying in battle, their lives flaring away in brief, silent fire. Only Jaina, who had flown unmolested clear through the enemy fleet, was in a position to observe it all, and despair. The enemy Yamask gave the Yuzhan Vong too great an advantage. She could sense Corin and Kip as they battled against an enemy whose maneuvers were simply without flaw. Think. Jaina echoed Corin Horan's command. She led the only crew not engaged with the enemy. She was the only person with time to think. Why was the Yamask working, even though it was jammed? Why was the jammer not working while the decoy basils were functioning perfectly, even though they were both based on the same principles? Through Trickster's Dovin basils, she could distantly sense the commands of the enemy Yamask, the gravity wave instructions that commanded the Yuzhan Vong formations. But she could also hear the regular beats of the jammer, the jammer that should be overriding the enemy signal. What was going on? Think. She answered her question with a command. She submerged her awareness into the complex signals, tried to sense the pattern. The rhythms of the densely coded messages patterned through her mind, too fast for her to follow. There were two distinct patterns, she found, not one overlaid atop the other. The jammer and the yamisk seemed almost not to have anything to do with each other. What was the problem? And then, beneath the jammer, Gina began sensing something else. Another pattern. Her awareness slowed, tried to tune out the relentless beats of the jammer. There. Surprise sang along her nerves. What she detected seemed to be the signals of another yamisk. Two yamisks? The truth came in a sudden flash. Supreme Overlord Shimra had brought his own war coordinator to the battle, probably on his flagship. But there was a second Yamask in the system, one seated by the invaders on a broa sky, the Yamask that New Republic intelligence had known about all along. Whatever Yamask was first in command had been jammed by the wraiths. But then the second Yamask, operating on a different part of the gravity wave spectrum, had stepped in to take control. For a moment Jaina's hands twitched in her command gloves, on the verge of ordering the jammer and trickster to commence operations. 
But then she hesitated. If the enemy detected the origin of the jamming, then they'd know Trickster was a decoy vessel. Instead, she yanked off her cognition hood and reached for the comm. Twin sons leader to wraith leader. There's a second Yamask. You'll have to tune another jammer to it. Face Loran's tone failed to reveal whatever surprise he might be feeling. This is Wraith Leader, message understood, Major. There was a slight delay before Jaina detected the second jammer begin its hammering beat, and another few seconds before it found the correct signal and began jamming it. Anxiously, Jaina scanned the battle scene laid out behind her. It was working. The eerie synchrony of the enemy's ships was breaking up. Coral skippers hesitated in their movements, waiting for instructions in all the deadly chaos, and the New Republic craft took instant advantage. Momentum was with the New Republic now. They were used to operating with less than perfect communications and coordination, but the Yuzhan Vong pilots were bewildered once deprived of the commands of the Yamask. Got one, Kip's triumph floated through the force. Get another, Cornhorn sent. Had time to send, now that he was no longer so hard-pressed. Jaina could have wept with relief. She relaxed into the force again. She couldn't affect the battle directly, but she could help her friends, could send strength, love, and support through their force link. She sensed their growing strength, their growing triumph. Coral skippers blazed in front of their guns. Through the combined force awareness and the knowledge gained through Trickster's sensors, she watched the progress of the battle. When the two enemy frigates had destroyed each other, the capital ships fighting them had found themselves free and had moved to assist a second New Republic squadron, sandwiching a Yuzhan Vong squadron between them. Elsewhere, another of the enemy's frigates had been hit with one of the decoy Dovin basils and was being pounded by another Yuzhan Vong frigate and swarms of coral skippers under the impression that it was an enemy. The tide had definitely turned, and Jaina quietly exulted. My plan. It was working after all. Jaina, Lobaka's voice. Yes? I thought you'd like to know. I've just laid Trickster right astern of the enemy flagship. Jaina snapped alert and pulled the alien cognition hood over her head. At once she detected the rounded aft section of Shimra's ship dead ahead, studded with plasma cannon barrels, launch tubes, and rounded fairings that doubtless held something, probably Dovin basils, used for propulsion or defense. And they ordered us to come here, she thought in delight. Right, she said, this time through the comlink that connected her to everyone in her squadron. I want every cannon and projectile tube on that ship's stern targeted, and those fairings, too, whatever is in them. Acknowledgments crackled over the comlink, and Jaina busied herself in following her own orders. Most of her squadron members were dispersed over the frigate, hooded and gloved as she was, in charge of weapons or defense stations. Though she could command the ship with fewer than twelve crew, the efficiency was greater, if there were more sentients on station. And her rookie pilots, exactly half of her squadron of twelve, were a lot safer here than piloting their starfighters against an experienced enemy. All stations reported readiness. Jaina's gloved hands hovered in the air. Through the force, she sent the message that they were ready to open fire on the flagship. After a moment came General Farlander's reply, relayed through Maduran. Carry on. Carry on. Right. All weapons ready. Open fire. Trickster's bow blazed as a host of missiles and projectiles sped for the undefended enemy's stern. Fire blossomed over the dark silhouette of the enemy ship, patterns of pinpoint flares marking dozens of hits. Jaina made certain that amid the volley were two of her decoy Dovin basil missiles, one primary, one reserve. And as soon as the first volley was over, she triggered the primary, informing every Yuzhan Vong in the area that their own flagship was now an enemy. This encouraged the sixty nearby coral skippers to do their bit, plunging toward their flagship, fire raking along its flanks. The small craft probably couldn't do very critical damage to anything as huge as their target, but every little bit helped. There was a pause between the first volley and the second. 
only because the gunners were checking their targets and retargeting those that hadn't been destroyed. And then Trickster's bow blazed again, and this time the blaze didn't stop. Jaina was going to keep firing until every gun barrel and every missile tube on her ship was empty. The flagship was surprisingly slow to respond. Dovin Basil Energy was directed aft, sucking incoming projectiles into their black hole singularities. But the Dovin Basils were seemingly unable to cover all the stern, so some of the attacking volleys struck home anyway, and other bolts from the trickster arced through Dovin Basil warped space over the stern of the enemy ship, only to plunge down somewhere amidships. After Jaina's first strike, the enemy simply had no weapons remaining that fired dead aft, so missiles were fired out of the broadside batteries. These had to loop toward Trickster on a long arc, however, which made them easy to spot, and Trickster's own Dovin Basil's warped space to pick them off. "'We're in their shadow,' Jaina cried, and kept firing. Through her force awareness, she sensed Kip's satisfaction as he nailed a pair of coral skippers. Corrin's grim pleasure in leading his flight onto the tails of a group of enemy skips, and Maduran's awe as two more enemy frigates were destroyed. The stern of the enemy flagship was glowing now, an eerie orange-red as repeated impacts broiled the target. Jaina kept firing. The enemy's breaking off, twin leader, the flagship's voice came over her calm. Good news, flag. Not so good for you. They're pulling back to help their leader. That meant four enemy frigates would soon be engaging her. No, three enemy frigates. She saw one break up as it tried to maneuver away from the fight. Better call on the already taken care of twin leader. Already taken care of. Through her Dovin basils, Jaina felt the surge of gravity waves as two more squadrons of starships entered real space. Two battle dragons... Three Nova-class battle cruisers and accompanying fighters, all courtesy of the Hapen Navy, and led in person by Jaina's former classmate Queen Mother Tenel Ka, ruler of the sixty-three inhabited planets of the Hapes Consortium. Greetings, Tenel Ka sent. Her strong personality flooded Jaina's force awareness. The presence of a single additional Jedi had greatly increased the power of the force meld. Welcome to a bro sky, Majesty, Jaina tried to send. We've saved the flagship for you. She couldn't tell whether such a complex thought got through, but she could sense that Tenel Ka understood at least the substance of it. The Hapen fleet, like the New Republic ships, had been hovering only a few light hours from Obroa sky, ready for the call. Previous Hapen experience in fighting alongside the New Republic at Fondor had been nothing short of a catastrophe and Tenel Ka had taken a political risk in bringing her ships here at all. Both Jaina and General Farlander wanted to be careful in using their ally, and so it had been agreed that the Hapens were to be used either to complete a victory or, if necessary, to cover a withdrawal. What the Hapens managed instead was to complete a massacre. Hapen tactics had always consisted of a direct charge that launched a massed energy wall, all weapons blasting at once at a single target, a tactic that proved ideal for this situation. The battle dragons, on their way to the flagship, first took out the enemy transports, their concentrated wall of fire shattering the ships to fragments. Jaina watched in awe as the three battle cruisers, acting as one, dashed at the enemy flagship in a single pass, their batteries blazing. Much of the fire got through, and Jaina saw towering explosions and geysers of debris erupt from the enemy hull. Hapen energy weapons had once taken a notoriously long time to recharge. But after Fondor, the New Republic had given the Hapens quick-charge turbolasers, so the battle cruisers stayed in the fight and kept hammering, now joined by the battle dragons. The flagship quaked to impacts, flame pouring from the gaping holes in its sides. At this point, the rest of the Yuzhan Vong apparently conceded their flagship lost, abandoned the battle, and fled in all directions with allied squadrons in pursuit. Jaina was surprised. She'd assumed they'd defend their supreme commander to the last warrior. One alien frigate, surrounded by enemies, jumped into hyperspace too soon, and was dragged back into real space by Obroa Held's gravity. 
The inertia-damping Dovin basils failed at the shock, and every individual on the ship was flung into the nearest bulkhead at nearly six-tenths speed of light. The result was a superheated plasma that ruptured the enemy hull as it blasted outward. Another frigate was blown to shreds by New Republic cruisers. Of the capital ships, only one frigate escaped into hyperspace, along with however many of the coral skippers it had managed to recover. The Hapen ships blew up the flagship on their next pass. The starfighters began to hunt down the stranded coral skippers. All that remained was for the surviving Allied capital ships to move to Abroa Sky, destroy the planet's Yamask with a well-placed shot, and then plaster any Yuzhan Vong barracks or installations until they glowed, taking care not to harm what remained of the library. Jaina watched the end game play itself, her mind ringing with awe. It worked. Her plan. It worked. She had just killed Shimra, supreme overlord of the Yuzhan Vong. If she hadn't just won the war, she might have provided its decisive moment. A Wookiee howl came over the comlink. Yes, Tisar said. Congratulations. Cheers and congratulations erupted over the comlink, Jaina's squadron, the comrades she'd led into danger, cheering her success. An unaccustomed joy filled Jaina. Thank you, she babbled. Thank you all. More congratulations came through her force awareness, and then from the flagship. Stand by. The general sending a message. Kian Farlander's voice, when it came over the comm, sounded bemused. I've just received a subspace communication from intelligence advising me not to make the attack or to break off if I've begun, he said. Jaina laughed. In the heady triumph of the victory, New Republic intelligence seemed even more behind the times than usual. I don't suppose they mention why, Jaina responded. Well, Farlander said, it seems there's a problem. It looks as if Supreme Overlord Shimra wasn't in the flagship after all. Chapter 5 Can you tell me what's going on here? General Kian Farlander stood on the bridge of Monadapine, bent in conference with one of his captains, a spike-headed Elaman named Kartha. He turned briefly toward Jaina, a grim expression on his face, and said, just a minute, Jaina. This is important. Jaina had a hard time imagining anything more important than whether or not Supreme Overlord Shimra had just been turned into a chunk of charred space debris, but she bit back her reply and crossed the bridge to where Maduran waited. The angst Jedi stood more than four meters tall, with a thick tail that balanced her massive body and pointed head. She had volunteered for the war against the Yuzhan Vong, but could hardly be crammed into the cockpit of a starfighter. The bridge of Moon Adipine was far better suited to her. What happened? Jaina demanded. What's going on? I don't know any more than you do. Maduran sent reassurance to Jaina through the Force. It's all right. We did extremely well. We won. We took the offensive and we won. For the first time. Jaina took a breath and tried to calm her outraged nerves. Thanks, but what about Shimra? You saved a lot of lives today, Maduran reminded her. You saved us when you realized the Yuzhan Vong were using a second Yamask. She inclined her long pointed head toward the Alaman officer speaking to Farlander. You saved Karthas life, for one. He was captain of the Pulsar. Was. Pulsar was one of the Corellian gunships. Was that the one she'd seen out of control? Pulsar's completely disabled. We'll have to scuttle her. The general's making arrangements for bringing off the crew and getting medical attention to the wounded. The wounded? Trina had been so completely focused on combat that she had forgotten about the price of the battle the bloody toll of even a victorious fight. She straightened. She didn't want to think about the dead and wounded now. Her service had to be to the living, and her focus on victory. The kill ratios were very much in our favor, Jaina said. Yes, 
Maduran said. They were. Jaina scanned the bridge as she waited for Cartha and Farlander to conclude their conference. Though there were many different species aboard the cruiser, from the human Key and Farlander on down, the bridge crew was made up entirely of moan cows. The brilliant display monitors, with their strange distortions, were configured for moan calamari eyes, and the chairs and instrument panels were adapted to their amphibious physiology. The bridge architecture, with its shell-like, scalloped design, suggested a peaceful subaquatic grotto. So different, Jaina thought, from the hard, geometric shapes of starfighter controls, let alone the strange, melting organic patterns of her captured Yuzhan Vong frigate. Other captains entered while Farlander spoke with Kartha. Last of all came Queen Mother Tenel Ka, sweeping onto the bridge with her female hapen captains echelant behind her, and dressed in a magnificent sky-blue admiral's uniform covered with gold insignia and braid, her red-brown hair tied back by a glittering royal diadem. Jaina looked at her old classmate in surprise. She was more used to seeing Tennell's lithe, muscular body clad in the reptile-skin tunic of a Dathomirian witch-warrior. This sleek look was something new. The ruler of sixty-three planets clearly outranked a Jedi knight, because General Farlander broke off his conference with Captain Kartha, approached Tenel Ka, and gave a bow. "'Your Majesty,' he said, "'your fleet's arrival was well-timed. "'The timing was yours,' Tenel replied. She turned her gray eyes to Kartha, and the casualties, too. Hapes has taken many casualties on behalf of the New Republic, Farlander said. We hoped to spare you more. You've spared us political embarrassment as well. Tenel Ka gave Farlander a frank look. We can present this to our people as a nearly bloodless victory, she continued. This will aid our alliance. Fact, we are profoundly grateful. That was the royal we, Jaina thought. Tenel Ka was fitting with surprising ease into her new role as queen. We should return to the Hapes Cluster, before our loyal subjects learn we're not, as we claimed, on a routine fleet exercise. Tenel went on. But first, I'd like to know, was that Shimra we killed or not? The eye had been a slip, Jaina thought, indicating just how much Tennell had invested in the answer. Farlander quirked an eyebrow. I think I can guess how New Republic Intelligence made the mistake, he said. They know that Supreme Overlord Shimra is moving from the Rim to his new capital of Coruscant. They received a report that a Yuzhan Vong big shot, commanding a fleet, was due in the Abroa sky system to consult the library. They put two and two together and— came up with seventeen. He shrugged. Resistance units on the ground on Obroa Sky just confirmed that the enemy commander was someone named Supreme Commander Kam Karsh. Supreme Commander. Tennell's look was thoughtful. A rank second only to Warmaster. Still a notable victory. Yes, Majesty, General Farlander said. There was relief in his eyes. I'm relieved as well. I put this operation together in the absence of any instructions from my superiors. His eyes flicked to Jaina. And at the urging of one of my officers, who, even if she is a goddess, is still rather junior. Tenel Ka gave Jaina an appraising look. Goddess, she said. You can call me Great One, Jaina said. Most people do. Partly as a propaganda exercise, and partly because it suited the role she had played in the war so far, the New Republic military had gone out of its way to behave toward Jaina, as if she were an emanation of the Yuzhan Vong trickster goddess, Yun Harla. They hoped to take advantage of Yuzhan Vong's superstition about twins, or to outrage the Orthodox and drive them into an ill-judged frenzy. Jaina couldn't say whether this was working or not, but she had found the goddess routine amusing, for at least the first ten minutes. After that, it had become a drudgery. Tenel Ka's words were thoughtful. 
Does a mere mortal queen dare to hug a goddess? You have our permission, Jaina said. Tenel crossed the deck between them and embraced Jaina with her single arm, hard enough so that Jaina's breath went out of her. General Farlander tactfully cleared his throat. Majesty, great one, I'd like to proceed with the conference, if we may, he said. Kamkarsh may have called for reinforcements before his death, and I'd like to get out of this system while I'm ahead. Sensible, Tenel Ka said. Tenel bade farewell to Maduran, and then she and the captains retired to the cruiser's conference room, a seashell-shaped room with subdued, shimmering blue lighting that presented the illusion of being underwater. The room's central table was a gleaming work of art, subtly curved, gleaming like mother-of-pearl beneath the hushed lights. Tenel Ka, walking with easy dignity, took her place before the seat of honor. At her nod, everyone took their seats. The captains first presented damage and casualty reports. Jaina was pleased to report that her unit had suffered no losses and her ship only minor harm. And then there was discussion of what to do with Far Thunder, a Republic-class cruiser that had suffered significant damage, including damage to its hyperspace drives. Farlander was inclined to abandon and scuttle the ship. But Far Thunder's Captain Hanser argued forcefully that he could repair his ship given time, and Farlander finally gave his assent. Far Thunder would be evacuated except for command, drive, and damage control crews, then make a micro-jump out of the Obroa Sky System under escort by the Lancer-class frigate. A tender would be sent with the necessary spare parts to rendezvous with Far Thunder, and, with any luck, preserve the Kuat System's cruiser for future encounters with the Yuzhan Vong. We'll hope to see you at Kashi Ik, Farlander told Hanser. Kashi Ik? Tenelka was surprised. Why Kashi Ik? We're shifting our base there, Majesty, Farlander said. We want to be able to defend that section of the mid-rim, yet still be close enough to offer you assistance at Hapes if you should come again under attack. Tenel nodded. Your long-term plans? Farlander looked uncertain. The fact is that... We've received no instructions from headquarters since the fall of Borlias. I'm making everything up as I'm going along. Tenel frowned. Who is your immediate superior? Admiral Triest Crefe. But he is a relative of Borsk Felia, and was compelled to return to Bathawi for the period of official mourning. Jaina lifted one eyebrow, but otherwise remained silent. She couldn't bring herself to mourn the late chief of state— but she supposed someone had to. Kean Farlander clasped his hands and leaned forward across the conference table. Please understand, Majesty, he said. I hope that we may once more operate together against our common enemy. I will cooperate with you to the utmost of my power, and if the Hapes Cluster is again attacked, I hope you will feel free to call for my assistance. But I can't speak for my superiors— and I may be superseded at any time. Understood, Tennell said. Uncertainty dogged them all, Jaina thought. She had hoped, with a strike at the enemy leader, to bring things into focus, but her target had been a phantom, and even though a victory had been won, it was hard to say, in the fog of doubt, just what even such a victory really meant. Chapter 6 Jason rose gently from the embrace of the Force like a man rising slowly and reluctantly from the warmth and buoyancy of a mineral spring. He paused before rising fully to the mundane world and basked for a moment in the luxurious, shining unity of all living things, and then, like a garment, he donned his ego, put himself into himself, as it were, and he opened his eyes. You were successful? Roger asked. The strange being's feathery whiskers floated in an alien breeze, a wind heavy with warmth and the thick spoor of organics. They had escaped Coruscant in a Yuzhan von Coral craft, a vessel with a resinous interior that looked like half-melted ice cream and ventilation that smelt like old socks. I think I found them, Jason said. I touched my mother, 
and I know she recognized me. But we were cut off suddenly. I don't know why. And I think I may have reached my uncle, my master, Luke, and I touched my sister briefly. He frowned as the harmonious sensation brought by his connection with the Force was disturbed by the unsettling memory. But she was involved in a confrontation, a battle, I think, with the Eugene Vong. I broke the connection before I could turn into a fatal distraction for her. Anxiety for Jaina gnawed at his mind. Maybe I shouldn't have. Maybe I should have stayed with her, tried to send her calm and strength. You made the choice, and it was uncoerced, Verger said. For you to question such a choice is not simply useless, but harmful. Such doubts will chain the mind to an endless circle of pointless speculation and self-recrimination. You should prepare yourself to live with the consequences of your decisions, whatever they may be. It's different when the consequences are going to happen to your sister, Jason said. The diminutive Verger hunkered down, the knobs of her reverse-articulated knees rising strangely behind her. The rise or fall of a civilization can depend on the decision made in a fragment of a second. There are many seconds in a day. How many seconds can you regret? How many choices? Only the bad ones, Jason said. And if you don't know immediately whether the decision was good or bad, what if you don't find out the answer for fifty years? Jason looked at her. Fifty years, he said. I'm not even twenty. I can't imagine fifty years. Her tilted eyes shimmered like waves over cold, deep water. There was unconquerable sadness in her voice. Fifty years ago, young Jedi, I made a decision, she said. The consequences of that decision echo down the years until today, and I still do not know whether the decision I made was the right one. What decision was that? Jason asked. The decision that brought about this war. Verger's feathers rippled. I am responsible, you see, for all the fighting, all the suffering, all the death. All because of a decision I made fifty years ago on Zonama Seacoat. Chapter 7 Zonama Seacoat, cried Verger. The green land. Taller than the tallest tree are the boras, with balloon-shaped leaves in rainbow colors, and limbs with iron tips that call down the lightning. Deep valleys from which the morning mist rises in waves like ocean rollers breaking on the shore. A northern hemisphere of sun and bright green, and a southern hemisphere hidden in a perpetual cloud that forever cloaks its mysteries. Zonama Seacoat where mobile seeds attached themselves to living clients in their eagerness to be shaped, where airships bob gently amid the mountain peaks, where the vines and creepers carve out terraces over which the bright blossoms spill like living waterfalls. Black-haired Faroan colonists, who live among the generous life in a kind of symbiosis. Dwellings where the walls, the roof, even the furniture is alive. Factory valleys where boros seeds are forged into living ships, the fastest ever to fly between the stars. Zonama Seacoat. Where the air itself intoxicates. Where transforming lightning ignites life rather than destroys it. A world covered with a benevolent organism in the form of its own vegetation. An entire world that sings with billions of voices a great and continual hymn to the Force. I had become so besotted with the place that I had almost forgotten my mission. How hard it is to concentrate when the harmonies of Zonama Sikot sing in your ears. How blissful is sleep when an entire world shares with you its dreams. But I knew I must remain alert. Even before my arrival I sensed that a great terror lurked nearby. The Jedi Council had learned of an intrusion of a strange enemy— and sent me to find them, and also, if I could, to locate the fabled Zonama Seacoat. I found the second before I found the first, but from the behavior of the Faroan natives, I guessed that the intruders were near. The Faroans were too nervous, too reticent. 
Zonamasikot, was overripe with secrets and about to explode. I had come, I told the natives, to buy a ship, and this was true for the Jedi Council wished to know of the living ships that were bred in this distant world, and were willing to pay for the knowledge. I surrendered my ingots of erodium in payment, and I went through their ritual. I was chosen by three seed partners, spiky creatures who clung to my garment and sang to me of the great ship they would become once transformed by the lightning and the fire. This caused a sensation. No one had been chosen by three before. The seed partners were intrigued by my connection to the Force. So for two nights the seed partners clung to me, and I lived in a joyous trance that I shared with them, their dream of becoming. When I had my living ship I planned to fly it in a search for intruders. And then came the first strike of the Far Outsiders. Those whose worlds have been subdued by the Yuzhan Vong will recognize the pattern. It has been seen at Belkaden, at Cernpedal, at Tinna, Duro, Narshada. At first there is an invasion of a hostile life form, a living wind of change that sweeps across the world like a consuming plague, scores of native species dying as the invading life takes its hold. Suddenly entire regions become friendly to the Yuzhan Vong, hostile to the world's own native life. So it became with Zonama Seacoat. The far outsiders, the Yuzhan Vong, seeded the southern hemisphere with their own devouring forms of life, two complete ecosystems engaged in pitched battle. The beautiful towering Boras died, writhing in their death agonies as they called the lightning to blast the alien parasites that devoured their flesh. Through the force I felt the planet shudder. From my dwelling near the factory valley I saw the Boras tossing their leaves and limbs in horror at the battle that was being lost in the other hemisphere. The Pharaohans ran about in confusion and growing panic. Even the clouds reacted, flying through the sky in fright and terror. The forging of my ship was postponed as the entire planet mobilized to deal with the emergency. At this point I revealed myself as Jedi. The reaction of the Pharaohans was strangely ambivalent. Not hostile precisely, but warier than I expected. I later learned that they had been taught a version of Jedi doctrine, though far from an orthodox one. They were believers in the potentium, the doctrine that the Force is light only and that evil and the dark side are a kind of illusion. They were afraid I had come to persecute them for heresy. By the time I appeased their fears, the ecological onslaught had grown to embrace much of the southern hemisphere. I was brought to meet their leader, their magister. By that time his mountain palace was besieged by the world plague. Here, in a symbiosis with the plant that was his home, he directed his world's defenses. And he succeeded. The living world of Zonama Seacoat possesses more resources than the Yuzhan Vong had imagined. In the War of Ecosystems, Zonama Seacoat began to push the enemy back, the invading organisms began to die. It was then that the Yuzhan Vong attacked with conventional forces. Frigates bombarded the world from orbit. Coral skippers descended into the atmosphere to bomb and strafe. But Zonama Seacoat again had hidden resources. Fighters and other planetary defenses, and the Yuzhan Vong were driven off. This was not, you see, an invasion such as the one you know but merely a reconnaissance in force, the Yuzhan Vong scouting our defenses. I tried to protect the Magister, but in the end I failed him. A Yuzhan Vong squadron attacked his palace, and that brave, inventive man was killed. His belief that evil was an illusion did not save him. But scarcely did I have a chance to mourn the greatness of the man. His death brought forth a miracle. I felt, stirring in the living force, a powerful presence, a great mind uncoiling and feeling its power for the first time, a new being caught in the first astonishing moment of self-awareness. That being was Onama Seacoat. For three generations the Magisters, with their unconventional doctrine of the force, had communed with the living world that they believed was their mythical potentium, their all-benevolent force. 
unknowing they had taught the harmony that was Onamasiko to realize itself as an individual. What had been an egoless perfection now became a self-conscious, self-aware being, with all the confusion and uncertainty of a new, fragile creature dropped suddenly into a hostile universe. I needed to give the planet time. I offered to negotiate with the enemy on its behalf, in the hope of either turning away the attack or delaying the next assault. Seacote assumed the personality of its dead magister, and communicated to the Yuzhan Vong its wish to parley. The Yuzhan Vong consented, feeling that they might gain through intimidation what they had failed to gain through violence. The Pharaohans gave me a shuttle and a brave pilot, and I went to speak to the far outsiders. They were led by Supreme Commander Zhou Krajmir. He died in his sleep years ago. You would not have heard of him. Imagine the scene. The airlock dilating like a living membrane. The air that reeked of organics. The chamber with its curves and half-melted resinous walls. The mass of Yuzhan Vong. The commander with his staff, his priests, his intendant. In armor, bearing weapons all in an angry group, a crowd masked to intimidate, a group designed by Joe Krajmir to shock an envoy into submission. I did not face them quite alone. My seed partners, the embryos of my future ship, were with me, clinging to the robes that I had worn since the ceremony. But you can imagine what truly shocked me. All I had seen to that point was nothing compared to the realization, as I summoned the Force to my assistance, but I had brought the Force into a place that was alien to the Force itself. I could not touch them with the Force. They were blank. They were worse than blank. They were an abyss into which the Force could drain forever. Drain until it was all gone, until all existence, all life, had drained away. At first I thought that they were all Force Masters, that they had devised ways of shielding themselves from me. But as I tried again and again to pierce their defenses, I realized what the Yuzhan Vong truly were. A sacrilege. Everything a Jedi knows is based on the belief, on the absolute unquestioned knowledge, that all life is a part of the Force, that the Force is life. But here are beings whose very existence denied this sacred truth. From the depths of my heart I hated them all. I wished them blotted out. A rage rose in me, an anger so complete that I almost attacked them then and there, in the hope that I could obliterate them all from the face of the universe. Never had I been so close to surrendering to darkness. My anger was not the only anger in that room. The Supreme Commander was furious because his attack had failed, and he had lost face before his intendant. The priests were angry because I had flown to them in a machine they considered a blasphemy. The intendants were outraged because of the loss of scarce materiel, which they would have to justify to their own superiors. The far outsiders were eons away from their home, and Zonama Sikot had damaged their ability to survive here. But one creature there was not angry. The mascot of the priestess following. A feathery bird-like thing only semi-intelligent, long-legged, and orange-yellow. That being was the key, for I could touch it with the Force. I could feel its mind, benign, witless as a child, too mindless to feel the anger that surged about it. And it was discovering that creature that caused my rage to ebb. Perhaps the realization that the far outsiders kept pets made me realize they were not so far removed from ourselves. I realized that within hours I had just encountered the two extremes of the Force. Tsunami Seacoat was a living embodiment of the Force, of its harmony and potential. The far outsiders, on the other hand, were creatures completely outside the Force, whom the Force could not touch. One was a contradiction of the other. I wondered if it were possible for me to bring these two forces into balance— but first I had to deal with the rage of the Yuzhan Vong. Such was their fury that it was possible that these mad beings would obliterate me on the spot, parley or no parley. Again the priestess's mascot was the key. 
Using the force to influence its simple mind, I coaxed it forward. At my urging, it warbled. It crooned. It fell upon me as if I were a long-lost cousin and put around me its many jointed wings. The Yuzhan Vong stared. We danced together, the mascot and I. In unison we stamped and thumped and caroled. The Yuzhan Vong, I saw, had forgotten to be angry. They began to be amused. Some even swayed back and forth, if only slightly, to the tempo of our dance. And then I made them stare. With a push of my mind I sent the alien mascot into the air. Singing, it spiraled toward the Yuzhan Vong and orbited the commander. Singing, I joined it. The two of us continued our dance, sailing in a stately spiral about Supreme Commander Zhou Krajmir. The Yuzhan Vong stared in utter wonder. The far outsiders were capable of anger, of violence, of amusement, of awe. Were they then so very different from us? Was their very existence a blasphemy? I needed to know. Before their wonder began to fade, I brought the dance to an end. Joe Krajmir grew suspicious. He demanded to know what trick I had just played. No trick, I replied. What you have seen is the power of Zonama Seacoat. I told them I was not from Zonama Seacoat, but I was a teacher who had come to the planet in order to learn of its wonders. I described what I could of the world, that it was a glory, covered with a single great organism that formed a single intelligent mind. Then the Supreme Commander grew excited. I did not know then that the Yuzhan Vong, in their own way, revere life, not as a Jedi reveres life, cherishing each individual as a component of the Force that is both life and greater than life, but in their own perverse way. The reverence for life mixed with their own ideas of pain and death. The Yuzhan Vong revere life in the abstract, but sacrifice their own lives without thought. Their veneration of life is as extreme as their other beliefs, so extreme that they believe non-living things, droids, starships, even simple machines, are a blasphemy and an insult to Yun Yuzhan, their creator. The Supreme Commander had been tasked to locate habitable worlds for the increasing and increasingly discontented inhabitants of the rapidly deteriorating Yuzhan Vong world ships. To find a living world was beyond his wildest dreams. Then the intendant pointed out that the Yuzhan Vong lacked the resources to launch another strike. If the supreme commander attacked and was defeated, then the Yuzhan Vong would be without sufficient means to return to the great world ships that moved between the galaxies. If they conquered the planet but took losses, they would be stuck on the planet without the resources to defend it. The Supreme Commander reluctantly submitted. He would return to the world ship convoy and inform the Supreme Overlord of his discovery. He gave the order to withdraw. It was then that I had to make my decision. I had bought at least a temporary peace for Zonama Seacoat, but the mystery of the origin and nature of the far outsiders had yet to be resolved. They were clearly a menace to the galaxy, to the Jedi, and perhaps to the Force itself. Yet they did not seem beyond understanding, and reacted in many ways as other sentients do. These beings were so extraordinary that my mind was dizzied with their strangeness. Though I could now return to Zonama Seacoat, with much of my mission accomplished, I knew I could not leave the Yuzhan Vong before I had answered my many questions. I approached the priestess Falun, and asked whether I might stay on the ship with my cousin, by this I met her pet, and she conceded. Perhaps Falung would be kind enough to instruct me on her doctrine. In return, I would tell her as much as she wished to know of our own galaxy. The priestess agreed, and without reference to the supreme commander. I saw that she was powerful enough in her own right to make these decisions. So I was committed to remain. I returned briefly to my shuttle, and contacted the spirit of Seacoat, who was still assuming the form of the planet's dead magister. I told the planet that it was safe for now, but that it should prepare for another, stronger assault in the future. And then 
and this was very hard. I had to bid farewell to my seed partners. They had dreamed with me of the great ship that would flash between the stars like the lightning that the Boraz drew from the skies. But this was not to be. I told the seed partners that they had to return to the planet. I told them that a Jedi would be coming to Zonama, for I was certain that Jedi would follow in my footsteps when I did not return, and that they must hold themselves in readiness. I impressed upon them a message that was to be delivered to that Jedi, saying that an invading force was poised to overrun the galaxy, that the force was useless in fighting these creatures. If a Jedi came, I know not. If the message was delivered, I cannot tell. I did what seemed best, but in this I may have failed somehow. Following this came the hardest task of all. I destroyed my lightsaber, the outward symbol of everything to which I had dedicated myself. I knew that the Yuzhan Vong would not permit me to retain anything of a technological nature. My comm link and my few other metal objects I gave to the shuttle pilot who had brought me. And so I bade farewell to everything I had known. I returned to the Yuzhan Vong, and the priestess following, and Joe Krajmir's forces returned to that limitless space between the stars where the Yuzhan Vong world ships traveled. From time to time, the Yuzhan Vong asked to see me dance with the priestess's mascot. The mascot and I danced and flew, but we flew less and less the farther we traveled from Zonama Seacoat. When we left the galaxy, I told Falung that we were at such a distance that the power of Seacoat could no longer reach us, and from that point on we no longer danced. I did not want the Yuzhan Vong to know that it was my power, not Seacoat's, that had created the aerial dance. I did not want the Yuzhan Vong even to consider the possibility that I had any power of my own. For his action in discovering Zonama Seacoat, Supreme Commander Zhou Krajmir was granted a new leg implant as a reward. He did not make a good recovery, and was dead in a few years. Falun, priestess of Yun Harla, instructed me in the religion of the Yuzhan Vong, and in particular the mythology of Yun Harla herself. Yun Harla, the trickster, is never visible. Her body is made of borrowed parts— and cloaked in borrowed skin. Over the borrowed skin are garments designed to deceive and deflect. Yun Harla herself is never seen. Only her spirit is to be found working in the world, laying traps and deceiving the unwary. As Yun Harla is, so I became. I became cloaked, as it were, in borrowed garments, in my assumed identity as a simple teacher eager to learn the true way. My weapons were those I could borrow or adapt from my opponents, those and my own cunning. My force abilities I learned to keep hidden, even from telepathic creatures such as Yamasks. I meditated upon Yun Harla every day, every day for fifty years. I turned my true self completely inward. It required little effort to maintain my identity as the familiar of following the priestess, in part because the Yuzhan Vong expect so little from a familiar. But in my mind, I built my home. There I could consider the matter of the Yuzhan Vong and contemplate the force. In my mind, I learned true freedom. In my conversations with Falun, I tried to suggest the key Jedi principle of the unity of life, and somewhat to my surprise, she agreed with me. All life, she explained, was a part of Yun Yuzhan, who created it through his own sacrifice, tearing himself into bits and flinging himself through the universe to spawn all existence. Though the reverence for life was real, it was not possible to separate it from the Yuzhan Vong obsession with pain and death. Others than Falun questioned me, but not about philosophical matters. As far as they were concerned, we were all infidels, and our beliefs were of no possible interest. The information that truly interested them was of a military and political nature. I agonized over what I would tell them. Should I tell them the Republic was unprepared, in the hope that the Yuzhan Vong would attack prematurely, carelessly, and with overconfidence? Or should I suggest that the Republic's defenses were invincible, 
and forced the Yuzhan Vong to make elaborate, thorough preparations that I hoped other Jedi, following in my footsteps and warned by my message, would detect. In the end, I dared not lie to them. I knew not what other sources of information were available to them. But I could feign ignorance. I had assured them I was a simple teacher, no authority on the defenses of the Republic. I was not in a position to influence the Yuzhan Vong for good or ill. Following died, and I became the property of her junior, Elan, who was not in a position to affect policy. And so the war began. And it began the way it did because of the decisions I made fifty years ago at Zonama Seacoat. Because I danced in the air and proclaimed my power the power of a world. Was I wrong to do so? Right? And if it was wrong, should I have spent the last fifty years in sadness and recrimination, fearing to act in the event that I made another mistake? I chose. I acted. And then I resolved to face the consequences. Tell me then, young Jedi, was I wrong? Chapter 8 Jason heard Verger's story in silence as he squatted on his heels on the resinous floor of the coral ship. He did not answer her question, but instead asked a question of his own. Where is Onama Seacoat? I have never heard of a living planet. Verger shrugged her narrow shoulders. It left, she said simply. Jason stared at her. I felt Seacoat's goodbye. I had saved it once, but I sensed it was under a new threat. The planet had hyperdrive engines. It was capable of going into hyperspace. So it fled. Jason blinked. Where did it go? I remind you that I have been away for a number of years. I will not venture to guess. Jason rubbed his chin. One hears stories of planets that move but usually in the same tap-calves and from the same people, who tell you of the cursed palace of Zabatu, or old Admiral Faray's ghost ship that plies the Deiragon Trail. Verger gave a sniff. I do not venture into tap-calves. I would not hear such stories. Jason gave a quiet smile. No, you venture into more dangerous places than bars. Roger's crest feathers rippled. You did not answer my question. Did I do wrong on Zonama's seacoat, or did I not? What I think, Jason said, is that I'm still worried about my sister. He knew perfectly well that Verger had told her story at this moment partly in order to distract him from his anxiety over Jaina. Verger made a sound somewhere between a snort and a sneeze. She straightened her legs and reared to her full height of slightly over a meter. You haven't been paying attention. I have. I'm still thinking about it. But I'm also still concerned about Jaina. Verger made the noise again. Jason's thoughts returned to the mystery of the vanished planet. I've never heard of Zonama Seacoat by that name. And if your warning ever reached the Jedi Council, I haven't heard of it. But then it's not likely I would have. We haven't had a Jedi Council in more than a generation. What became of it then? Verger paced back and forth before Jason, the patchy feathers on her frame fluffing and then smoothing again. Perhaps you can tell me what has happened to the Republic in my absence. Tell me why the thousands of Jedi Knights I expected to contact on my return no longer exist. Why there are only a few score half-trained young Jedi in their place— and what all of this has to do with this Sith Lord you mentioned on Coruscant, this Vader, your grandfather, whom I remember as that turbulent little Padawan, Anakin Skywalker. Crouching, Jason watched Verger's agitated pacing. He shook his head and gave a laugh. Well, he said, you'd better sit down again, because this is a very long story. This time Verger sat in silence while Jason spoke. When he was done with his bare narrative, she asked questions, and Jason replied as completely as he could. 
At the end, they were both silent for a long, long moment. Finally, Jason broke the silence. May I worry about Jaina now? No, you may not. Why not? Berger straightened and approached the coral ship's little control station. Best to worry for ourselves, she said. We're about to fall out of hyperspace. When we arrive in real space, we'll be near a well-defended world of the New Republic, guarded by fighters very jumpy after the fall of Coruscant. We are in a Yuzhan Vong vessel, with no means of contacting these trigger-happy defenders, and we have no defenses and no weapons. Jason looked at her. What do you suggest we do? For Jer's feathery crest gave a little flutter. Foolish question, she said. Naturally, we trust the Force. Chapter 9 Surrounded by rainbows, the great shadow descended in majesty from the sky. Like the wings of a butterfly just emerged from its cocoon, enormous wings slowly unfolded from the great craft. Rainbow colors pulsed and swam. Doroic Vong Prat the roar came from ten thousand throats. The perfect rectangular formation of warriors, in their Von Doon crab armor, raised their amphistaffs and roared their battle cry as the shadow of the craft passed over them. Tan Yun for Kana Joy! Ten thousand priests, in red cloaks emblazoned with the symbol of Yun Yuzhan, crossed their arms in salute and roared their devotion as the vessel's shadow enveloped them. Thi Rug! Thi Rug. Ten thousand members of the Shaper class, dressed in stainless white, howled their pride, fear, and obedience as the belly of the great craft passed over them. Beyond the three giant formations of priests, warriors, and shapers, masked workers cried nothing, but simply flung themselves onto their faces, groveling in submission to the great shadow as it passed before the sun. Shamed ones, Mutilated and crippled and barred from the ceremony, hid in their barracks or workhouses and shivered in fear. The smallest group, the twelve hundred members of the intendant class, stood motionless in three long lines in front of the three larger formations of Yuzhan Vong, each member in his long green cloak. They did not shout, but stood in perfectly disciplined silence, arms crossed over their chests, as the massive craft moved silently overhead. If we had a battle cry, thought Nomanor, from the second rank, it would probably be, have you triple-checked this order with your superiors? For it was the intendants who administered the new empire of the Yuzhan Vong, and tried to balance the competing claims for resources among the other castes. A task that grew harder, it seemed, even as victory followed victory and more resources became available. For years now, since before the time he had poisoned Imperial Interim Ruling Council members in the cause of Zandal Caravus, Nomanor had been living among the enemy as a spy and saboteur. In the service of the Yuzhan Vong he had spun his treachery and left a trail of bodies across half the galaxy. It had almost been enough to forget that the normal job of an intendant was a bureaucratic one. Rainbows spiraled off the craft's great unfolded wings, Dovan basils with their space-warping capabilities tuned to the spectrum of light. The great shadow hovered over the massive cradle that had been built for it, then slowly, majestically descended. Another great cry roared up from the triumphant multitude as the huge craft settled into its cradle like a monarch, slowly sitting on his throne. Dazzling, spinning rainbows reached into the heavens, cast brilliant light onto the plaza, where the Yuzhan Vong masses waited. Beneath the ship, hidden from view, the living craft and the living cradle joined, linking power in communications and resource systems so that the craft now drew its nourishment from the planet, and the Supreme Overlord was in direct contact with the world brain, the Duryam that controlled the remaking of Yuzhan Tar, formerly known as Coruscant, capital of both the new and old republics. The Supreme Overlord's craft, ship and palace in one, was now joined with its cradle, just as the space-born Yuzhan Vong had settled onto the conquered worlds that their gods had promised them. The craft would remain here permanently, 
its rainbow-edged wings outstretched over this world the Yuzhan Vong had conquered. The conquered world would be altered from the bedrock up to recreate the legendary homeworld of the Yuzhan Vong, lost long ago in another galaxy. At the moment the shot went up, Nomanor began to feel an itching at the base of his toes. He resisted the impulse to bend and scratch, or to scrape one boot over the other. The Yuzhan Vong did not regard bodily discomfort as significant. Only those who had most successfully embraced pain and mutilation were promoted to the highest degrees. Surely an itch could be overcome. As if to dispute this claim, the itch increased its fury. Nomanor found that it was all he could do to keep his mind on the ceremony, on the ritual steps and obeisances that prepared the way for the appearance of the Supreme Overlord. He panted with the effort to ignore the itch. He alternately stretched and clenched his toes inside his boots, hoping the effort might relieve his torment. It didn't. Another roar went up from the crowd. Through his single rainbow-dazzled eye, Nomanor saw two figures on the summit of the great building. Shimra's personal quarters arched up above the plaza like a head on the end of a long neck. At the apex was a circular walkway surrounded by a rail that glittered like mother of pearl in the artificial rainbows. Standing amid the brilliance was Supreme Overlord Shimra, unquestioned leader of the Yuzhan Vong, sanctioned by the gods to bring all these new worlds under his heel. Nomanor's eye was so dazzled by rainbows that he could see nothing of Shimra but a silhouette, a giant silhouette, towering over the bent, ungainly figure next to him. Onimi, apparently, a member of the Shamed Ones whom the Supreme Overlord had adopted as his familiar. As Shimra's loyal subjects bellowed their triumph, several moon duels waddled out of the shadow of the building. Giant, placid beings weighing four metric tons or more, the creatures had been implanted with specialized, dedicated villops by the shapers who had crafted them. Villips that enabled them to receive communications from a master villip employed by the Supreme Overlord. Each moon duel, on receiving a message, could then broadcast it to others in its vicinity through the use of a giant, two-meter tympanum of skin that stretched over its belly. The moon duels spread out over the plaza, then sat back on their haunches, their tympany directed toward the formations of Yuzhan Vong. Numanor could hear joints cracking as the nearest of the massive creatures settled itself into an upright posture. The Supreme Overlord's voice, amplified by the timpani in the moon duels, echoed and re-echoed over the plaza, and for a moment Numanor forgot his aggravating itch. Yuzhan Vong, conquerors, blessed of the gods, Shimmer roared, we have come to the turning point. Luke found out the next afternoon why Fior Rodan had behaved in such an extraordinary way at the meeting. Rodan hadn't been having a conversation. He'd been rehearsing a speech. He laid it all out before the Senate this morning, Cal Omas said. His whole program. The Jedi shouldn't be a privileged group within the state. We should stop spending money on Jedi concerns. A new Jedi Council would be a threat. Jedi should just get jobs like every other working stiff, Mara added. Cal laughed. How was the speech received? Luke asked. Cal Omas clasped his lanky arms behind his head. I imagine it went down well with the working stiffs. As for the senators, some agreed, some didn't. Some saw it only in political terms. Since Fior made no motion— just stood up in the Senate and gave his speech and made sure there were plenty of reporters there to cover it, there wasn't a head count one way or another. So why did he make the speech at all? Tribok, the Wookiee, who served with both Omas and Rodan on the advisory council, gave a long series of roars, all translated by the elderly protocol droid that Cal used for a secretary. He spoke in order to make the Jedi an issue in the upcoming election. Now that he has made his speech, Cal and the other candidates are forced to respond. Whether they want to or not, Luke said. Precisely, Cal said. Fjord's started up a tune, and the rest of us will have to dance to it. 
Cal Omas's apartment was cramped and underwater, though built with the usual Mon Calamari attention to elegant design, which made it seem larger than it actually was. A transparent wall looked out onto the floodlit inverted cityscape of Herkia Floating City, showing Moon Cows and Corin swimming past or jetting by in their vehicles. Unfortunately, the transparent wall sweated heavily. The air was dank and tasted of brine. The carpet was soggy, and the small sofa that Luke and Mara shared gave off a distinct smell of mildew. There was no security. Cal's protocol droid was beginning to show rust stains. Still, Cal's place was better than most refugees' quarters, and a testimony to his character. He had refused to pull rank and demand better quarters for himself. Such were the circumstances of the man whom Luke hoped would be the next chief of state of the New Republic. Even Fjord Rodan's cramped, overflowing hotel suite was more impressive than this. I made a response to Fjord's speech, Cal went on. I said that anyone who fought alongside the Jedi in the war against Palpatine would never believe that they were a threat to the rest of us, and that it was unfortunate that Rodan lacked the experience. Trebach gave a howl of appreciation. Clever, Mara said. Good to point out that while you were fighting for the freedom of the galaxy, Rodan was off selling protocol droids to Lurians or whatever. That didn't end it, though, Cal said. CZ-12R here, nodding at his protocol droid, has been swamped with messages from reporters wanting to know the details of my Jedi program. And of course, Luke said, we don't know what that is yet. I'm afraid not. Cal leaned his long body forward in his chair and looked at Luke. I'd like to reestablish the Jedi Council, of course, but I don't know if it's a good idea to say so. When all else fails, Mara advised, fall back on the truth. Calumus gave a look of mock horror. No, I'm a politician. I can't tell the truth. Seriously, Cal, Mara said, what can you say? Cal Omas hesitated. Suppose, Luke offered, you say that you will bring the Jedi firmly under the control of the government. You don't have to specify how. I'll have to give some details, Cal said. Otherwise, it'll seem as if I don't really have a plan at all, and that would be uncomfortably close to the truth, which, with an amused glance at Mara, as a politician I absolutely cannot speak. He frowned. Luke, can you tell me how the Jedi Council was set up in the past? If we know how it used to work, maybe we can make it work again. The Jedi Council was a dozen or so respected masters, Luke said, who oversaw the other Jedi in their training, and who reported to the Supreme Chancellor. If the Chancellor saw a problem that required Jedi abilities, he would inform the Council, who would send Jedi to deal with it. Usually not many— because it was well known that behind the first Jedi were a few thousand more. And I imagine that information went both ways, that the Jedi themselves would alert the Supreme Chancellor if their own network of contacts pointed to a problem somewhere. A few thousand Jedi, Cal mused, to cover an entire galaxy. Mara gave a smug smile. We're good, she said. But... There are somewhat less than a few thousand of you now, Cal said, which is why we now have a military and a diplomatic service and so on. So how do I counter Fjord's contention that you're redundant? Well, Mara said, what happens if you need a diplomat who can also practice philosophy, fight with a lightsaber, and levitate small objects? Who else are you going to call but us? Tribak gave a snarl of amusement. Luke felt a kind of bliss sing through his heart at the fact that Mara could joke again, and he put an affectionate arm around her, after which he decided to ignore the scent of mildew that rose from the pillows. "'Mara has a point,' he said. "'We provide a specialized service. All-arounders, if you like.' "'The Council of All-arounders,' Cal Omis sighed. "'I don't think we're getting anywhere.' "'Not the Council of All-arounders,' Luke said." "'The Chief of State's Special Investigative Service. "'Your eyes, ears, and sword arm throughout the galaxy. "'When you need more muscle than a diplomat, 
and less than a battle cruiser you send us. Cal's eyes brightened. I think we're getting somewhere, he said. But there are still problems with that scenario. Either they're going to say that you're secretly controlling me and I'm your puppet, or they're going to claim you're a bunch of super-powered clandestine agents whom I'm going to use to subvert the Constitution. Probably Fjord will manage to say both things at once. He sighed. Unfortunately, we're stuck with a constitutional, representative, multi-branched government, heavily scrutinized by a self-interested media. We're inefficient, divided, and prey to conflicting and contradictory interests, even and perhaps especially in moments of crisis. Tribak gave a low moan. Luke gave Tribak a sharp look. No, he said. Never even think of sympathizing with Palpatine. Tribak conceded with a graceful bow of his shaggy head. But even as he spoke to Tribak, Cal's words seemed to echo for a long moment in Luke's mind. Constitutional, representative, multi-branched. As opposed to what, he wondered? Elite, clandestine, autocratic, threat to the Constitution. The old Jedi had personified the rule of order and the will of the state, but they were also secretive and removed from the people and their representatives. Their link to the outside was through the Supreme Chancellor, and once a malevolent figure like Palpatine became Chancellor, with his disciple among the Jedi, the Jedi were cut off by the secret enemy, isolated and destroyed. The Jedi should never be so isolated again. He became aware that the others were staring at him. Another message from the beyond? Mara asked. Luke smiled. No. At least I don't think so. What then? I think I've worked out how to re-establish the Jedi Council in a way that will disarm Fior Rodan. Cal leaned forward. Tell, he said. I had a nagging feeling when I was listening to Fior Rodan yesterday. Luke began. The nagging feeling I had, he continued, was that Rodan was right, in a way. We are doing the jobs that other people are being paid to do. We are asking the government for privileges, and we're asking a great deal of people to believe that we ask in all humility and mean no harm. Yet all they have to do is remember Darth Vader, and they'll suspect the contrary. And your solution? Cal looked deeply intrigued. Suppose the Council isn't composed entirely of Jedi, Luke said. We can have one member from each of the government branches that might feel threatened by us. Say we have a senator chosen by the Senate, someone from the Defense Force, another representative from the Ministry of State, and another from the Justice Council to make certain we stay within the law. Rodan would have a hard time convincing people that all those representatives were Jedi puppets, especially if the Chief of State himself was on the Council as well. The Chief of State or his ambassador, Cal said. The Chief of State is a busy person, conceded. Cal frowned as he considered the matter. You've just given me quite a list. That's five non-Jedi on the Jedi Council. Six, Luke corrected on second thought. We'd also need someone from the Intelligence Division. And how many Jedi, Cal asked. If we make the Council too large, we'll start having the same problems as the Senate. It'll be too big to be effective. Six Jedi, Luke said. That will bring the government representatives into balance with the Jedi. Cal's long face grew abstract as he considered the implications of the new idea. That's giving up a lot of the traditional Jedi power, he said. It's power we've already lost, Luke said. We lost it when the old Jedi fell. Cal's eyes focused, searching Luke's face. You're sure? You're sure that you're comfortable departing this far from Jedi tradition? Luke felt an utter certainty in his answer. On Ithor, I surrendered the guardianship of the Jedi tradition. I'm content with the idea. Tribak gave a triumphant roar. And you'd be welcome as the first senatorial representative, Luke replied. But the Senate would still have to vote on your nomination. And there would have to be security and background checks and so on, Cal continued to think out loud. Tribok snarled a reference to the late Vicky Shesh. Aye, 
Luke began. And then he felt a touch on his mind, and again he thought, Jason. Jason's presence sang in his head. I think we've got another brainstorm here, Mara said. Her voice seemed to be coming from a distant place, somewhere outside the universe. I thought I had sent you to your death, Luke said. Dimly he was aware of the shock and sudden concern of the others in the room as they reacted to the words he'd spoken out loud. But not to them. It was Jason, all right. Luke recognized the ingenuousness, the dry earnestness. But Jason wasn't all that Luke sensed. Hovering remotely in the force, Luke perceived another presence, one who seemed entirely unfamiliar. Is someone else there? Luke asked. Verger. It wasn't a name that floated to him, but a thought, an image, a presence. Luke took a breath at this direct, surprising confirmation. He had never met the alien personally, but he'd been briefed about her, and had also heard from Han about the defection she'd once staged from the Yuzhan Vaughn, along with her redefection in the opposite direction. He had every reason to be suspicious of Verger. But on the other hand, Verger, through her tears, had healed Mara of the disease that had threatened her life. It was Verger who was responsible for Mara returning from the serious, focused, almost grim person she had become to the laughing, spontaneous woman she had once been, and now was again. What Luke hadn't known was that Verger was strong in the Force. He could feel her power, restrained at the moment, but perfectly genuine. And it was strangely cloaked. Even though they were in telepathic contact, Luke could detect nothing of Verger's personality or purpose. That bespoke training. Verger was no mere force-sensitive with a talent for telepathy. She had been carefully educated. But where had she received such training? Not at his Jedi Academy. And that left a number of dark alternatives. Palpatine, Vader, the Shadow Academy. But why would a dark Jedi bring Jason to Luke? More impressions came from Jason. A Yuzhan von craft, with its organic scent and resinous walls. Alarm! New Republic ships moving in swarms. Luke broke contact and turned to his three friends, all of whom were gazing at him with deep concern. The short version, he prefaced. Jason Solo just contacted me through the Force. He's in the Moon Cal system in a Yuzhan Vong escape pod, and we've got to stop the military from blowing him up. Cal's response was immediate. He turned to his protocol droid and said, Call Fleet Command. Priority urgent and immediate. Place another urgent and immediate call to Supreme Commander Sin Sov. Yes, Counselor, the droid said. Cal turned back to Luke. Don't worry, he said. We'll get him back. But Luke was already reaching into the Force, his mind stretching out into the great void beyond. Alongside him he felt the spirit of his wife, her strength supporting his, striving through the darkness of space for his lost apprentice. Chapter 10 Nomanor forgot his itch as he filed into the Hall of Confluence behind his superior, High Prefect Yug Skell. The hall was magnificent, broad at the four palpating doors by which high-ranking members of the four ruling castes entered, then narrowing as it approached the far end. The room was a trompe l'oeil, designed so that all eyes were drawn toward an artificial vanishing point, at which point was the seat of the Supreme Overlord. The walls were chitin-marbled black and white. Pillars of white bone supported the roof, and coral spread pale lace over the arches of the ceiling. Though the planes of the room were flat, the Dovan basils that provided the room's artificial gravity were tweaked slightly so as to provide the sense of walking uphill as one approached the Supreme Overlord. It felt as if he sat at a summit, and all others toiled upward toward him. At the focus of all eyes was the largest Yuzhan Vong that no Manor had ever seen a giant even among the most massive warriors. Shimra sat in silence on a blood-red throne of Yorick coral, 
that thrust spines and spikes from its central mass, as if warding an enemy from the overlord's presence. His ceremonial robes were somber, black and gray. The gray was leather, the carefully preserved flesh of Steng, who in the distant past had lost the Kremlevian war to Yogand, the first supreme overlord of the Yuzhan Vaughn. Shimra's massive head was so covered with scars, slashes, tattoos, and the marks of branding that he could barely be said to have a face at all, just a torn collection of barely healed wounds. But fierce, discerning intelligence could be seen behind the glowing macaquet implants in his eye sockets, which shifted through the spectrum as he watched the dignitaries enter. Crouched at the feet of Shimra was a lanky figure, dressed in rags, that hung in shreds on his flabby skin. His lip curled back over his teeth to show one yellow fang. His skull was misshapen, with one lobe swollen. Shimra's familiar, Onimi. The dignitaries plodded uphill toward Shimra and took their places, each of the four castes equidistant from the throne. Shimra loomed over them, and for once this was not a trick of the gravity. The Supreme Overlord was enormous. All prostrated themselves, and then in mighty voice chanted their salutation. Aitana Shimra Kot Yuno. Long life to Shimra, beloved of the gods. A deep rumble came from the throne. No Manor could barely see Shimra's lips move as he spoke. Let the great council be seated. The leading members rose to their feet and took their seats, which had been adjusted so as to compensate for the room's peculiar gravity. Nomanor rose and then remained on his feet. He did not rate a chair in the Supreme Overlord's presence. Standing across the room, Nomanor saw the priest, Harar, with whom he had shared several serious misjudgments. Harar gave no sign of knowing him. Good, Nomanor thought. Let all that be forgotten. He shifted on his feet, propping himself against the gravity that made him lean to his right. The movement triggered the itching again, and Nomanor clenched his teeth against the blaze of sensation. The itching had spread across his belly and under one armpit, and it felt as if half his skin were aflame. His fingers twitched with the urge to scratch, and he forced them straight. The shamed one... Onimi rose to his feet. Great lords all, he began, whose plans profound have put our feet on solid ground. I hope you will not think it crime if for this day I speak in rhyme. Onimi paused for an answer, mismatched eyes scanning the crowd, as if anyone would object. Shimra's status as supreme overlord was unquestioned and the reflection of his power was that he had actually adopted a shamed one as his familiar, a grotesque, twisted being who had been rejected by the gods. Shimra permitted his familiar extraordinary liberties, and to all appearances enjoyed the creature's grotesque capers as well as the discomfort they caused among onlookers. After the pause... Onimi raised his arms and performed a lurching pirouette, spinning to display the rags he wore. Permit me to recite an ode, to raiment new this latest mode, for like my lord I glory in my garments made of foeman's skin. Surprise flashed through Numanor as he realized that Onimi's rags were the remnants of New Republic uniforms taken from those who had fallen at Coruscant. There were intakes of breath around the chamber as others realized this as well. Onimi capered on, shambling near High Priest Jakan, who hissed and drew back so that none of the whirling rags could contaminate him. Shamed ones had been rejected by the gods themselves, damned to all the contempt and hatred they surely deserved. Enough. The single word came from Shimra, and was sufficient for Onimi to fall silent, a glimmer of fear in his eyes. "'Back to your place, creature,' Shimra growled. "'Our meeting will be long enough without having to endure your capers.' The overlord's familiar cringed in apology, then dragged himself back to the throne and dropped like a sack of bones at his master's feet. Shimra's head turned left and right, viewing all the delegates in turn. 
Then he turned his massive body toward Savong La. I should like to discuss the prosecution of the war. What do you have to say, war master? Savong La's hand formed a fist, which he brought down with a crash on the arm of his chair. I have but one word to say, and that is victory. His delegation growled in agreement. The enemy capital is ours, the war master continued, and you have taken formal possession of it. We followed the capture of Yuzhan Tar with our victory at Borleas. Supreme Commander Nas Choka's fleet does well in hut space. With the exception of the unfortunate Kamkarsh, our forces have been victorious everywhere. Onimi, at the overlord's feet, gave a little giggle that echoed strangely in the room's cavernous spaces. The warmaster bared his teeth. Shimra gave a rumble of warning to Onimi at his impudence, and then his gaze settled on Sabong La. Onimi may spawn wretched doggerel, he said, but he has a point. Your attempt to capture Jaina Solo at Hapes was a complete failure. Having no choice but to acknowledge his defeat, Savong La bowed his head. I confess it. And the casualties we took for the capture of Yuzhantar were enormous. The first two waves were wiped out, and the third wave, though victorious, was decimated. After that, Borleos was a very expensive victory, more, in my judgment, than the planet was worth. Your own father died. Plus, Kamkarsha's defeat was expensive in both lives and materiel. I am not as lenient as my predecessor. A fanatic gleam entered Savong La's eyes. We would give these lives again and more, he said. Life is less than nothing. What is a warrior's life compared to the glory of the Yuzhan Vong? Shimra's answer was sharp. I do not dispute your warrior's glory or their willingness to die. That is not what is at issue. I beg the Supreme Overlord's pardon, Savong La said. I did not understand. Do not assume that I am a fool. Shimra barked. He pointed at Savong La. You have won your victories by sending your troops over a rampart of our own dead. How do you intend to replace these casualties? Numanur gloated at the sight of Shimra, taking the war master to task for his failings. He and Savong La had butted heads often enough, and it did his heart good to see the warrior taken down a few steps in front of his rivals. My lord, I... The war master was at a loss. I have fulfilled all our primary objectives. I have given you the capital. We may grow more warships. But warriors must be bred, Shimra said. It will take a generation or more before our formations stand again at full strength, and we now have many worlds to defend. I will give you more victories, Savong La cried. The infidels are routed. If I follow up our victories, they will break. The war master was interrupted by yet another giggle from Onimi. The war master is not listening. He needs a new pair of ears, or perhaps instead the organ that lies between them. A hiss of fury escaped his throat as Savong La glowered at Onimi. Silence. Again the word came from Shimra. Though the overlord's tone was soft, the room's admirable acoustics made the words sing in the air. A hush followed, though Savong La seemed visibly to be choking on his words as he again bowed before his superior. The supreme overlord spoke on. You ask to follow the enemy. I have read our strength reports. We do not have sufficient forces both to maintain the offensive and to hold what we have already taken. My lord, Savong La kept his head bowed. With all respect, we pursue a broken foe. We may expect nothing but a glorious slaughter that adds great glory to your name. Shimra's voice was icy. The enemy that wiped out Kam Karsh was hardly broken. And may I remind the war master that Kam Karsh's fleet was our sole strategic reserve. From this point, moving any warrior to strengthen one force will weaken another. 
Savong La had no answer. His eyes stayed fixed on the ground. Our forces will break off offensive operations for the present, Shimra said. We may resume the offensive once we conclude a reorganization that brings more warriors into the field. As the Supreme One wishes. Savong La's voice was a barely audible hiss. I wish it. Shimmer's glowing gaze rose from the War Master and swept over the room. Many of our warriors are tied down in garrison and pacification duties far from the front. I wish to liberate them for combat against the infidels. His eyes sought out the delegation of shapers, who had until this point remained silent. I require you to create more warriors, he said. Chigong Hul, master of Domain Hul, a Shaper clan, responded quickly. The Supreme Overlord refers to surge coral implants? Yes. Captives will be given implants enabling them to receive the commands of a Yamask. They will then be placed under the command of warriors. Shimmer turned again to Savong La. Thus will you have larger forces to bring against the infidels. I am grateful, God Chosen. Numanor couldn't help but observe that gratitude did not seem foremost in the War Master's mind. If the warriors are not wasted, Shimra said pointedly, these measures should serve to correct the problem for the short term. In order to make up our losses in the long term, I command the following. All warriors will now be ordered to breed at the age of sixteen, if they have not already. If no mate chooses a given warrior, his or her commander will award a suitable mate from the warriors available. Afterward, awards and incentives will be devised to reward those who produce children. Savong La bowed again. It shall be as your wish, Supreme One. Nothing shall be as I wish if we continue to lose battles, Shimmer reminded. The enemy have developed new tactics that enable them to gain victories. I command a full report. Savong La at last raised his head. The infidels have discovered a way to use a machine to override the signal sent to our units by the Yamasks. Our units are thus forced to operate on their own without strategic guidance. And the remedy? Shimra's question was prompt. The War Master hesitated. We have not developed one as yet, Supreme One. We are... We have discussed the problem. He hesitated again. The fact is, Supreme One, that this development is unprecedented in our history, and you are baffled, Shimra said. Again the War Master bowed. Numanor felt a surge of gloating pleasure. I confess it, Savong La said. My life in payment. Shimmer turned again to the shapers. Has the shaper cast any suggestions? This time Chigong Hul's answer was not as swift as before. We could attempt to create Yamasks that could function despite these evil machines' influence. But it would be more useful if we had a better understanding of the technical dimensions of the problem. Have any of these... He hesitated even to speak the foul word. These machines been captured? No, Savong La said. We do not capture machines. We destroy them. And they have another type of new machine, do they not? The Supreme Overlord asked. One that causes our vessels to fire on one another? It is the cause of much misfortune, Savong La said. The infidels have developed machines that adhere to our ships, like grutchens to a foe, and broadcast a signal identifying them as an enemy. Our own loyal ships, perceiving an enemy, then open fire. His expression grew wooden. The enemy insults us by placing on these machines the device of Yun Harla, the trickster. They insult not us, but the gods shouted the high priest, Jakan. Blasphemers! Infidels! Let us capture those responsible, and their agony shall be undying. The Supreme Overlord gestured toward the priest. 
Not now, Lord Priest. Chakan fell silent. Shimmer leaned toward Savong La. These deceptive devices are able to penetrate our ship's defenses? No more than any other missile. But the infidels have also used treachery and surprise. They have captured one of our frigates. This vessel maintains a pretense of being friendly until such time as it launches missiles against us that turn our vessels against each other. The captured frigate then escapes in the confusion. Shermer was silent for a long moment. Then he said, You have been fooled how many times by this trickery? Once, Supreme One, at Hapes, the first time the tactic was used. And Kamkarsh was tricked fatally at Obroa Sky, but he was encountering the tactic for the first time. The solution seems elementary. You will develop recognition signals for friendly frigates. If any frigate fails to make the correct signal, all elements in the fleet should be instructed to regard it as an enemy. I have already begun to implement this reform, the War Master said. Let it be your greatest priority, Shimra said. We must restore the superiority of our forces. It shall be done, Supreme One. Shimra turned to Yug Skell. Let the High Prefect inform us of the disposition, strength, and intentions of the infidels. Yug Skell bowed to the Supreme Overlord and presented a digest of the latest information procured from sources within the New Republic. Unfortunately, the digest was not as complete as once it would have been. Several of the most useful Yuzhan Vong agents among the enemy had been killed or neutralized. The late Senator Vicky Shash was particularly missed. The enemy government, Yuke Skell reported, had moved to Mon Calamari in the Outer Rim, though it was not clear whether it would remain there. The government had not as yet chosen a new head, though a human named Fior Rodan was a possible candidate. There was also a Koran named Puo, who had declared himself chief of state shortly after Coruscant, but it appeared that fewer and fewer of the New Republic were willing to follow his orders. The New Republic military appeared to be in a state of disarray since the fall of their capital. They had undertaken no coordinated operations since Borlias, and showed no sign of doing so. Delegates from several worlds had come to the Yuzhan Vong offering surrender or neutrality. It was difficult in the current conditions to determine whether or not their credentials were genuine, so it wasn't often clear whether they had been sent officially or not. Leaders of the Peace Brigade, infidels who were collaborating with the Yuzhan Vong, had established their capital on Elysia. They had the beginnings of their own fleet, though their equipment was drawn from a variety of sources and was hardly uniform. Yuzhan Vong cadres were doing their best to train them. While Yug Skell made his report, Numanor tried his best to remain rigidly calm. The itch had turned his skin to fire. Desperately he willed himself to be still. He noticed, as he stood in silence behind his chief, that Yug Skell's hand was surreptitiously scratching his leg under cover of his desk. So Yug Skell had the itch as well, and the stress of his report had made him surrender to the weakness of scratching. Numanor wished he dared surrender to such a weakness. After Yug Skell's report, there was a moment of silence before Shimmer responded. This Fiorodan, he said, this Calumus, is it known whether they will favor submission or war? Supreme One, I will defer in this matter to my junior colleague Numanor. Yuk Skull said. He is a specialist on the subject of the infidels, having lived among them for many years. Shimmer's baleful rainbow gaze lifted to Nomanor, and again Nomanor felt the chill of fear. He could feel Shimmer's presence, the god's given power he possessed, and it sat on Nomanor's heart like a great weight. At least he forgot all about his itch. Supreme One, he began and was thankful he hadn't stammered. According to the analysis provided by our guest Vicky Shesh, Fior Rodan was a supporter of borsk Felia, though he occasionally showed signs of independence. His only consistent position was on the matter of the Jedi, whom he always opposed. As far as we know, he hasn't expressed an opinion on the matter of peace or war. 
Neither has Cal Omas, who has, however, consistently supported the Jedi. Numanor wished, as the word left his lips, that he hadn't mentioned the Jedi, which might remind the Supreme One of too many mistakes that Numanor had committed in the field. But Shimra, to the intendant's relief, pursued a different tack. This failure punished Rodan and Omus for their independence. Not as far as I know, Supreme One. Thalia was a weak creature, Shimmer mused. He scarcely deserved the honorable death we gave him. Supreme One, Nomanor said. The citizens of the New Republic lack a proper understanding of hierarchies and the duties due to one's superior. They believe that a certain amount of independence of mind is permissible. Borsk Thalia's attitude was not unusual among their leaders. Shimra absorbed this, then nodded. One of our great missions, then, shall be to teach these creatures the proper meaning of submission. Numanor bowed. Undoubtedly, Supreme One. I wish this Calumus killed. Have your agents carry out an assassination. Numanor hesitated. Few of my agents are in place on Moon Calamari, he said. We— Shimmer's eyes glittered dangerously. Numanor crossed his arms obediently. It shall be as you desire, Supreme One. The Supreme Overlord's next question was so soft-spoken that it caught Numanor by surprise. We shall teach the New Republic the glory of the gods. And what shall we teach the Jedi? More importantly, what have they taught us? At the mention of the Jedi, fear paralyzed Nomanor's tongue, but after a brief internal struggle he managed to wrench a satisfactory answer from his half-numbed mind. We shall teach them how to increase the glory of the Yuzhan Vong through their extermination, and what they have taught us is that their treachery is boundless and must be answered with death and blood. He heard a growl of agreement from the warriors, and also from members of the intendant delegation. Shimra, however, was silent. Nomanor felt the overlord's eyes on him, and felt again the presence of Shimra's mind pressing on his own. It was as if his very thoughts had become transparent, completely exposed to the overlord's inquiring mind. Again fear shimmered up Nomanor's spine. And whose fault? Shimmer asked in a voice all the more ominous for its quiet tone. Was the fiasco in the well of the world brain? Nomanor fought his way to the surface through a current of blind panic. My lord, he said, though I am not blameless, I beg you to remember that I operated under the authority of War Master Savong La. The War Master stood tall, not deigning to respond. Nomanor battled terror as he realized the others were perfectly willing to sacrifice him. "'We all underestimated the treachery of the Jedi Supreme One,' he said. "'We were misled by the creature Verger. I know more or less than others.' Shimra fixed Nomanor again with his baleful look. "'Thousands witnessed this disaster,' he said. "'One of the Jedi, they were told, had been converted through the embrace of pain to the true path.' and would willingly sacrifice one of his peers in the well and offer his death to the gods. And instead, what do they see? The great doors slammed in their faces as our tame Jedi escaped, while the supposed sacrificial victim held off an army with a special Jedi weapon that was supposed to have been taken from him. The world brain was endangered, Chigong Hul cried. The Jedi could have destroyed our last Duryam, just as he destroyed all the others. This catastrophe has led to heresy, spoke the priest, Chakan. Thousands were led to doubt the wisdom of their superiors and the reality of the gods. Shimmer's eyes once again settled on Numanor. Heresy. Doubt. Danger to the Duryam on which all our plans for our new homeworld depend. Proof of the heroism of the Jedi fighting in our own capital before the eyes of thousands. And, Executor, 
He will have us believe that this was entirely the workings of one little avian, this Vergere. Nomanor's vision began to darken. He felt as if his soul were being squeezed by a ruthless velvet hand. He gasped in air and tried to speak in his defense. Supreme One, he managed, none of us trusted her completely. All her meetings with the captive Jedi were monitored. Nothing seditious passed between them. Her explanations for her behavior were plausible. She proved her loyalty more than once. She led Jason Solo into captivity on three separate occasions. When the Jedi was tortured, his physical responses were monitored, and truly indicated that he was learning the embrace of pain. He was accepting the pain as if he were Yuzhan Vong. When he announced his willingness to proclaim the true doctrine and sacrifice the other Jedi whom he himself had captured, no one doubted him. And the importance of the twin sacrifice? Shimra inquired. The idea that this Jason Solo should not be killed immediately, but held until he could be sacrificed along with his sister, whose notion was that? Verger's, Numanor said. He felt the presence of the Supreme Overlord begin to squeeze his mind again, blotting out his thoughts. He could see only Shimmer's ruthless, glowing eyes. It is like the embrace of pain, he thought, mental torture at the hands of a Yamask. Through the horrible pressure he held to one word. Verger, he cried. Verger, it was all Verger. Supreme One, another voice said. Through the blur of oppression and terror, Nomanor recognized the priest Harar. Another betrayer, he thought, another one come to crush me with some burden of blame. I was present, Supreme One, Harar said. The idea of the twin sacrifice was partly my own, partly Kali La's, partly Verger's. I confess that I was duped. The truth is that Verger fooled us because none of her actions seemed capable of a treacherous interpretation. Why did she lead Jason Solo into captivity not once, but thrice? She had numerous opportunities to help him escape, but did not do so. Why did she participate in his torture? Why did she manipulate him, or seem to manipulate him, on our behalf? I have concluded— Harar finished, that if Verger is not loyal to us, neither is she loyal to the infidels. Numanor sobbed for breath as the mental pressure was released. Through his dimmed eye, he could make out Harar standing in the delegation of High Priest Jakan. The High Priest did not seem pleased to hear his subordinate's confession. Thus far the College of Priests had escaped any blame for the catastrophe, and now— Harar was likely to bring unwelcome attention to his caste. Numanor's blood sang with gratitude for Harar. The priest had saved him. The war master, on the other hand, looked at Numanor as if he were on the verge of throttling him. While Numanor struggled to recover his presence of mind, Shimra interrogated Harar and the war master. In the end, the Supreme Overlord leaned back on his throne, disappearing into its spiky interior. Interesting, he said. For fifty years, this Roger has lived among us, and none of us knew her true nature. For fifty years, she studied us, and learned our ways, and was able to plan her treachery. He leaned forward and turned to Jakan. Priest, he said. Is this creature not the true incarnation of Yun Harla, the trickster? Outrage quivered in the priest's jowls, but when he spoke his voice was firm. Never, he said. Say rather that Verger is the embodiment of evil. Is she a Jedi? someone queried. She can't be, Harar said. The Jedi derive their abilities from something called the Force, and their use of it can be detected by a Yamask. If Verger were Jedi, she would have been unmasked. Shimmer's deep voice was reflective. Jedi or not, I wonder about her. Isn't such a deception, over such a long period, a kind of masterpiece? 
He looked down at his creature on Nimi. Is she not worthy of admiration, to deceive so many for so long? He asked, and gave Onimi a kick. Onimi, startled, looked up and began to warble. Out of the world well, and into thin air, that devious trickster, the traitor Verger. And then, with a fawning glance at his master, Onimi added, slyly, But some little pets are more suitably loyal. I'll still be your friend and share your throne royal. Shimmer burst into laughter at this and shoved Onimi with his foot, pushing him another step lower. You may share my throne from there, Onimi, he said. Onimi shaded his eyes with a hand and peered out at the assembled delegations. I still have a better view of things than any of these, Supreme One, he noted, thankfully forgetting to speak in rhyme. That wouldn't be hard, Shimmer said almost as an aside. Uneasy laughter rolled around the great chamber. Numanor, still dizzied from his interrogation, sensed the anxiety and fear that lay beneath the laughter. Would the Supreme Overlord choose another one to humiliate? Shimra faced his audience. The lesson of all this is simple, he said. Let all follow my example, and permit no pet to inhabit a position of trust. The delegates chorused agreement. Nomanor couldn't help but think, however, that Onimi was trusted at least to the extent of being permitted to attend meetings where important matters were discussed. If Onimi were a spy, he could give his secret masters much useful information. But if Onimi were a spy, surely Shimra, through his powerful presence that saw into souls, would discover the fact. But Verger, too, should have been discovered, should she not. High priest, Shimra said, turning his head toward Jakan. My apologies for delaying this vital discussion until now. I wished us all to give it our full attention. Please bring to everyone's attention this matter of heresy. The better to make his presentation, Jakan rose to his feet, his formal robes brushing the floor. His daughter, the priestess Elon, had adopted the treacherous Verger as a pet, and then died on a mission to assassinate the Jedi. The loss of his daughter had hardened Jakan in his religious orthodoxy, and hardened him in his determination to implement the will of the gods. I, too, bring word of infiltration, he said. He gave a ponderous pause, his head turning left to right to view each delegation in turn. As the priest's eyes crossed with his, Nomanor felt a thrill of fear. Was the high priest about to accuse someone here? Not by dangerous spies, Jakan went on at last, but by dangerous ideas. Priests from as far away as Dubrillion have reported that they have discovered unauthorized, clandestine meetings among the lower orders, meetings that claim to be religious ceremonies. Meetings in private quarters or empty countryside. Meetings where our own true way is denied, and where treasonous, heretical concepts are spread to the people. Again the priest paused solemnly, as if to emphasize the gravity of his words. Shimra spoke into the silence. Heresy is nothing new. Why is this of such great import? What sort of people take part in these ceremonies? Shamed ones, Jakan said in a fierce whisper, as if the words themselves were obscene. Shamed ones and workers, precisely those castes needing the greatest guidance in matters of belief. Sometimes, again his voice dropped into a dramatic whisper, workers and shamed ones are found at the heretical ceremonies Together. Nomanor's single eye was drawn irresistibly to the shamed one, Onimi, condemned by the gods through the failure of his implants. For once Onimi seemed inclined to remain silent, though his lanky body half reclined in a pose of insolence. His upper lip was again curled to reveal one long, yellow tooth. And the nature of these heretical ceremonies... Shimmer prodded. They venerate the Jedi. 
Chakan said, and this time there was a murmur of outrage and surprise from the crowd. The power of the Jedi has brought into question that the gods favor the Yuzhan Vong. They believe that Yun Harla and Yun Yamka are aligned with the twins Jaina and Jason Solo, and some of the heretics here on Yuzhantar have in the last weeks begun to revere a being they call the Ganner. Ganner, of course, was the name of the Jedi who gave his life at the Battle of the World Well. Shimmer fingered his chin. Where do the lower orders acquire these heresies? The contamination was probably begun by slaves from the New Republic who labor alongside the workers and shamed ones, Jakan explained. Slaves who admired the Jedi and their philosophy. Chakan clenched his fist and shook it. At the moment, the heretics are not organized. They have no real leaders, and their doctrine is a jumble of contradictory ideas. Stop them now! Root them out, before they grow into a force that weakens us from within! Again the priest offered a dramatic moment of silence, and then he turned and bowed toward Shimra. Such is my report, Supreme One. Noanor heard a sigh from his own superior, Yug Skell, but he was unable to work out what the sigh meant. The itching was a tormenting blast that seared Nomanor's flesh. Have you any specific recommendations concerning this crisis? The Supreme Overlord inquired. Kill the heretics is final, but lacks detail. Chakan bowed again. Supreme One, my recommendations would demand absolute segregation of the slaves from our own people, so as to prevent the spread of inappropriate ideas. Public sacrifice of the heretics, rewards for those who renounce their false paths, and turn in their fellows. Yugskel sighed again, more loudly this time, more wearily. Supreme One, he said. Well, I am certainly no friend to heresy. I must beg for less drastic methods. We are engaged in a war that may continue for clackets, or even longer. The combined labors of workers and shamed ones and slaves are necessary to advance our objectives. We have settlements to grow, food crops to raise and half-wrecked ecosystems, ships and weapons and other vital items to ripen and harvest, and Yuzhantar itself to transform from a machine-poisoned artificial landscape into our perfect ancestral paradise. Jakan bowed toward Duke Skell. Our paradise can scarcely be perfect if it contains heresy. I concede the high priest's point, Yugskel said, but an inquiry into all our workers would be disruptive. Segregation of the workers from the slaves is impossible at this stage. They are all engaged in vital work. Going amid them with bribes aimed at getting them to turn on one another. Imagine the disruption— Imagine the situation of the workers start accusing overseers in the hope of seeing them brought down. Imagine how many false accusations we should have to weed out from the true. That would be the task of the priests, Chakan said. Your own people need not concern themselves. But if the workers should accuse warriors, or shapers, or even loyal priests— Numanor realized that Yugskel was pointing out to the shapers and warriors that Jakan's plan put them at risk, as well as the workers, whom no one cared about. Yugskel spoke on. Besides, who cares what the shamed ones think? The gods hate them anyway. And whose fault is it that the workers lapse into heresy? Haven't the priests already failed in their duty? Jakan bloated with injured dignity was about to make a furious rebuttal when Shimra held up a hand for silence. All eyes respectfully turned to him, all except that of Nomanor, who was blind to everything but a sudden blaze of his own itching torment. The itch was spreading. Now his back was on fire, where he couldn't scratch even if he wanted to. The gods have placed me upon this throne as their instrument, 
Shimra said, and I agree with the high priest that heresy may not be tolerated. A satisfied look inflated Jakan's face, a satisfaction that died away at the overlord's next words. But the high prefect has a worthy point. When we are at war, it is foolish to disorder one's own forces. I don't want disruption among the workers at such a time, particularly since the workers are uneducated and may have adopted these beliefs without knowing their dangerous nature. Therefore, he turned to the high priest. Priest Jack Khan, I direct that the priests inform the people of the danger of this heresy. Tell them from me, from their supreme overlord, that the Jedi are not emanations of the gods. Tell them that such beliefs are unsound and forbidden. Those workers who are properly obedient to their superiors will then know to avoid any such contamination in the future. And, the priest bowed, if they persist in their error, you may kill any heretics you come across as publicly as you like. Shimra said, but I wish no large-scale investigation of the masses of workers, no rewards for accusations. When we win the war, he nodded at Jakan, then we may have a more thorough inquiry. But for the present, I want the Yuzhan Vong focused on defeating our enemies, not interrogating each other. Jakan's face had fallen but he bowed and acceded with grace. It shall be as you wish, Supreme One. You may return to your seat, High Priest Jakan. With great dignity, the priest returned to his desk. Behind him, Onimi sneered and scratched himself again. Fury raged in Numanor as he watched the misshapen figure scratch. How he would love to have those fingers beneath his boot— an agreeable expression crossed Shimmer's face. The shamed one reminds me, he said, that I should ask the shapers how their work progresses. How goes the world shaping of Yuzhantar? Supreme One, Chagong Hul said. It goes well. This news is pleasing, Shimmer said. May we inquire of the master whether there have been any problems? A look of caution crossed the Master Shaper's face. He spoke quickly. Some difficulties are inevitable, Supreme One. We are dealing with an alien environment that we have largely destroyed, and some of the native life forms, microscopic ones mostly, are proving persistent. Perhaps, he admitted, some of you have experienced some minor discomforts as the result of a fungal infection. We are attempting to, uh, and the nature of this minor discomfort? The Supreme Overlord asked sweetly. Chagong Hul hesitated. Uh, itching, Supreme One. Persistent itching. Numanor's nerves flamed at the very mention of the word itch. Anger began to simmer in his blood. Chagong Hul gave what was probably intended to be a confident growl. A mere itch, Supreme One. Nothing that any member of the higher castes cannot overcome with the discipline demonstrated in the course of earning rank and honor. And you are, of course, a disciplined member of the highest caste, Shimra said. Chigong Hul rose to his feet, lordly in his ceremonial robes. I have earned that distinction, Supreme One. Shimra jumped to his feet, both fists smashing the arms of his throne, and roared at the top of his lungs, "'Then why have I watched your surreptitious scratching through this whole meeting?' Chagong Hul froze. In the sudden ominous silence, Onimi jumped to his feet, rags of uniform swirling around him, and scratched himself with abandon. Then he sat down with a broad grin on his face. The Supreme Overlord pointed one long clawed implanted finger at the Master Shaper. The world shaping of our new homeworld is being botched. Do you think I don't know that this plague has spread among our entire population here? Even I was infected within hours of landing on Yuzhantar. Anger erupted in Numanor's mind. This wasn't just about his own personal torture by this demonic itch. 
What was this whole war about, if not to recreate the perfection of the long-lost homeworld? What a catastrophe it would be if the world-shaping failed. Supreme One, Chagong Hul said, this complete reconstruction of an entire ecosystem is a complex matter, and though perfect success is within reach, it may take longer than our earlier estimates. Shimmer gave a scornful laugh. It's not simply the fungus, though, is it, Master Shaper? Do you think I haven't heard of the Grashals intended for worker barracks that melted down into a mass of undifferentiated protein? Or the crop of villips that grew imprinted on some local animal and could only transmit the beast's screech of a mating call? The blorass jelly that attempted to devour the shapers who tended it? Supreme one, I— Chagong Hul attempted again to protest, then sagged in defeat. I confess the fault, he said. Death! someone roared in Nomanor's ear. The Supreme Overlord himself growled his rage. The world shaping shall be placed in more competent hands than yours, he said, and then he turned to the group of warriors behind Savong La. Commander, subalterns, take this impostor of a master shaper and carry him from this chamber. Execute him as soon as you get him out of our sight. Make him pay for his incompetence. Chapter 11 Diff Scour, the head of New Republic Intelligence, was alone in his office when his secure comm chimed. This was a comm unit that was used for one purpose only, and he tried to control the sudden lurch of his heart as he reached for the comm with one long, pale hand. The display brightened, and he saw the collar, the collar with flame-colored eyes. Yes, Scour said. Anticipation hummed in his nerves. The experiment was a success. Scour took a breath. Very well, he said. I believe I can now guarantee the success of the project. Scour gave a single deliberate nod. Then I will make the necessary arrangements. We will need a larger facility, and we will also need the silence of certain individuals. That has already been arranged. Scour hesitated. We should meet in person. Very well. The caller seemed satisfied. I will await your arrival. Transmission ceased. Scour reached out a hand to turn off the comm unit, and when he drew it back in he realized it was trembling. Now everything has changed, he thought. Now I am the Slayer. The shipyards of Mon Calamari glittered in the light of its sun, structures as graceful and strong as the ships they produced. Luke could see three cruisers partially completed, each in the MC-80 class, each different in appearance from the others. Half a dozen smaller craft were also in various stages of completion. One always wished the Mon Cals would develop a sense of urgency, at least in wartime but their desire to customize and perfect each vessel never abated, and each was lovingly crafted and beautified and refined until it became both a work of art and the deadliest force in the New Republic arsenal. Beneath a transparent dome, Luke and Mara stood on a graceful mezzanine thrust out over the main concourse of the Fleet Command Annex. Both gazed upward at the glittering silver shipyards afloat over the brilliant blue of the planet, both set off by the depthless velvet night of space and its spray of stars. The scene, the emptiness and beauty and the blue jewel of life set within it, settled around Luke like a cloak, a vision of peace and perfection. "'It's the turning point,' he said. Mara gave him a quizzical look. "'Do you know what made you say that yesterday?' she asked. After that strange moment— when he'd been touched by something that reminded him of Jason, he'd gone into deep meditation and a forced trance in the hope of regaining the fleeting contact, but he'd been unable to find the answers to any of his questions. Now that he'd made contact with Jason a second time, he had begun to suspect he knew what had spoken to him. It may have come from the force itself, he said. Distant stars reflected in her jade-colored eyes as Mara considered this. 
The Force can offer us a view of what is to come, she said. But usually it's a bit less spontaneous. I'm more sure than ever that Jason has a special destiny. He turned to Mara and squeezed her hand. Mara's eyes widened. Do you think Jason himself knows his destiny? I don't know. And I don't know if he would accept it if he did. He's always questioned his purpose as a Jedi, and even the meaning of the Force. I can't imagine him not questioning any fate that lay in store for him. His thoughts darkened, and he looked at Mara soberly. And a special destiny is not always something joyous or easy to bear. My father had a special destiny, and see where it took him. Mara's look turned grave. We must help him, she said. If he'll let us, he hasn't always been cooperative that way. Luke raised his head to gaze out the great dome, and to the dome of star-spangled blackness beyond, where Jason's coral craft, caught in the tractor beams of one of the fleet's MC-88 cruisers, was being carried to a nearby docking bay. Though the craft itself was too distant for Luke to see it, Luke thought he saw the Moon Cal cruiser, a distant wink of light swooping gracefully toward the annex. Hey, called a loud voice from the concourse below, it's Senator Sneakaway and Senator Scrambleface. This was followed by booming laughter, and then, yes, you, I'm talking to you. Wordlessly, Luke and Mara drifted to the mezzanine rail and looked down onto the concourse. Below, the tallest Findian Luke had ever seen, her long arms thrusting out of the sleeves of her Defense Force uniform, lunged toward a human and a Solaston, who had just emerged from a consular ship docked at the annex. Luke recognized both the newcomers as members of the Senate. The Findian stepped into the path of the two senators, then reeled. Luke realized that the Findian was drunk. She had probably just stormed out of the officers' club beneath the mezzanine. The Findian thrust out her tiny little chin. Do you know how many friends I lost at Coruscant? she asked. Do you? The two senators remained silent, their lips pressed closely together. They tried moving around the Findian, but her long, long arms blocked their way. Ten thousand? The Findian boomed, extending one finger from a delicate-looking fist. Twenty thousand? Thirty thousand comrades lost? Two more fingers thrust out. For forty? The Findian tried to hold out a fourth finger, but then seemed a little late to realize there were only three fingers on her hand. We all lost friends on Coruscant, the human senator said grimly and tried to push one of the Findian's enveloping arms out of his way. The Findian blocked him again. Her yellow eyes tried to focus on his face. Too bad you didn't think about your friends when you ran away, Senator Sneakaway, she said. Too bad that when you commandeered Alamania, you left your friends to die. Luke felt Mars' hand on his arm. Should we intervene? she asked in a low voice. Not unless it turns violent, Luke said, and I don't think it's going to. He glanced directly below the mezzanine rail at a group of officers who were quietly watching the confrontation from the officers' club. Look there. Mara turned her gaze to the group of officers. They're not intervening either. No, Luke said significantly, they're not. Please stand aside, Captain, the Sullustan senator said to the Findian. We have important business here on Moon Calamari. Important business, the Findian said. Is that anything like the important business that required you to order Green Squadron to escort you and your shuttle into hyperspace? Green Squadron, which was covering my pride of honor, my poor pride, which got hammered by the Yuzhan Vong and suffered 241 dead, my poor pride, which barely made it to Moon Calamari, and is going to have to be scrapped because it simply isn't worth the expense it would take to patch it back together? What business was so important that it was worth 241 lives, Senator Scramblefree? One spindly hand prodded the Sullustan in the chest. Eh? the Findian asked. Senator Flyaway? Senator Cowardheart? Senator Curdleguts? Eh? 
Take care, Captain, the human senator said. You're endangering your commission. You've already taken away my ship, the Findian said. You've already killed half my crew. You've already cost us the capital. She hooted with laughter. Do you think I care about my commission? Do you think there's anything you could do to me that's worse than what you've already done? Do you think I care about the solemn oath? I swore to protect craven little bootlickers like you. Do you think any of us care? The Findian waved one long arm in the direction of the officers on the threshold of the club. The two senators turned and saw the solemn group who watched this confrontation in silence. The senators stared. The officers stared back. And for the first time, the senators seemed nervous. The Findian still stood with her long arm extended, pointing to the officers' club, and the human ducked beneath it and walked briskly for the exit. When the drunken Findian swung around after the human, the Sullustan dodged around her and scuttled after his human colleague. But even if her arms were longer than her legs, the Findian was fast in pursuit. She caught the two and draped her arms around their shoulders, as if they were old friends. "'Tell you what,' the Findian said, "'there's nothing you can do to me, but there's something you can do for me. There's a fleet appropriations bill coming up in the new session.' It will be in your committee, Senator DeCamp, and you're going to vote for it. Because if you don't, we won't be able to go on protecting cowards and thieves and politicians from the Yuzhan Vong, will we? And besides, if you don't give us the money... The senators stopped dead in their tracks as the Findian caught their heads in her elbow joints, half strangling them. Her yellow eyes glittered. If you don't give us the money... The Findian said drunkenly, importantly. We'll take it. After all, we've got the guns, and we already know how brave you are around guns, don't we? She released her two captives, and the senators hastened for the exit. The Findian raised her tiny chin and called after them. One more thing, senators. Don't ever expect to run from the enemy on a fleet ship ever again. "'because if you ever try to commandeer one more fleet vessel, "'we're going to pack you into an escape pod "'and fire you straight at the Yuzhan Vong. "'And that's a solemn oath, and we've all sworn it.' "'The senators were gone. "'The Findian stared after them for a moment, "'her long arms dangling past her knees, "'then wheeled and returned to her friends. "'The group of officers burst into applause. There were cheers. They put their arms around the Findian and half carried her into the club for a celebration. Luke and Mara stood on the mezzanine in the sudden weighty silence and thought about what they had just seen. Natural high spirits, Mara suggested. You know that's not what it was. Mutiny? Not mutiny. Not yet. Luke looked at the blank doors through which the two senators had fled. But it's close. The military haven't had anything but defeats in this war, and they know it's not their fault. They know the leadership has been corrupt and stupid and cowardly and inept. They know that Coruscant might have fallen because of politicians like those two. He paused as he heard a muffled cheer from the officers below. I'd feel better, he said if one of those cheering weren't wearing the insignia of a fleet commander. Me too, said Mara. She gave a nervous glance over her shoulder. We'd better get a government the fleet can respect, and soon. If the military break free of the civilian government and start grabbing resources at Blaster Point, they're no more than pirates. Extremely well-armed pirates, Luke added. It's the turning point, he reminded himself and hoped it wasn't turning the wrong way. He glanced overhead again, out the great dome, and this time he could see Jason's coral craft with the naked eye, suspended by tractor beams below the great scalloped hull of the MC-80A cruiser. The alien origin of the pod was clear. The coral hull and its bulbous organic form were unlike anything else in the sky. 
The graceful moon-cow structures, with their fluid curves, imitated nature. But the Yuzhan Vong pod was nature, and extragalactic nature at that. Door slid open behind Luke, and a file of soldiers trotted onto the mezzanine, all armed and armored for combat, their faces masked to keep out alien poisons. They were followed by a combat droid that brandished half a dozen weapons on the ends of its brazen arms. The military was clearly taking no chances with the Yuzhan Vong pod docking in vital New Republic space. Not only was an armed escort meeting the vessel, but the vessel was being docked not to Fleet Command, but to its annex, which could be completely sealed off from the headquarters itself and, if necessary, jettisoned into space by firing explosive bolts. The young officer commanding the soldiers approached Luke and Mara and saluted. Master Skywalker, he said to both of them, Admiral Sov's compliments, and after Jason Solo and his companion are brought on board, we would be honored if you would all join him for refreshment. Poor Seen Sov, Luke thought. As Supreme Commander of the Defense Force, he'd been held responsible for the multiple catastrophes that had befallen the military. Last Luke had heard, Sov had been wandering Moon Calamari, trying to find someone to submit his resignation to. But without a chief of state, no one was in a position to take it. "'I would be delighted to see the admiral,' Luke answered, "'provided, of course, that my nephew doesn't require medical attention. "'Of course, sir. Understood.' Luke and Mara followed the soldiers to the docking port. The soldiers took positions left and right of the hatch, and the droid directly in front of it, multiple weaponry directed forward. Luke looked at Mara. She was focused inward, her eyes half-closed. "'I don't sense anything wrong,' Mara said. "'I don't either.' Without a word, Luke and Mara stepped between the battle droid and the docking bay hatch. Luke felt his nape hairs prickle at the thought of all that firepower directed at his back. "'Sir,' the officer began. Luke made a gentle gesture. "'We'll be fine, Lieutenant,' he said. "'You'll be fine.' Yes, sir. There was a gentle tremor as tractor beams brought the pod to the hatch and a hiss as the lock pressurized. Then lights blinked on the inner hatch and it swung open. Jason stood in the open hatch. He was dressed in a kind of colorless poncho, clearly of Yuzhan Vong origin, tied at the waist with what looked like a vine. He had lost weight and his ropey muscles flexed plainly under pale, sickly skin that didn't seem to hold an ounce of fat. Scars, healed but still vivid, striped his bare arms and legs. It was Jason's face, however, that showed the most change. Beneath an untreamed mane of hair and a short, equally scruffy beard was a sharp, chiseled face, any remains of baby fat burned away, with brown eyes that showed an adult, restless, penetrating intelligence. When Jason had left for Mirker, he had been on the cusp of adulthood. It was clear that whatever else he may have left there, his boyhood was gone. The relentless eyes turned toward Luke and Mara, and blossomed at once with warmth and recognition. Luke felt his heart surge with joy. He and Mara each took an involuntary step forward, and Jason sped from the hatch, and his arms swept out to embrace them both. Laughter burst from all three at the joyous reunion. Tears stung Luke's eyes. The turning point, he thought. Yes, from this point we turn from sorrow toward joy. My boy! The words spilled from Luke. My boy! It was Mara who broke the embrace. She took a half-step back, her hand gently placed on Jason's chest, as if to touch the heart of him. You've been injured. Yes. The word was simple, accepting. Whatever had happened to him, Jason seemed at peace with it. Are you all right? Mara continued. Do you need a healer? No, I'm fine. Verger healed me. It was then that Mara and Luke turned to Jason's companion. The piebald little alien had taken a few steps into the station and was looking at the ranks of armed soldiers with what seemed to be both skepticism and humor. 
I owe Verger thanks of my own, it seems, Mara said. Verger turned her wide, slanting eyes toward Mara. My tears served you? she asked. Yes, I'm cured, apparently. Many years ago, Nomanor poisoned you with a cum spore. Did you know that? Verger's words were precise, a little fussy. Yes, I know. She hesitated. But healing tears? How did you... How is it done? Verger's feathery whiskers rippled in what may have been a slight smile. It is a long story. Perhaps some day I will tell you. Luke faced Jason again and found the young man grinning at him. Luke grinned back. And then an idea struck him. We've got to tell your parents you're alive, he said, and your sister. Jason's grin faded slightly. Yes, I tried to contact them through the force. But yes, they should have official word as well. Sir, it was the lieutenant commanding the military detachment. Master Skywalker, I have to take possession of the escape pod. If you'll wait for a few minutes on the mezzanine, I'll escort you to the communications center, where you can send your message, and then on to Admiral Sov. Certainly, Luke said. An irresistible urge to grin struck him again, and he ruffled Jason's hair with his hand. With the young man between them, their arms around Jason's shoulders and waist, Luke and Mara walked past the battle droid to the mezzanine rail. Verger followed in silence. Below, travelers moved back and forth from docking ports, all too busy to look up and see the strange reunion taking place on the balcony above them. Welcome back, Luke said. Welcome back, young Jedi. I'm not the only one you should welcome back, Jason said, with a nod toward Verger. Luke turned to Verger. Welcome, of course, he said politely. But I don't know where you're from, so I can't be sure whether you're back or not. That is a paradox without an easy answer, Verger said. Jason laughed. That's true. Haven't you guessed? And when Luke and Mara turned to him, Jason laughed again. Verger is a Jedi, a Jedi of the Old Republic. She's been living among the Yuzhan Vong for more than fifty years. Luke stared at Verger in astonishment. And you're still alive? Mara blurted. Verger looked down at herself and patted herself as if demonstrating her own existence. Apparently so, young masters, she said. How, Mara began. How had she lived among the Yuzhan Vong without having her Jedi powers unmasked by a Yamask? Another long story, Verger said, perhaps for another time. You keep your secrets, Verger, Luke observed. I didn't survive by offering my secrets to anyone who might be interested. Verger said, My secrets shall remain mine alone, unless I see a reason to set them free. She didn't speak defiantly, but in a matter-of-fact tone, as if describing the color of the carpet. We don't want to pump you for information unnecessarily, Luke said, but I do hope we'll be able to talk sooner or later. Verger's feathers ruffled a bit, then smoothed. Perhaps it was her version of a shrug. We may speak certainly, but please recall what I told you earlier. I am not a partisan of your new republic. What does hold your allegiance? Luke asked. The Jedi Code, and what you would call the Old Republic. There is no Old Republic. Luke tried to speak gently, but there is. Her eyes lifted to his, and he felt a shimmer of Verger's power and conviction, like a vibration in his bones. As long as I draw breath, she said, the old Republic lives. There was a moment of silence, and then Luke spoke. Long may it live, Verger, he said. Verger bobbed her head. I thank you, young master. And then she fell silent, and turned to look out over the concourse, her eyes sweeping left and right, gazing at the busy people and droids moving swiftly about their business, the ships, the cargo moving back and forth. It was a world, Luke thought, 
that Verger had abandoned fifty years ago. She had lived among a people immeasurably strange, and Luke wondered how alien Verger's own native galaxy seemed to her now, with its many races, its bustle, and its humming, clicking, chattering machines. Sadness sifted through Luke's veins. He had welcomed Jason back to his home, but no such welcome was possible for Verger. Everything she had known was gone. The reunion did not end with the reappearance of Jason. When Luke and his party were brought into Admiral Sov's suite, Luke found that Sov wasn't alone. Sitting on the long, curved, cream-colored sofa behind their Sulliston host were two familiar figures, posed like a painterly study in white, a white-uniformed moon calamari and a white-haired human. Admiral Akbar, Winter. The joy of reunion with his old friends died, however, as he saw Akbar struggle to rise from the sofa, and he had to force the smile to remain on his face. Akbar leaned heavily on Winter's arm as he stood. The amphibian's shiny pink skin had turned grayish and dull. When he spoke, his words were lisped out of a slack mouth that gasped for air. Master Skywalker, friends, I regret to say that living out of water is a burden for me these days. Please don't stand, then, Luke said. He went to Akbar's side and, with Winter's help, eased the Admiral again onto the sofa. "'Have you been ill?' he asked the Admiral, but his eyes went to Winter. The white-haired woman looked at Luke and gave a brief nod, a quiet confirmation. "'Ill?' Akbar said. "'Not exactly. What I am is old.' He gave a sigh from his slack lips. Perhaps Ophelia was right when he refused to let me return to the service. More likely he remembered the times you'd humiliated him in council, Mara said. Winter approached Jason and wrapped him in a long, thorough, and powerful embrace. Welcome back, Jason, she said simply. Winter had looked after the Solo children through much of the early days of the New Republic, when Han and Leia had been driven by the war from one end of the galaxy to the other and over the years she had probably spent as much time with Jason as his mother had. "'Have you heard from Tycho?' Luke asked. While Winter's husband, Tycho Selchu, was away with the military, Winter had returned to Akbar's side as his aide and companion, serving him as loyally as she'd once served Leia. "'He's helping Wedge Antilles organize the defense of Kuat and the establishment of resistance cells.' And he's well. I'm glad to hear it. Akbar lifted his large head toward Mara. I understand that I should offer congratulations. Did you receive my gift? We did. Thank you. The toy hollow projector will do wonders for Ben's vision and coordination. The child is well. Ben's fine. A shadow crossed Mara's face. He's been sent to safety for as long as we're in danger, which may be a while. The Solos did the same thing with their children, Winter reminded them. She sent an affectionate look toward Jason. They turned out all right. Will you all please make yourselves comfortable, Sinsov said in his nasal voice. Shall I send for refreshment? Luke turned to Sov and felt mild embarrassment at having ignored the Supreme Commander of the New Republic Defense Force for so long. "'I beg your pardon, Admiral,' he said. "'I should—' The Sulliston made a dismissive gesture. "'Since I asked you here to meet old friends, I can hardly object if you let them take precedence over me.' His black plate eyes turned to Admiral Akbar. "'For that matter, I wish the Admiral would take— precedence over me during this war. He wasn't alone in that wish, Luke knew. It couldn't have been easy for Sin Sov to be the successor to a legend like Akbar, and Sov's modesty and hard work were hardly the sort of gifts to fill the void left by Akbar's genius and charisma. Sov might have done better if his term had been blessed by peace, since his administrative talents were genuine and he could have kept the service running at high efficiency. 
but he'd been unlucky in being forced to fight the wrong war against an enemy for whom the New Republic had been completely unprepared. Unlucky. It was the worst thing you could say about a military commander. Soldiers trusted a commander's luck much more than they trusted a commander's intelligence. I do not believe, Sov said gently, that I have met all your party. Luke apologized again and introduced Jason and Verger. Sov complimented them both on their survival skills. And young Solo, he added, I am pleased to report that your sister is not only well, but has taken part in a major victory at Obroa Sky. Apparently comfortable with his ragged, half-clothed appearance, Jason had perched on a chair near Verger. Honest relief broke across his face at the news. I was worried, he said. I sensed she was in a... a situation. An entire Yuzhan Vong fleet was attacked by our fleet combined with a squadron of Hapens. General Farlander was quite explicit in his praise of Jaina. It appears she was responsible for much of the operational plan. Jason listened to scenes solved with interest, then responded cautiously. Jaina planned this offensive? he asked. Not all the details, of course, but yes, the attack was her inspiration. Two Yuzhan Vong troop ships were destroyed, with tens of thousands of warriors. Our first completely successful offensive battle. Jason nodded. A good plan, then. His lips smiled, but there was no smile in his eyes. A light began pulsing on Sov's comm unit, and he put a small listener to his ear for a private message. Your pardon, he said, but I alerted fleet intelligence once I understood that Jason and a... a defector were on their way. They would like to debrief the both of you. His plate eyes turned to Jason. If you are physically strong enough, of course... Luke couldn't help but notice that Verger, unlike Jason, was not being given a choice. "'I'm willing,' Jason rose from his chair, then turned to his avian companion. "'Verger?' "'Certainly.' The feathered Jedi wore the same wry, skeptical expression she had worn when she'd first stepped out of the airlock and seen the soldiers with weapons at the ready. "'I suppose this will go on for a while,' Jason said to Luke. Since I don't know where I'll be staying, may I have your comm code? Luke assured Jason that he was welcome to stay with him and Mara, and gave Jason his code. Then, turning to Verger, he repeated the offer. Verger may be detained a little longer than Jason, unfortunately, Sov said, which only increased the cynical look in Verger's eye. Verger patted ahead of Jason as the two made their way out. Through the briefly open door, Luke caught a glimpse of Adar Nili Kirka, the Tamarian director of fleet intelligence, at the head of a group of guards, and then the door closed. He turned to Sin Sov. You're taking every precaution, he said. Yuzhan Vong use of defectors and infiltrators is very effective, the Sullustan said. Before I free her to go where she wishes, I want to make sure that Verger is what she claims to be. I know what she claims to be, Luke said. I just wonder how she can be expected to prove it. Chapter 12 Now remember, Leia said, we call it the Remnant, but to these people it's still the Empire. An Empire without an Emperor, Han commented. She patted his hand, for which we may be thankful, my dear. She sighed as a darker thought intruded. And the New Republic is something of a remnant these days as well. The Millennium Falcon had finally completed its long, dangerous crossing of enemy-dominated space to the Imperial capital of Bastion. A squadron of Imperial Star Destroyers flew escort close alongside, their long, wide hulls almost walling off the stars. Their destination wasn't the planet at all, but a Super Star Destroyer, that stretched a full four kilometers left and right from the docking port, and which carried a crew larger than the population of cities. In the docking bay, a military escort met Leia, officers quivering at the salute. 
Behind them was a military band that drummed and thumped them the fifty or so meters to their shuttle, a deluxe Lambda-class vehicle that featured a passenger compartment with fixtures of solid gold and a soft-spoken military aide who offered drinks and refreshments to fortify Leia and Han for the ten-standard-minute trip to the world's surface. The Empire hasn't changed its style much, Han said. He tugged at the collar of his general's uniform. Leia had made him wear full dress on the theory that Imperials were conditioned to defer automatically to anyone wearing a uniform with sufficient badges of rank. Leia herself had chosen for the occasion a gown that was as uniform-like as possible, with a high collar and a double row of jeweled buttons down the front. "'Did you notice when Vanna Dorja left us?' Leia asked. Han gave a startled look over one shoulder. The only person to share the compartment with them was the aide, who had perched on a chair a tactful distance away, far enough to permit them to speak in lowered voices without being overheard. No, Han answered. I'll lay you a wager that Grand Admiral Pelion is listening to her report right now, Leia said. I don't take sucker bets. The Lambda-class shuttle dropped close to the planet's surface and sailed low down a long avenue, past formations of thousands of stormtroopers and uniformed fleet personnel, all bracing into a salute as the shuttle drifted past. The late afternoon sun stretched the soldiers' long shadows across the pavement, producing the illusion that each ranked formation was followed by a dark legion of ghosts. "'Quite a welcome,' Han said." They're trying to show us what valuable allies they'd make. Troops galore, a superstar destroyer, precious metals plating the furniture. And what do they expect us to give them in return for all this? Leia gave her husband a significant look. They'll tell us, I'm sure. The shuttle began to float upward as it approached Imperial headquarters, a stupendous monolith of polished black marble, gleaming bronze and dark reflective windows, with shield generators and turbolaser installations perched on a series of stepped-back ledges from which emerged a final, slim pinnacle that stretched upward to a bright crystalline starburst at the very top. It was as if a giant black fist had raised a single finger to indicate that the galaxy could have only one law, one government, and one absolute ruler. It was toward the starburst that the shuttle rose— it lined up on one of the long crystal rays of the starburst, then brought its docking arm to its tip and hovered there effortlessly on its repulsor lifts. The aide rose from his seat and stepped to the hatch. I hope you enjoyed your flight, he said, and at a touch of his fingers the hatch hissed open. The crystal ray, fragile seeming from the ground, was actually a quite sturdy docking arm, transparent crystal supported by a strong silver alloy skeleton. Leia thanked the aide, straightened her shoulders, and marched down the tube, with Han one pace behind and off her right shoulder. After about sixty meters, the docking arm ended in a large glittering room roofed with faceted crystal. To Leia's surprise, she realized it was an arboretum, filled with thousands of bright exotic blossoms spilling out of their neat rows. Their fragrance perfumed the air. The setting sun set their petals aflame. As if in deliberate contrast to the brilliant color that rose in profusion behind him, Gilad Pelion, dressed in the plain white uniform of an imperial grand admiral. He had put on ten kilos since Leia had last seen him, and his hair and bristling mustaches were white. But alert intelligence still shone in his dark eyes, and his pace was brisk and his clasp firm as he walked to the docking port to take Leia's hand. Princess. Pelion gave her a courtly bow. Supreme Commander. Pelion greeted Han as well, but did not bow over his hand. He stepped back and turned again to Leia. I received an urgent message for you from New Republic Fleet Command, he said. They failed to contact you and wished me to relay the message to you. Leia took an involuntary step back as her heart gave a lurch. Jaina. During the Borlias campaign, Leia had seen for herself the relentless way Jaina was driving herself, both against the Yuzhan Vong and against the darkness that threatened to claim her soul. Jaina was far too young to cope with the constant tragedy and loss that had been hers since the beginning of the war, 
Her friends and comrades killed in action. Her teachers lost. Her brother, Anakin, killed before her eyes. And Jason gone to... to wherever Jason had gone. In response, Jaina had grown hard. But to grow hard was also to risk growing brittle. Jaina had been riding with death, sharing her cockpit for far too long. And it was only her ferocious willpower that was keeping her from toppling over the brink. Her willpower, which must one day fail, along with her luck, which had failed, Leia knew it. Han's strong hands caught Leia's shoulders and buoyed her up. A smile drew itself across Pelion's face. "'Good news, princess,' he said. "'Your son Jason has escaped the Yuzhan Vong. He's arrived at Moon Calamari in good health.' Leia felt her knees weaken and willed herself to remain upright. Without Han's support, she might not have succeeded. Whatever minor doubts she might have had about Jason's survival had been erased days ago when she'd received his force message. But still, she should have known an official transmission would follow. It wasn't about Jaina, after all. It wasn't about more death, more sorrow, more grief. Yes, Han hissed in her ear. Did you hear that, Leia? Jason's alive. His arms wrapped her from behind, and she felt the ferocious joy of his embrace. Dizzily she realized that he hadn't entirely believed her last assurance about Jason's survival. He loved her, and so had consciously decided to believe her, an act of will, but still a part of him doubted, and that part wanted official word. With effort Leia summoned speech. "'Thank you, Supreme Commander,' she said. "'You've—' Still wrapping Leia in his arms, Han gave an unrestrained whoop of pleasure that nearly deafened her. "'You've made us very happy,' she finished, more understated than she would have liked. "'If you would like to use our channels to send your son a message, you are welcome,' Pelion offered. "'Certainly, thank you.' Han's message, "'Way to go, Sprout,' was composed quickly enough, but Leia's was more measured and took longer." Once again, Jason, she dictated into Admiral Pelion's calm, you have answered a mother's prayers. An elegant sentiment, Pelion judged. A wry smile formed beneath his white mustache. Jason seems to have inherited his parents' gift for escaping capture. As well as our gift for getting captured in the first place, Hans said. Pelion gestured toward the garden and its profusion of bright blossoms. "'Shall I show you my garden?' he asked. "'We can speak privately about your embassy.' Leia hesitated. "'Won't I need to speak to others as well?' "'The Empire is not run by committee, Princess,' Pelion reminded. "'If I find that the Moth Council needs to know the substance of your message, "'then I'll be the one who tells them.' Pelion drew Leia and Han along the rows of blossoms, "'pointing with obvious pride,' to his hybrid native orchids, to rainbow-colored fungi from Bakara, to lofty yellow piderian blossoms that so strangely resembled the moon's tall, aloof sentience. Contentment rose in Leia at the sight and scent of the flowers, at Pelion's pleasure in them. "'I had no idea you were a gardener, Admiral,' Leia said. "'Every ruler should have a garden,' Pelion said. It's always useful to draw lessons from nature. True. Leia cupped a vast pink blossom and lifted it to her face, inhaled its scent. From a garden one learns to cull the weak and unfit, Pelion continued, and to encourage the strong and vigorous. He held up his thumb and forefinger. An inferior bud soon feels the strength of my pinch. Leia sighed and straightened letting the blossom fall from her fingers. She supposed it was too much to hope that she could stay for long on Bastion without being reminded what the Empire was really about. Han gave Pelion's pinching hand an appraising look. "'And you make your plants grow in rows,' he said. "'Each receives its proper allotment of space and sunlight, and no more,' Pelion said. "'That's fair, don't you think?' But plants don't naturally grow in rows, Han pointed out. This is only possible. 
He gave a deliberate glance at the glass arboretum overhead. In a highly artificial environment. Bravo, Leah thought at her husband. I swear I'll make a diplomat of you yet. Pelion gave a judicious smile. You prefer the state of nature, then? I think you will find that in a state of nature the weak are culled in a far more merciless fashion than you find here. Leah took her husband's arm. Let's say that I prefer a balance, she said. There should be enough nature so that the plants can thrive by following their natures, if you see what I mean. That notion of balance is derived from Jedi philosophy, if I'm not mistaken, Pelion said. But such hybrid beauty as you see here, he indicated the blossom Leia had just cupped in her hands, is not a matter of balance or nature, but a contest of wills. The will of the gardener and the will of the plant he must coerce into surrendering her treasure. Leia dropped Han's arm and sighed again. I see we're doomed to talk about politics, she said. Pelion gave her one of his courtly bows. I fear so, princess. The New Republic, Leia said, would like to request that the Empire furnish us its maps of routes through the deep core. Those, Pelion said, are among our most closely held secrets. During the rebellion, the Empire had held out for years in the galaxy's deep core. The Imperial's knowledge of the narrow, twisting paths among the closely packed star masses was unmatched. Though the rebels had finally cleared their enemies out of the core, it had been grinding work, and probably a good many of the Empire's roots lay undiscovered. There are no more Imperial bases in the deep core, Leia said, so the information has no value to you. On the other hand, you're aware of how useful such bases would be to the New Republic now that Coruscant is gone. And, she added, seeing the skeptical look on Pelion's face, you know that the longer we tie up the Yuzhan Vong in mopping up operations around the Deep Core, the less likely they are to look at Bastion as their next conquest. I have no fear for the safety of my capital, Pelion said. Then you haven't been paying attention, Leia thought. But she knew that Pelion didn't mean this in all truth. It was probably just one of those things that supreme commanders of totalitarian regimes were expected to say. Once, Leia said, I had no fear for the safety of Coruscant. Which wasn't exactly true either. Perhaps you would like some refreshment, Pelion said. He took Leia's arm and escorted her down the row of blossoms that seemed to get more extravagant and colorful the farther they traveled. Han followed, pretending interest in the flowers. "'I hope you can offer me something in exchange for this information,' he said. "'The Moth Council won't want these secrets given up.' Leia smiled. "'Didn't you just say that you'd tell them what you wanted them to know? "'I will. "'But unfortunately—' he added. Their busy little minds are capable of drawing their own conclusions, and it would be useful for them to know that something of equal value was given in exchange. Leia had anticipated this. Offer, counteroffer, outright payment, blackmail, all the arsenal of politics. The New Republic would be pleased to offer in exchange everything we know about the Yuzhan Vong. Weapons, tactics, communications— Internal organization. The whole package. Communications. Pelion pounced on the word. You've discovered that secret? We have, Leia said. Thank you, Danny Quee. Obsolete core roots in exchange for the greatest secret of the Yuzhan Vong. Pelion mused. I predict no trouble with the Moth Council. Leia was pleased to hear this, but if necessary, she had been perfectly prepared to give the information to Pelion free of charge. As far as she was concerned, anything that weakened the Yuzhan Vong relative to everyone else was a positive good. They came to the end of the row of plants, and Leia discovered a circular space, surrounded by the trunks of Gamorian cool sap trees, with their dense canopy providing an arbor overhead. Beneath the foliage, a grand buffet had been laid out on a hollow, circular table, a long array of silver chafing dishes along with great bowls of salads, fruit, 
and a selection of desserts and pastry. One entire table was covered with a glittering selection of choice liquors. In the center of the circle was a crystal-topped table set for three, the plates arranged around a bouquet of the most exquisite blossoms the Arboretum had to offer. "'Please forgive the informality and help yourselves,' Pelion said. Han eyed the banquet skeptically. "'We're sharing this meal with which regiment?' he asked. Pelion smiled beneath his white mustache. "'Our previous meetings really hadn't given me an idea of your tastes, so I ordered a little of everything.' "'Must be good to be on top of the food chain,' Han commented. Leia thanked Pelion and thought, "'Now I know how you gained those extra ten kilos.' Leia and Pelion talked through the meal, but of matters of no importance. Talking of matters of no importance was an important political skill. Later, over cups of Neris Bud tea, Leia resumed. After you've had the opportunity to review the information we've gathered on the Yuzhan Vong, she began, I hope the Empire will accept our offer of alliance against the enemy. Pelion raised his white eyebrows. I expected you to raise the matter earlier, he said. Dinner first, Leia said. War later. Pelion laughed. Very civilized. The main forces of the Yuzhan Vong are facing the New Republic now. Leia said. You could cut their supply line from the rim with very little effort. Pelion gave her a dubious look. I can present your offer to the Moff Council, he said. But I know what they'd say. Yes? They would ask how the Empire would benefit from this action. Surely the Empire would benefit by helping to rid the galaxy of a menace like the Yuzhan Vaughn. Pelion considered this, then shook his head. I would rather not go to the Moff Council with this offer, he said. They won't approve it. Jag Fell's voice whispered in Leia's memory. It would really make more sense in the short term for the Empire to join the Vong. Leia found a muscle behind one knee trembling, and she stilled it. Why not? she asked. Because, quite frankly, the New Republic is losing its war, Pelion said. Your forces are undisciplined. Your government is in disarray, your capital is lost, and your chief of state was tortured to death in his own office. Why should the Empire join such a debacle? Leia silently cursed Vanadorja and the report Pelion had doubtless heard before this meeting. But maybe that wasn't fair, she thought. Pelion didn't need Vanadorja for this. If we join with you now, you'll only drag us down with you, Pelion continued. He hesitated. That's what the Moff Council would say. That's what you say, Leia translated. Now if you start to win some real victories, Pelion went on, then the Moff's position would be altered. But you'd have to convince us you're not dragging us into a disaster. His dark eyes looked quite solemnly into hers. And that, princess, is the truth. Well... Leia said. That's that. Something shifted in Pelion's face. On the other hand, he said, if you could offer something to the Moff Council, something concrete, such as? Leia queried. The Moff Council is impressed by real things, Pelion said. Solid things. For instance, if the Empire could retain any worlds we took from the Yuzhan Vong, it would impress the Moffs considerably. Not, he added, at the protest in Leia's face, any worlds that still have your population on them. Only those the Yuzhan Vong have remade for themselves. He nodded confidingly. I think the Moff Council is most impressed by worlds, princess. The Empire could double its size, taking its choice of worlds, and it would cost the Yuzhan Vong nothing. Again Jag's voice whispered in Leia's mind. Leia managed to seize control of her whirling thoughts. I, I have no authority to make such a concession, she said. And in any case, there are millions of refugees who want their worlds back. They would be welcome in the Empire, Pelion said. I think we could support them better than could your own overstrained resources. Then you can prune and cull to your heart's content. 
Leia saw the cynical remark in Han's brown eyes, but fortunately Han didn't speak it out loud. As I said, Leia managed, I have no authority to make such a concession. But you will take my words back to your government? Leia nodded. Certainly. If we have a government when I get back, she thought. It wasn't until long after Shimra had dismissed them all that Nomanor thought to question what had happened, and then it was Yug Skell who spoke the words that made him stop and think. The delegation had walked in procession to the Damutek of the intendants and broken up, and Numanor's path lay alongside that of his master, walking along the coiled corridors of the Damutek, breathing in the healthy organic stench of the building as young intendants dodged respectfully to the side. So, Yugskel said, you have seen the power of the Supreme Overlord. Indeed, High Prefect, you felt his mind on yours, I know, when he interrogated you. Numanor recoiled inwardly at the memory of the mental pressure that had squeezed him dry. Yes, he said. Never think to lie to the Supreme One. He will know. Never, Numanor agreed. I'll never think it. Yugskel gave him a sidelong glance. Did you feel the Supreme One again when he incited us against Chigang Hul? Numanor almost stumbled as he walked alongside his leader. High Prefect, he said. Oh, yes, Yugskel said. Unless you think it's normal for high caste Yuzhan Vong to scream and rant and drool in that way. The breath went out of Numanor in a long, awed hiss. The Supreme Overlord had created that? Turned his closest subordinates into a mob of murderous fiends rejoicing at the fall of one of their number? Oh, yes, Yugskel said. The gods have given him that power, among others. His voice turned reflective. Not that Chigang Hul is such a loss. His ambitions always exceeded his talents. I remember an Escalatier ceremony that he performed for one of my most talented advisers, young Faltivik. A fairly basic procedure, I recall, but, as our high priest would say, the gods discovered a flaw in the poor girl, and she joined the shamed ones. I have myself always wondered whether the flaw might instead have been in Chigang Hul. Nomanor gave his superior a sharp glance. The high prefect's words flirted with heresy. But Yug Skell was in a reflective mood, and he continued. Perhaps you remember Fazak Tsun, another Chigang Hul's unfortunates, he said. He paused as he came before the door to his chamber and turned to face Nomanor. He dropped a heavy hand on his subordinate's shoulder. You have made mistakes, executor, he said, and now you see what happens when too many mistakes come to the attention of the Supreme Overlord. Yes, High Prefect. Nomanor's mind ran so fast he could almost hear the wheels spinning. How do you suggest I avoid Chigang Hul's fate? Don't make any more mistakes, Yugskel said blandly. The door behind him quivered open, and he stepped through it. And my particular advice, Executor, Yugskel added, is that whatever you do, don't give the Supreme Overlord an itch, particularly one he can't scratch in public. The door shimmered shut behind him and left Nomanor alone in the corridor. He was thinking hard. The stars streamed aft, and Han sat back in the pilot's seat and gave Leia a grim smile. Well, he said, that's that. Next stop, Moon Calamari. The day after their meeting in the Arboretum, Leia and Han had returned Grand Admiral Pelion's hospitality by having him to dinner on board the Millennium Falcon. Pelion and Leia exchanged discs. He had given her the charts of the Deep Core hyperspace routes, and she gave him everything the New Republic knew about the Yuzhan Vong. Then formal toasts had begun, with Leia toasting the Empire. It had been getting easier with repetition. Then Pelion toasting the New Republic, and, very kindly, the success and survival of Jason Solo. Then Pelion had presented Han with a new hyperspace com antenna to replace the one shot off in the fight with the Yuzhan Vong. 
If there were any more bulletins about Jason or any other friends or family, Han and Leia would be able to receive them without Pelion acting as a relay. Han eased himself out of the pilot's seat. I want to get that antenna installed at our next jump point, he said, and get your message and a copy of that deep core map off to the capital. And I'm going to send a copy of the map to Wedge Antilles, too, just in case no one in the capital knows what to do with it. Good idea. An idea struck Leia. I wonder if Peleon's antenna has been tampered with. Maybe anything we send will be transmitted to Imperial headquarters. It won't matter, Han said. The Empire already has the information they gave us. True. I'll replace the antenna again, with one of our own, when we get back to Moon Calamari. Leia followed Han to the galley. He looked at her. So were those core charts worth this trip? Yes, we can keep fighters in the core for years raiding the Yuzhan Vong. Even though the Empire isn't about to attack. Not without preconditions, anyway. Han looked grim. He had a lot of nerve asking for our planets, he said. They're not our planets anymore, which I suppose was his point. But I think that was just a test. If I'd agreed to his idea, it would have told him how desperate we are. Han's tone turned thoughtful. Would that have brought him into the war, or scared him off? Good question. Leia considered the matter. I think I've come to the conclusion that we don't want the Empire in this war. Han was startled. You sure? All those star destroyers? Those troops? That's right, Leia said. Pelion said he'd join us if we started winning victories. But once we start winning, we don't need the Empire any longer. What Pelion really wants are concessions ahead of time, and then to be at the peace table when it's over. He wants a peace that serves the Empire's interests. Han began slicing up Charboat Root. And here I was starting to think that Pelion was a good guy. Leia made an equivocal motion of her hand. I'm not saying he isn't, at least by Imperial standards. But he's a head of state, and he has to look out for that state's benefit. He didn't persuade the Empire to end the war with the New Republic on the grounds that it was the moral thing to do. He did it by persuading the Moffs that it was in the Empire's best interests. Right now the Remnant has barely recovered from the last war. Why should Pelion get into another life-and-death struggle unless it's to his advantage? I guess, Han said. Not too much Charboot Root, Han, Leia said. I'm a Corellian. I like Charboot Root. But he stopped cutting and instead gathered the root slices and dropped them into the saucepan. Then he turned to her. Do you know, he said, I'm not sure I need any food right now. Really? She frowned down at the stove. Normally you're ravenous at this time of day. What I just remembered, Han said, is that we had hoped to be alone together on this voyage, and that now that Grand Admirals and Imperial spies are off the ship, we are alone. Oh. She blinked at him. Oh, my. The look in his eyes made her skin flush with warmth. He took her in his arms. I think we deserve a little time together, he said. Don't you? Chapter 13 Pray to the partner Yun Shuno, the shamed one said. Pray that her promises will soon be fulfilled. Pray that the Jedi soon liberate us from those who oppress us with terror and violence. So we pray, the tiny group echoed. Some of them, even as they chanted the response, did not cease from scratching at the fungus that tormented them. Beneath the sound of the ceremony was the constant whisper of fingers against inflamed skin. So we pray, Nomanor echoed the words with the others. Wearing an Uglith masker that disguised him as a common worker, he had infiltrated the tiny heretical sect. This was his second meeting. Infiltration was one of his skills, and he had fooled more suspicious folk than these fools. But no more, he thought as he scratched idly at one leg. These people are doomed. There were fewer than a dozen in the little group which met in the shadowy lower levels of a minor office of the intendants, 
a place normally empty at night. The group was led by a shamed one, a former member of the intendant caste, whose arm implant had gone spectacularly wrong and still dripped a trail of slime wherever he went. Even workers should have had better taste than to listen to anything said by this pitiful creature. It was plain curiosity that had driven the Manor to infiltrate the sect. Was this group such a mighty threat to orthodoxy as High Priest Jakan had said? Was the message of redemption by Jedi so powerful that it constituted a danger to the Yuzhan Vong and all they stood for? When the meeting was over, Numanor made his way out of the structure through a door used only by workers. The night of Yuzhan Tar was cool and refreshingly free of the scent of the shamed one's rotting flesh. A night breeze soothed Numanor's flaming skin. Phosphorescent lichen shone on bits of undigested rubble relics of the planet's old civilization that were gradually being broken down into more useful, basic elements. By the phosphorescent light, Nomanor wandered away from the center of the new Yuzhan Vong city into an area of wreckage and half-dissolved rubble that had not yet been cleared for settlement. He wanted to be free of distraction so that he could think. The workers' heresy was an incoherent muddle, he thought, and yet if the heretics had a leader— a prophet. No, a prophet. Someone who knew how to adapt this doctrine into a weapon. Then they would become something to reckon with. Obedience, yes, but not obedience to the ruling castes. Obedience to the prophet. Outward passivity and humility to those they considered their oppressors, but inside the keenest resentment and hatred, and an arrogance that demanded a galaxy. Someone. Yes, Someone like Numanor, who had spread a religious doctrine on Romamul, that had caused the inhabitants to destroy themselves in an interplanetary war. Someone like Numanor could make out of these heretics something very dangerous. All that was necessary was to create a tipping point, a point at which the arrogance and hatred could be brought to overwhelm passivity and caution, and then the heretics would become an army. Yes. It was lucky these heretics were being suppressed. Scratching himself on the elbows, Nomanor turned back toward the city, and in the sky saw the spiraling rainbows created by the Dovin basils on the great hovering palace that housed Shimra. Now there is power, he thought. But what rainbows have these heretics cast? He walked back toward the settled area, and to his surprise found himself walking along a clearly defined road. He hadn't realized that the shapers had grown roads out this far. And then he saw something coming toward him along the road, a riding quednak with someone astride it. Nomanor stepped to the side of the road and, in his character as a simple worker, bowed in servitude with his arms crossed. It was only as the scaled, six-legged creature thumped by that Nomanor thought he recognized the silhouette of the rider. Onimi. That bulbous, misshapen head was unmistakable. What was the Supreme Overlord's familiar doing here, so far from the palace and any of the centers of government? Numanor thought for a long moment as the beast thudded into the distance, and then followed. Kashi Eek was a brilliant green crescent in the glittering darkness of space and around it Jaina could see the silver gleam of the New Republic capital ships that had turned the planet into one of the New Republic's forward bases. She was in command of Trickster, tensed under the cognition hood, in case enemy were present as they jumped out of hyperspace. Instead, a message of jubilant welcome came from the elements of the New Republic fleet that had remained behind at their new base, and she and the rest of the fleet had stood down from their alert. Labaka growled cheerfully. I'd love to join your family on Kashi Eek, Jaina said. A furlough in the green trees would be ideal. Just what she needed to ease the tension she felt in her shoulders and arms, the dirge of grief and sorrow that played in her mind, the sadness that flooded her heart. Lights flashed on the comm system that Lobaka had jacked into the Yuzhan Vong ship, and the unit tweedled. Message from the flagship, Loi said. What does the general want? Jaina wondered. It's not Farlander, the Wookiee said. The message is from Admiral Creefe. He wants you and General Farlander to report on board Ral Roost at your earliest convenience, he says. 
And now we pay for our success, Jaina thought. A great warrior. Is this the Domatek of the noble intendant, Huli Krek? Tattoos on the warrior's face creased as she scowled at Nomanor. She waved her amphistaff in the direction of the city. You are not permitted here. Get your miserable carcass back to your barracks. Nomanor, still in his worker guise, bobbed in feigned humility. With all respect, O Commander, if this is the Damutek of Huli Krek, then I am permitted here. The warrior was not appeased by Numanor's casually promoting her two degrees. This is not the Damutek of Huli Krek. Now be gone. It was not the Damutek of Huli Krek, whom Numanor had just invented on the spot, but it was the heavily guarded Damutek to which the shamed one Onimi had traveled. A fact proven by Onimi's riding beast seen standing before the building and quietly licking a fungus-covered rock. The Damutek was a large, bulbous, three-lobed structure that radiated a faint, pinkish light. There was at least a platoon of warriors either on guard or camped in the vicinity, so whatever the function of the building might be, it was of some importance. And standing in the entrance to the Damutek, a pair of Yuzhan Vong were in conversation their distinctive living headdresses, marking them as shapers. Oh, woe! Oh, misery! Oh, unhappiness! Slapping himself on the head repeatedly, Nomanor pranced about in a little circle. This was enough to attract two more warriors, one of them a subaltern, unusually short, with stringy hair. What is the meaning of this? the subaltern demanded. The warrior explained, and the subaltern turned to Nomanor. There is no Huli Krek here. Now get back to where you belong. But I belong at the Damutek of Huli Krek, Numanor wailed. I was given very explicit directions. Left at the square of hierarchy, then south to the boulevard of the crushing of the infidels, then right at the temple of the modeler, then on down the long road to the end. He began slapping himself again. Oh, woe! Oh, my supervisor will punish me. I'll punish you if you don't get out of here, the subaltern said. He cocked his amphistaff over his shoulder. Numanor fell on his face and groveled before the others. May I beg the officer's pardon? May I ask where I went wrong? You went wrong when you were born, one of the warriors joked, and the other laughed. Where is this Damutek? Numanor asked. What is the name of this place, so that I can explain to my master Huli Krek how I came to be here? This Damutek is for shapers only, the subaltern said. His amphistaff slashed down like a whip, and fire burned along Numanor's back. Now clear out before they stick you in their blasted cortex. Numanor scuttled away sideways like a great crustacean, then rose to his feet and scurried down the road. Inwardly, despite the pain that flamed down his back, he gave a smile of satisfaction. Warriors are so predictable, he thought. Cortex was a shaper term for some kind of shaping protocol or technique, which meant that this was a shaper project secret enough to move some distance out of the capital, where its business could go on unobserved and important enough to station warriors as its permanent guard. The two shapers seen in the entrance only confirmed this, and Onimi was a part of it somehow. No one or stumbled on a fault in the road, and at the jar... Fresh pain shot along his back. That warrior hadn't held back when he'd slashed down with the amphistaff. Nomanor's teeth ground as he thought of the arrogant little pipsqueak with the weapon longer than he was, and he cast an angry glance over his shoulder at the sawed-off subaltern with his two warriors. I'll remember this, he thought. And then he thought of the heretics at their meeting, the anger and hatred that they couldn't acknowledge even to themselves, and he thought, yes... This is how it starts. Jaina combed her hair and changed out of her coveralls to walking-out dress, which was as smart as she could get for the Admiral, since her full-dress uniform hadn't caught up to her as she'd moved through her last several postings. Walking-out dress, however, was still sufficiently formal that she felt uncomfortable, and kept tugging at her collar as she sat with Farlander in the shuttle that carried her to the Admiral's Bothan assault cruiser. One of Prefay's Bothan aides met Jaina and Farlander at the lock and escorted them to the Admiral's suite. 
The cruiser's air had a spicy alien scent. When they reached Crefe's quarters, they were kept waiting a quarter of an hour by a secretary until they were called in to meet the admiral. Crefe was alone in a formal briefing room, standing at the head of a long, empty table. Farlander and Jaina approached the admiral and saluted. General Farlander and Major Solo reporting as ordered, Admiral. Crefe's milk-white fur rippled as he returned the salute. You have your report? Yes, sir. Farlander handed the admiral a disc. Crefe dropped it in a reader and glanced at the information. One capital ship lost, another disabled, he said. Nearly a hundred starfighters lost, with only forty percent of the crews rescued. All in an unauthorized action to chase an enemy supreme commander who wasn't even there, and following an operational plan devised by a junior lieutenant. Yes, sir, Farlander admitted. And a stunning victory, Crefe continued, still reading. Seven enemy capital ships destroyed, a pair of transports holding thousands of warriors, and a supreme commander killed along with his flagship. His eyes lifted first to Jaina, then to Farlander. "'My warmest congratulations to the both of you,' he said. "'I wish my other subordinates demonstrated this kind of initiative.' He shook Farlander's hand. "'Brilliant work. I will put you both in for commendations.' Jaina flushed at the warmth of the Admiral's response. She felt the tension in her wire-strung muscles ease. "'Thank you, sir.' she murmured, and then was surprised to see Crefe step before her, then pause for a long moment with his gold-flecked violet eyes fixed on her. I wish to see you in comparative privacy, in order that I might give you some news of your family. Jaina stared at him in rising horror, and felt herself brace for it, her parents dead or captured, or perhaps little Ben Skywalker ambushed in the maw and killed. "'Your brother Jason has escaped the enemy "'and has arrived safely on Moon Calamari,' Crefe said. "'When you have a chance to catch up with your personal messages, "'no doubt you'll hear the story in more detail.' "'Jaina stared at Crefe in cold astonishment. "'Are you sure, sir?' she said. "'I saw him and the Yuzhan Vong. "'I was there.' "'Of course it's true,' Crefe said. "'Your brother's been on the Hollow News. "'He's very much alive.' Jaina could only gape at him. Why didn't I know? It had been Jaina who had insisted on the reality of Jason's death in the face of her mother's belief in his survival. Why didn't he reach me through our twin bond? She demanded of herself. And then an answer came to her. Because I cut him off. She had been driven into a near-mad frenzy by Anakin's death and Jason's capture. She had embraced the dark and turned her life to vengeance. She had cut off all contact with those she loved, including Jason, who must have needed her dreadfully. She pictured Jason calling to her over and over and receiving no answer. He must have thought I was dead. What kind of despair had she brought him? She tasted bitter failure on her tongue. Would you like to sit down, Jaina? Farlander's voice floated toward her from beyond the shadowy wall that cloaked her mind. Yes, she said, if I may. She groped her way to a chair, and as she lowered herself into it, she managed to remember the niceties. She looked up at Trieste Crefe. Thank you, Admiral, she said. I appreciate your telling me this way. It was the least I could do for our new hero, Crefe said, as he took the seat at the head of the table. You and General Farlander have given us a great victory, and I would like you to give me an informal briefing now, before I arrange a full staff conference tomorrow. Very good, sir, Farlander said. Even as he answered Crefe, his concerned eyes still rested on Jaina. Your tactics involving the Jedi? Crefe asked. Creating a kind of meld? Were they successful? They worked but we had too few units with Jedi in them, Jaina said. We need more Jedi in order to make it really useful, and even then it doesn't always work. Her thoughts darkened as she remembered Mirker. 
if the Jedi aren't in agreement among themselves, the meld can fall apart. Crefe brushed aside all doubt. I'll put in a request for as many Jedi pilots as they can send us. Who knows what the High Command will make of it? Who knows? Jaina repeated. The New Republic had never quite decided what to do with Jedi in this war, but then the honors were even. The Jedi hadn't been quite sure what to do with themselves. I'd like to share some other news, Crefe said. I've just returned from Bathawi, where the mourning for my cousin Borsk Felia has now ended. While I was there, I managed to meet with a good many important Bothans, and I'm pleased to report that I achieved some success. That's very good, sir, Farlander said. As you may know, intrigue is common among Bothans, Crefe said. The periods when we are united as a species are rare, and usually occur only when we are facing a common danger, as we did during the Empire. But now, as a result of Chief of State Felia's death, the Bothan Council has decided to declare that the highest state of war now exists between Bathawi and the Yuzhan Vong. Something in Crefe's phrasing caused Jaina to look up. Highest state of war? she repeated. But you're at war already, aren't you? Crefe looked solemn. We've been in what you could describe as an ordinary state of war, he said. The highest state of war, it is called Arkry, was not declared even in the days of Palpatine. Arkry has been declared only twice in our past, and was declared only when our survival as a species seemed to be at stake. It means that we will declare total war against our enemy, and not cease until he has been completely destroyed. You've destroyed species? General Farlander asked. In the distant past, Crefe said. We did not cease our arc cry until our enemies were destroyed to the last individual. Their names written out of the histories and their planets reduced to dust floating on the stellar wind. He placed his hands on the tabletop, his white fur reflecting perfectly in its dark polished surface. So shall we do with the Yuzhan Vong, he said. They shall become dust, or we shall become dust ourselves. Jaina looked at Crefe's determined face, and a chill ran up her spine at the quiet certainty that lay behind his words. Nen Yim couldn't quite suppress a shudder as she reached toward the shamed one, if only to hand him a bladder flask nor could she suppress her alarm as he opened the flask immediately and began splashing the bomb on his misshapen body. The tendrils on her headdress waved in agitation. This is for the Supreme Overlord, she said. I'll save enough for Shimra, Onimi said. There must be enough for... for the other shapers, Nenyim said. They must be able to create tons of... I know, Master Heretic Shaper, Onimi said. I'll leave enough for the shapers. He slathered the pale green lotion over his grayish, inflamed flesh and sighed. It works, he said. Of course it works, Ninyim snapped. Even if Onimi was her only conduit to the Supreme Overlord, his impudence was often more than she could bear. Onimi seemed oblivious to the shapers' loathing. Think of all the hours of labor you've saved us, he said. All that scratching. The bomb had certainly saved Nen Yim's own sanity, since she had returned from Sabang La's command to work on Yuzhan Tar directly under Shimra. She had been one of the worst affected of the itching plague's victims. She had barely been able to focus her mind to the point that she could puzzle out an antidote. She and Onimi faced each other in a room screened off by membranous partitions that pulsed with bright, oxygenated blood. Phosphorescent lichen filled the air with a reddish light that was useful when dealing with photosensitive tissues. The tang of the lotion contrasted with the organic odors that normally filled the air. The coppery scent of blood or the loamy scent of undifferentiated protoplasm. The tissue on which Nen Yim performed her grafts forced mutations, and other experiments. Performed her heresy. 
The eighth cortex was known to the Yuzhan Vong as the ultimate grade of shaper knowledge, the most refined and perfect of the procedures given by the gods in ancient times, known only to the supreme overlord and the few master shapers with whom he shared the knowledge. Only the handful who had seen the eighth cortex knew that it was a fraud. It was, in fact, practically empty. It contained only a few advanced techniques— most of which Shimra had already given to his people. Yuzhan Vong knowledge had reached its end, and so Shimra had found Nen Yim, a shaper already convicted of the heresy of not merely repeating the procedures given the Yuzhan Vong in ancient times, but actually seeking new knowledge. It was now the task of Nen Yim and her adepts to create the Eighth Cortex, to provide the new knowledge and new procedures that would enable the Yuzhan Vong to win the war and exist successfully in their new homeland. Nen Yim had first call on any Yuzhan Vong resources. Her research took first priority in any dispute, even over urgent war aims. Her team was housed in its own Damutek, isolated and guarded. Her only visitor was Onimi, her direct conduit to the Supreme Overlord. But the guards, she knew, were not simply to prevent an enemy from interfering— they were to prevent Nen Yim and her own people from escaping to contaminate other Yuzhan Vong with their heretical ideas. The Yuzhan Vong chosen for the Eighth Cortex project were insulated from the rest of their own race. Insulated like a plague. Nen Yim more than half suspected that after the project's completion, after the Eighth Cortex was filled with a thousand and one useful shaping protocols, she and her co-workers and Onimi would be quietly liquidated— and all record of their existence erased. But should that happen, Nen Yim was prepared to accept it. She had accepted death more than once in her life already. All life, after all, was preparation for death, and once the Eighth Cortex was filled, she would have contributed her whole life's adventure to the defeat of the infidels and the greatness of her people. Onimi finished applying the lotion and straightened to the full height of his gangling limbs. This cure is limited, I understand. Yes, it will kill any infection on contact, but you can always be reinfected. Onimi's unsettling eyes, one lower than the other, focused on her. And we will be reinfected, yes? I'm afraid so. The spore is everywhere. Can the world brain be instructed to produce an organism that will kill the spore? Some kind of virus or bacterium that can devour the plague? Nen Yim hesitated. I fear, she dared to say, that the world's brain may be the problem. The room's ruddy light shone eerily on Onimi's eyes, now suddenly alert. His tilted slash of a mouth twitched. How can this be, Master Shaper? he asked. I have examined the organism that causes the itching plague most carefully— Though further examination would be necessary to confirm this, I believe that the spore and the fungus it causes are of Yuzhan Vong origin, not native to Yuzhan Tar. A hiss escaped Onimi's lips. Chagang Hul, that imbecile! He has contaminated the world brain! He paused for a moment's thought. Can you instruct the world brain to cease production of the spore? Perhaps... I'd have to put aside my other work. Don't, then. A new clan has been put in charge of the world-shaping project and the world brain. Let the work be theirs. His expression grew thoughtful. The gods can speak to Shimra on the matter, and he can then advise the new shapers. Distaste flooded Nen Yim. She might be a heretic, but even she had more respect for the gods than to claim her knowledge was of divine origin. The Supreme Overlord wants you to concentrate on the Yamask project, Onimi went on. We must develop a war coordinator that is free from the infidel's attempts to manipulate the gravity spectrum. To this end, the Supreme Overlord has granted you absolution in advance for investigating any of the enemy's machines and weapons. Nen Yim feigned surprise. If we knew how the infidels were producing the interference, she said, the work would be easier. 
It is known that the infidels have gravity manipulation devices called repulsor lifts, not as flexible or as useful as our own Dovin basils, but perhaps operating on the same principles. They might have modified these to interfere with the Yamasks. Nen Yim considered. Would it be possible to bring me one of these repulsor lifts? Onimi gave a mirthless smile. I shall have one delivered, along with a translation of its specifications. Please see they are protected from our metal-destroying bacteria. Yes, of course. His lopsided eyes glimmered. Shimra prays daily for a solution to this problem. May I say the gods will provide an answer soon? The gods should first provide a repulsor lift. Onimi gave a bow and a cross-armed salute, but his head was tilted at an ironic angle. May your efforts prosper, Master Shaper, he said, and yours, Onimi. The deformed figure made his way out of the chamber. Nen Yim watched him leave, her lips twitching with distaste. Whatever they may be, creature, she repeated, whatever they may be. Chapter 14 Calumus announced his Jedi plan and his official candidacy at mid-morning before an army of hollow journalists in the lobby of the building that the Moon Calamari had donated for the Senate's use. Luke stood quietly behind Cal amid a group of friends and supporters, not wanting to attract attention. But when Cal called for questions, at least half were directed to Luke, and Cal finally called Luke to his side. Are you and the Jedi supporting Counselor Omus's candidacy, he was asked. I hope to be able to work with any chief of state, Luke said, but I'm supporting Counselor Omus's plan for restoring the Jedi Council. The hollow journalist was skeptical. So you're saying you could work with Fior Rodan if he wins the election? I will work with Counselor Rodan if he will work with me. Luke smiled. My impression, though, is that he'd rather not. Laughter trickled lightly through the crowd. Rodan says the Jedi Council is your means of seizing power, someone else called. Cal stepped to the front. May I answer that one? he said. Let me point out that if Luke Skywalker was after power, he wouldn't have needed to work with politicians like me or Fior Rodan. He wouldn't have needed to destroy the Death Star or fight Emperor Palpatine hand to hand or help his sister found the New Republic. All Master Skywalker would have needed to do would have been to join his father, Darth Vader, at the right hand of the Emperor, and in that case his power would be unlimited, and you and I and everyone here would either be dead or enslaved. Cal scowled at the crowd, and there was a touch of anger in his voice. This isn't some little jumped-up lobbyist or politician we're talking about. This is Luke Skywalker. There isn't a single person in the New Republic who doesn't owe him a profound debt of gratitude. So if anyone suggests that Luke Skywalker is involved in some kind of shabby power play, I'd suggest that person not only can't read history, but is incapable of reading human character. There was actually applause at that, and not just from Cal's supporters. I'd like to thank you for your words on my behalf, Luke said later, after the meeting had broken up. Cal grinned. Did you like the hint of anger? I thought I judged that pretty well. Luke was surprised. You were faking that? Oh, no, it was real enough, Cal said. I just let it show enough to get the top spot in tonight's hollow news. He rubbed his chin. The question is, did I let it show enough? Luke left Cal Omus pondering this and other political questions and shuttled up to the New Republic Fleet Command Annex, where Verger was still undergoing interrogation. Jason had been released after a few hours' debriefing, but the fleet showed every inclination to keep Verger indefinitely. Luke didn't necessarily think that was a bad thing. "'She's given us reams of material,' said Intelligence Director Nilly Kirka. It'll take us hundreds of hours to process it all. None of it contradicts what we already know. But then, if she were a bogus defector controlled by the enemy, it wouldn't, would it? Nilly Kirka seemed amused. She's also eaten about twice her weight. I've never seen such an appetite. 
If you had to eat Yuzhan Vong cooking for fifty years, you'd be hungry for our food, too. Luke asked the Tamarian if he could speak to Verger himself, and Neely Kirka was agreeable. Any information you can get out of her, he said with a wave of his hand. He found Verger in her cell, squatting on a stool and watching a hollow transmission from the planet, a news program that featured Luke and Cal Omis. Incapable of reading human character, Cal was saying. Verger waved the hollow to silence as Luke entered. In my time, she said, a Jedi master would not have intervened so with the Senate and an election. In your time, Luke said, it wouldn't have been necessary. Verger accepted this with a graceful bob of her unlikely head. Luke gathered up his robe and sat cross-legged on the chair before her. He calmed himself. He was trying not to dislike Verger, though he had very, very good reason to. Out with it, he thought. I've spoken to Jason about his captivity, he said. Your apprentice bore it well, Verger said. You are to be congratulated. Anger swirled in Luke's heart. Exhaling a deliberate slow breath, he banished it. Perhaps Jason didn't have to bear it at all, he said. He said that you led him into captivity no less than three times. Roger's head bobbed. I did, she confirmed. He was tortured, Luke said. Tortured to the point of death. And you led him to it. You could have escaped with him earlier than you did, yes. Why? he asked. Verger held herself still, as if listening intently to a voice that Luke couldn't hear. It was necessary that your apprentice learn certain lessons, she said. Lessons in betrayal. Luke tried to keep the anger out of his voice. Torture, helplessness, slavery, degradation, pain. Those naturally, Verger said blandly. But chiefly, he had to be brought to the edge of despair, and then over it. Her tilted eyes gave Luke an intense, searching gaze. You taught him well, but it was necessary for him to forget every lesson you gave him by showing that none of the gifts you gave him could help him. Necessary? Luke's outrage finally broke through his reserve. Necessary for what? Or for who? Verger tilted her head and looked at him. Necessary for my plans, of course, she said. Who gave you? Luke suppressed his anger. Who gave you the right? A right that is given is as useless as a virtue that is given, Verger said. Rights are used, or they have no value, just as virtues must be performed. I took the right to lie to your apprentice, to betray him, to torment him, and enslave him. Her piebald feathers fluffed, then smoothed again. A shrug. I also take upon myself the consequences. If you, as his master, wish to punish me, so be it. Was there a point to this? Luke gazed at her. Other than exercising your rights, I mean. Verger nodded. Of course, young master, she said. Jason Solo had to be bereft of friends, of relatives of teachers and knowledge and the force and everything that could help him. He had to be reduced to nothing, or rather to himself only. And then he had to act, to act purely out of himself, out of his own inner being. In that state of complete disinterest, everything else having failed him, he had no choice but to be himself, to choose and to act. Her voice turned thoughtful. I regret the means, of course, but I used what I had at hand. The same inner state could have been reached more gently, given time and opportunity, but neither were at hand. I tricked the Yuzhan Vong into preserving his life and inflicting the embrace of pain. I made the Yuzhan Vong my instrument. She gave a little dry cough, or perhaps it was a laugh. Perhaps that was my greatest accomplishment. Verger's words resonated in Luke's mind, and as he followed their reasoning, he found his anger abating, if only by virtue of his abstraction. And the point of this, he 
he asked. The slanted eyes closed and Verger's body relaxed, as if she were entering meditation. Surely you know the answer, young master, if you know Jason Solo at all. Humor me, Luke said. Spell it out. The avian's eyes remained closed. Her voice seemed to come from far away. Once, or so the story that Jason told me suggests, you had your own props similarly knocked away. Deprived of help, of hope, of weapons, blasted by the Emperor's force lightning, what did you have then? You had only yourself. You were made to choose between the Emperor's path and your own. I had no choice, Luke said. Exactly. You had no choice. And even with annihilation staring you in the face, you chose to remain true to yourself. A hint of satisfaction entered Verger's tone. Likewise, it was necessary to reduce Jason to himself. In order that, with every other door closed to him, he might embrace his destiny. Destiny. For the second time in two days, the word rose in connection with Jason. And deep in his bones, in complete inner certainty, Luke knew that Verger was right, that somewhere in the complex weavings of fate, Jason had a special place. The previous evening, over dinner in the small apartment, Luke and Mara had asked Jason about his experience at the hands of the Yuzhan Vong. At first, Jason had been reluctant to speak at all, saying it was a large subject. But after the first few questions, he spoke matter-of-factly of his imprisonment, the way Verger had repeatedly betrayed him into the hands of the enemy after somehow taking away his connection to the Force. Mara and Luke had glanced at each other in growing horror. But Jason had shown no resentment of Verger. In fact, he had spoken of her with profound respect and admiration. Luke hadn't understood this until later that evening, when he and Mara were alone, and Mara quietly reminded him how hostages sometimes grew strangely attached to their captors. Sometimes captives even grew to love their warders, particularly if the warder was skilled enough in manipulating people. Verger old and experienced in serving her own agenda, had been able to manipulate young Jason's growing psyche. And so Luke, angry, certain he knew what had happened, had traveled to Verger's cell to confront her with her actions. But somehow it hadn't quite come out the way he'd anticipated. "'And what do you know of Jason's destiny?' Luke asked. Verger pondered a moment before answering— I believe that Jason is intimately connected with the fate of the Yuzhan Vong, she answered. Of all things, Luke had not expected that. He can destroy them? he asked. Destroy them, save them, transform them. The tilted eyes opened, gazed expressionlessly into Luke's. Perhaps all three. Can he open them to the Force? Luke asked. I don't know if that's possible. Luke felt bitterness poison his heart. Then the Yuzhan Vong will remain outside. Verger's head tilted. That bothers you? Luke blinked. Yes, of course. The Force is life. All life is the Force. But the Yuzhan Vong are outside the Force. So are they outside life as well? What do you think? I think it was easier dealing with enemies from the dark side. Luke looked narrowly at Verger. I also think you're very good at interrogation. This conversation started with me asking the questions. If you didn't want me to ask questions, Verger said, you should have explained that at the beginning. Her piebald body stirred on her stool. I've been answering question after question ever since I arrived, and I'm tired of it. So if you insist that the only questions in this room must come from you, then I decline to answer them. Very well. Luke rose to his feet. Her head craned after him on its odd little neck. But I will ask one more question before you leave, she said. You may answer it or not, as you like. Ask, Luke said. Her eyes blinked slowly. If the Force is life, 
she said. And the Yuzhan Vong are alive, and you cannot see them in the force. Then is the problem with the Yuzhan Vong? Or is it with your perceptions? Luke, choosing not to answer, nodded politely and left. Tricky, isn't she? Idar Neely Kirka asked a few moments later. You heard? Luke asked. Of course. Everything in that room is recorded. The Tamarian inclined his head. What do you suggest we do with her? Hold her here, Luke said, and keep asking her questions. Neely Kirka smiled. Just what I planned, Master Skywalker. Moon Calamari, goggle eyes gleaming in the floodlights, swam easily past Cal Omis's window. The scent of mildew in the room was greater than ever. Mara looked up as Luke entered. Verger, she said. It's complicated, Luke said. I'll explain later. He looked at Cal Omis, who was sharing a hasty meal with Mara. What news from the Senate? Cal swallowed the mouthful he'd been chewing and said, the Senate had a vote this afternoon. I got twenty-eight percent. And Rodin? Thirty-five. And Kola Quis got ten percent, Mara added. And Talam Ranth, eighteen. Poe got three votes total, though he sent a message saying that the vote was illegal and that he was still chief of state. The rest of the votes were abstentions, or scattered among half a dozen others. Luke and Mara had decided that, of the two of them, Mara would be one who would work more openly with Cal and his campaign. Luke had other business with Jason and Verger and the Jedi, and Mara could move more openly among the politicians and lobbyists than he could. Luke joined the others at the table, and Cal amiably pushed a bowl of giju stew in his direction. "'Where's Tribak? Luke asked. "'Talking to Colaquis. Cal said. By now it must be clear to Kola that he can't win, so we need to find out what it would take for him to drop out of the race and endorse me. I'm sure Rodan's asking him the same thing, Mara said. And then we ask the same thing of Talam Ranth, Cal continued, though I don't suppose Talam is ready to answer yet. He'll want a few more floor votes first, just to show what a valuable ally he could be. What's he likely to want? A place on the advisory council, certainly, Cal said. Plus he'll want places in the government for his friends. He's always been very serious about controlling patronage. Luke finished his bite of stew and spoke. In order to control patronage, there has to be a government for him to control patronage in. If the government falls apart in the meantime... Cal shrugged. Talam wants what he wants. If we start giving him speeches about... Patriotism and duty, he'll think we're trying to put something over on him. He's the sort who thinks that patronage is the whole point of government. In that case, Luke said, sighing, you may as well point out that if the war goes on, his people will gain access to a lot of military contracts. Cal grinned. We'll make a politician of you yet. I hope not, Luke said. Cal reached across the table for a data pad. It's Fjord's supporters that worry me. He tapped the display. I've been looking at the people who voted for him, and if I were to make a mental list of the members of the Senate who would want a truce with the Yuzhan Vong, or even a surrender, I'd find quite a number of them among Fjord's supporters. Senator Sneakaway, Luke said, with a significant look at Mara. Senator Scramblefree. Cal frowned at the data pad. I count at least a dozen senators who either ran away from Coruscant during the fighting or found reason to flee before the fighting started, and some of them are influential. Rodan told me that he didn't trust the Yuzhan Vong to keep a truce, Luke said. He repeated it publicly this afternoon, Mara said. But can he hold out against his own supporters, Cal said. When the people he depends on for his position tell him they want peace with the Yuzhan Vong, how can he resist? I don't understand, Mara said. Rodan was brave during the fight, maybe even heroic. How can he associate with these people? Some people don't question the folks who give them what they want, Cal said. 
and then his long face creased in a sly smile. I haven't exactly made my own supporters fill out a questionnaire either. Luke finished his stew. We need a government soon, he said, and one the military can respect, because the military won't hold still for a surrender or a truce. And then we'll have a military government that won't hold any legitimacy other than what they acquire at Blaster Point. Cal looked serious. Mara told me what you saw this afternoon. I agree we need a government soon. A parliamentary system like ours is inefficient in certain ways, but it's what we're stuck with. The question is, Mara said, does the military understand that? It was a question to which none of them had the answer. Luke and Mara found Jason in the suite when they returned. Jason sat on the floor in a meditation pose, and Luke could feel the force surrounding him, swirling in great eddies through the boy's body, cleansing, healing, strengthening and restoring. Jason's eyes opened as soon as Luke and Mara stepped into the apartment, and he smiled. The intelligence people are done with me, for the present, Jason said. I think they'll be a while with Verger, though. I spoke with her myself, Luke said. Jason's smile broadened. What did you think? I think she's not simple. Mara had scowled at Jason's pleased reaction to the mention of Verger, but she put the frown away and sat next to Jason. I have to wonder about her loyalties, she said. They're not simple either, Jason said. She's very harsh sometimes. Mara's mouth twisted, and Luke knew why because his own insides were queezing at the thought of torture. He swallowed back a bitter surge of stomach acid and dropped cross-legged to the floor in front of Jason. Jason looked at him. "'I'm still your apprentice, Master Skywalker,' he said. "'Do you have any assignments for me?' "'Harsh,' Luke thought. Whatever he was going to be, he wasn't going to be Verger. He smiled. A very difficult assignment, Jason, he said. You are to take a vacation. Jason was surprised. What kind of vacation? he asked. Luke almost laughed. Whatever kind you like, he said. You've been through a lot, and I want you to take the time to think about it. Many of your friends are here. I want you to reconnect with them. Meditate as you were doing. Try to discern what it is that the Force wants for you, if anything, and whether it's what you want for yourself. Jason tilted his head in curiosity. You'd give me that option? You of all people, Luke said, should know that you've always had that option. He looked into Jason's solemn eyes. I want you to get beyond what I want for you, beyond what Verger wants, beyond any of us. I want you alone with force. A dialogue with just the two of you. Alone. Harsh, Mara said. Luke could feel her muscles tense. Days and days of torture. Harsh. They were alone in bed, lying nested like spoons, Mara in the curve of Luke's body. Jason was presumably asleep in the next room, and they conversed in low tones, so as not to be overheard. She claimed she had good reasons for what she did, Luke said, and they sounded plausible if, well, harsh. Mara looked thoughtful. She helped heal me with her tears. Perhaps a gesture of compassion? Perhaps a cold-hearted calculation to pave her way to a defection? Or should I say a re-redefection to our side? She tortured Jason, but she brought him back. And she collaborated in the deaths of hundreds of billions of citizens of the New Republic, Luke said. The reasons she gives are, perhaps, adequate. Or perhaps she is simply a being with absolutely no conscience and an agenda of her own. Mara's eyes turned hard. We've got to get Jason out from under her influence. 
That's why I told Jason to take time off and to reconnect with his friends, Luke said. I can't order him not to feel a connection to Verger, but I can tell him to connect to all the parts of his life that aren't Verger. Mara nodded. Good idea. Whatever may have happened to Jason while he was gone, he's more mature than he was, more balanced, and more centered than ever in the Force. Mara bit her lip. I agree. Not everything that happened to him was negative. After Jason's gotten his bearings back, I'll send him on a mission. After he's had a chance to think and regain his balance, he'll need to reconnect with his job. Yes. She hesitated. That may be hard, but it's necessary. I spoke this morning of Jason's having a special destiny, Luke said. Verger thinks he has one as well. Mara looked at him over her shoulder. Maybe you'd better tell me what she said.